This is for you new people. I only have one rule. Everyone fights, no one quits. If you don't do your job, I'll shoot you. You get me. We get you, sir! Welcome to the Roughnecks. Ratcats, Roughnecks! <laughs> To the Roughnecks, Rollo's Roughnecks. <laughs> it's not a new intro. <laughs> I have some new intros though. See any good uh, podcasts lately? <laughs> Live from Reno, Nevada. This is. The my secret bunker deep in the Nevada high desert somewhere on the Bureau of Land Management where the wild Mustangs roam yes thank you very much oh boy here we go this is gonna be a lot it's gonna be a fun one it's gonna be a lively one today just saying Actual statistical studies where they took thousands of people, put them on dates. It was in the UK where they did do the study. <laughs> they put them on these blind dates, and then they match the blind dates on the succession to whether or not they get a second or third date, and they correlate that I by know. astrological science. I love and that. And do you know what the, you know what the answer is? Because I'm sure you do. What is the correlation? Zero. <laughs> zero. I don't know. I can, Mother. I can- Zero. It is 0.00. Ast- astrological <laughs> science <laughs> mean nothing. They mean absolutely. Hater. No, right. you do. Airy. But it, Airy, dude, it, you're I, right. I'm it does have an effect. Right now. Are you a but, fire sign? Oh, but Libra. My, my, oh my gosh, you said Libra. It's such a Libra thing to say. Once in a while, the universe will send you what I like to call a unicorn opportunity. Unicorns are magical, mystical creatures, and so they only come every once in a while. And so if the universe is giving you a unicorn opportunity and it's right in front of you and you don't jump on that opportunity and take action on it, you're stopping your momentum. But when you jump on that unicorn, even when you're scared, you do it anyway, and you ride on that unicorn, you're going to create some form of momentum. Body count. Why do you guys care so much about body count? Because, like, I'm a strong and independent woman, and I'm also oppressed. So I should be able to do whatever I want. Okay, tell me exactly how you're oppressed. I shouldn't have to explain it to you. Like, you should already know. Because, like, I'm a strong and independent woman who is somehow also oppressed, and I demand respect. Right. Okay, just tell me what you did last night. Oh, yeah, stranger 4,559. Oh, yeah, respect me. Yeah, yeah, I'm a strong and independent woman, and I'm also a press. Okay, like, the only thing that matters is that, like, I'm a strong and independent woman who is also oppressed, and guys should, like, just be okay giving me money so that I could be a total whore. Explain why men care about body count. <laughs> I, I got it. I haven't told you the reasons why you men care to about it. What well, well, mansplain? Yeah. That's kind of a sexist thing to say. <laughs> you don't. That's sexist to say mansplain. You're literally a white man looking at me, telling me like, what? if you what? can't what? see how you being a white man has anything to do with like the power you have in conversation, then what? I don't even want to like talk about that. What does my skin anyway, color? I don't want to. I don't want to make it. What What does my skin color have to do with this conversation? We're talking about nothing. body count. Yeah. Okay. Nothing. But okay, don't. But you don't you think it? Don't you count. think it's a bit racist? To bring up skin color in a conversation, a dating-related conversation? I'm just going to ignore your comment. You said it, so I'm trying to understand. No, it's okay. You said the words. I don't want to dig deeper into this. You don't want to dig deeper? I really don't. Do you want to walk back what you said? No, that's okay. Okay, you stand we by. We can move on. Hmm, yeah, and that's when I realized that, like, if I don't experience life the way I want to experience it, then, like, how am I ever going to learn? Exactly. Right? And so that's why I started my OnlyFans. Mm-hmm. And, like, I was like, oh, I'm self-employed now. I'm an entrepreneur. Like, I get the fuck guys on camera. Like, totally. forget about the spreadsheets. Like, I'm spreading my legs, mm-hmm. right? Like, I, I started to get, like, so comfortable in my own skin. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And other guys were getting comfortable coming on my skin. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, like, in my brain, in my existence, 
I realized like, oh, this is for me. This is my calling. A hundred percent. Right? And so I was like, okay, I got to deep throat the shit out of life. I agree. On some girl boss shit. Okay. And I start to manifest. I was like, oh, like if I manifest, like literally a festival of men exploding all over me, then like I'm winning at life. For sure. You know what I mean? And so I was like, oh, okay. Like you got to take action. You know, like if you don't take action, you can't let things happen to you. Like you have to literally make them happen. You're so right. Okay. So I was like, okay. I gotta start doing more of what I love, mm -hmm. which is cock. I swear to God, we need more oh parodies God, of this so shit. We really do. Mm. Mm. I've heard this Bumble put out a study that said 90% of women on Bumble set their profiles to only include men six feet and above. All right, 90%. Uh, which I guess makes me not a feminist anymore, dude. No, no. <laughs> I quit, dude. <laughs> Cause I was out there, dude. I mar I marched, okay. I f marched for your little your little twenty cents or whatever. I was out there, dude. <laughs> I couldn't see anything, but I marched, all right. <laughs> I was on someone's shoulders, but I f marched for you. Bitches. Would you turn off your Instagram, turn off your OnlyFans, turn off your Facebook, turn off all your social media if you found the right bro? If you found the guy who's like, I'm ride or die, man, this is the dude for me. Would you do that? And the the number one answer every single time we ask this is, of course, no, it's offensive. It means you're an incel. Because what will happen is it's them confronting a cognitive dissonance. That cognitive dissonance is, is this, is that it's threatening to not have social media. It's threatening to not have a basis for which they can advertise their sexuality. And I'll tell you why that is, because it's part, it's, you know, it's actually inherent. It's like yeah. inherent to, right. to women's mating strategy. <laughs> so to question it is it forces them to actually consider it. <laughs> Clytus, Clytus, Clytus. I look up Clytus is king. He's a bro need to perform to qualify for intimacy what that does is it turns men especially in the 21st century turns them into salesmen and we've always been kind of salesmen pitchmen right like select me choose me choose this dick right here here let me tell you it's on sale today you know 29.95 yeah and wait there's more <laughs> you know i've got a great job and i like dogs and i like to take long walks on the beach right that it, the guys is 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 usually men are pitching not well let's just say 80 to 90 percent of guys are pitching they are putting themselves out there they end up becoming salesmen women are marketers they're advertisers they don't have to go and sell a product they can if they want <laughs> and we know where that goes but for the most part, they advertise their sexuality. So they, and this is the, this is Roll Tomasi, the brand manager here. This is my, from 20 plus. A massive reduction in the amount of short-term sex that people are having. And also you have declining marriage rates and family rates. The number of men reporting no sex in the last year has tripled from 8% to 28% from 2008 to 2018. This is men between the ages of 18 and 30. Short-term sex has declined. This has also declined for women as well, but a little bit more for men. For the first time in history, 50.1% of women are childless at 30. And a report from Reuters says that 45% of prime working age women between 22 and 45 will be single and childless by 2040 what that wrong let me stop you right there chris you are misquoting the morgan stanley rise of the uh fem or the, excuse me the rise of the she economy and those numbers are incorrect sir i'll correct you later map shows is short-term sex and long-term mating seem to be on the decline which is crazy in a world of tinder and correct. facebook and instagram correct how is the ease of access to other partners increasing while what actually occurs in the real world seems to be dropping down Right, right, right. Hey, what's happening, guys? Hey, here we go. Hello there, children. How's it going? There we go. Say my name. Howdy, ho howdy, howdy, howdy. I'm a, look, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> How are we doing today, guys? How are we doing? How are we doing? Uh, let's move the camera a little bit differently. Every time I come back from 
from an outside podcast, although it was, I guess it was my podcast. I should shut up. Anyways, uh, how are we doing? How are we doing? Uh, let's see who's in the chat. Who do we have today? Uh, I've got, okay, already, man, you guys are already on top. Uh, Sam Bada is uh, dropping the band hammer. He is my mod today. I think Samishi's in there as well. Uh, Tori will probably show up at some point when she wakes up, uh, wherever she is. <laughs> Hi, Tori. Um, look, look. It works. Yes. I got the other, I got the other angle working right now. Pretty soon. This will be the, uh, the, I just have to like get the, yeah, gotta raise it up a little bit, but then this will be like my, uh, my horns. Can I see if I can get it right here? One sec. <laughs> I'm trying to get the horns on it. I'm trying to get this one. If I can get the, if I could just get the angle right, I could probably get the the horns on the uh, the Cytheria once again. And yes, I've got it's the return of the uh, return of the destroyer base because I've been using the four string actually instead of the five string recently. Anyways, yes, pod class is in session. Hello, children. How's it going? Welcome, 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 guys. Uh, so I wanted to, let's see, uh, start off with a, a few things here. I wanted to point out the reason why I put Chris Williamson's clip as the ending clip there is because I feel like merch, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like we are getting to the point right now in the sphere where um, we're playing the telephone game. You guys ever played the telephone game when you were kids? Like you'd sit in a circle or whatever, or like, I don't know, you get a bunch a bunch of people in the class and it was meant to show you like how rumors get started and how things sort of get, get mashed up. Well, of course, what it is, is like you are told, like somebody tells you something and it's like in order or it's an act, you know, and in the accurate form. And you're supposed to take that message and you're supposed to have whisper it in the guy's the next person's ear, the next kid's ear, whatever. And then by the time it comes around, yeah, ring, ring, ring. By the time it comes around, then the message has changed from like the first kid all the way to the 10th kid. And we're the 10th kid right now. I should say that. No, actually, um, uh, uh, let's see. Chris Williamson is the, the ninth kid <laughs> telling the 10th kid about the rise of the she economy. Thank you very much. You know what? Uh, you should say my name. Thank you very much. No, uh, Chris, it's not 45%. It's 42% and it's by 2030. That was not Reuters. And it is not um, single and child. This is just single. That is, and I've tr I've been trying to, you know, push you guys. Even if you're not in, the, I'm not in the manosphere. I'm not red pill. Then stop quoting shit like that, please. And there goes my monetization. Stop quoting stuff like that from the get from the rip. Okay. Um, I, you know, Adam Sosnick has done this, but he's not the only one. There's other people as well. Here we have Chris, Chris Williamson. I know I seem like an anal retentive a-hole when I'm asking for a little bit of accuracy. That's why when you're on like a very large, when you have that kind of audience, accuracy is key. And so when I start talking about you know why it is that the manosphere says certain things or what the maxims book that i'm working on thank you very much it's coming along nicely now um but the reason why i'm right i feel like i feel merch i feel like i have to write that god damn it i have no i don't feel i know i have to write this book so i can avoid that so that when people go hmm where did that come from where are those stats from it's not reuters brah it's not Reuters. It's Morgan Stanley. Rise of the she economy. That's where it came from. But you've heard it from me or you heard it from somebody else in the sphere who doesn't even who won't cite sources. You guys jump out my ass for not. It really doesn't say any sources. I cite sources all the damn time so much so that I catch stuff like that. <laughs> so when I and, and but I get run up. The, I get run up the flag. I get run up the flagpole. For being a dick about that. Sorry, not sorry. I have to do that. Oh, nobody says that anymore. Oh, sorry. Uh, what did you like? Oh, viral shorts. Rolo, your show on Axis Vegas was doing excellent until you let a kid with dynamite and Myron Gaines run your show. Uh, plus, uh, well, let's explain a few things. I know we're gonna have to we're gonna have to sort of break things down a little bit there. Uh, I have to explain to you like what the what the not the point what the uh, the mechanics and the logistics. There's, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts when you do a show of that caliber. Um, we decided from the rip that it was going to be a fresh and fit show. And, you know, just because I'm 
I'm promoting it on Access Vegas. It's in our studio, not our, my personal studio, but the studio that we use it is called Sticky Paws. I do not own that studio, <laughs> you know, it's despite popular opinion. So I do not actually own that studio. Um, that is a, uh, it's a commercial studio. I, I definitely pay a membership for it. Uh, we pay hourly. So does Miguel. So people, people got all over me the other day saying like, oh, Rolo says he's a one man show, but then he's got, um, he's got, uh, he's got, um, what you call it? Uh, he's got producers. I got, I have Travis. I have George. George is another guy. That's uh, one of the producers. Uh, then there's Chase. And there's a few other guys. Those are, those are generally the three guys that, that uh, do the production for our show. Yeah, I do. When I'm paying for studio time, that's part. I got to pay the bills. I got to pay my people. Sure. But I, they're, that's at the studio, man. They don't follow me around. They're not. I don't, I, George, uh, Travis, please come up to Reno. I need your help. Uh, I, I'm still like, here, look, I have to, I have to do that myself, right? I got to press the button to get back and forth. <laughs> I am the producer here. I am the law. <laughs> So uh, what you got here? Let's see. Uh, uh, you were uh, called it just pearly Adam 22 pivoting, going political black manosphere, cutting ties with Pearl. Yep. And we're going to talk about that one today, too. That's in the in the video list right now. Oh, yeah. We're going to go there. Uh, what else do we have? What you got? Oh, here we go. Uh, when are you going back on sauce cast? Um, I don't know. If they if, if they want me to, I did talk to uh, I have talked to Adam since uh, since our my my blow. I took that I took that video down for a variety of different reasons. And no, Adam Sosnick is not like trying to sue me for like anything for for, you know, copyright infringement or uh, or libel or anything like that. Uh, no, that was somebody else who will go nameless. But uh, hey, that's the way you want it. So I took it down anyways. Um but no, Adam had nothing to do with that. And I took it down for a variety of different reasons. Yep. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, this is so good. Thank you, Moose, for, for creating what, what is this, your 80th account now? <laughs> um, well, well, I, I mean, thanks for having my back, bro. <laughs> no, it's, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to throw too much at, uh, oh, hey, oh, new member. Thank you. Wait, wait, wait. We need a new member thing. Hey, what, what should be the new member here? That'll, hey, yo. that'll be the new member. Thing. Um, hey, well, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. I'll tell you the thing that get, get that I, I ate a lot of, you know, shit for was, um, calling out Pearl for having, uh, Nick Fuentes on the show. And again, I didn't necessarily care so much about the fact she can have whoever I'm not telling anybody how to, God forbid. Now I'm not telling anybody ever again, how to run their own damn show, especially after last Thursday. But, um, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily, although now it is, but it wasn't at that time. It wasn't necessarily the, the having Nick on the show. It was the fact that she was trying to explain that she didn't know who he was. Now we know that that is bullshit, categorically bullshit. And, uh, yes, I saw the, uh, I saw the video with, um, with, uh, was it, uh, was it a mediocre tutorials? For, what is the guy's name? I don't know. I always call him MTR. <laughs> um, but, uh, he came out Pearl pretty hard and we're going to sort of i'll break that down i won't do the whole damn thing because it's i think it's like 20 minutes long i'm not going to dig too too deep into that the actual theme of today's show is is i i wanted to dig into uh, a section of dr david buss's uh conversation with joe rogan recently because it's a show that i've been wanting to have with mike sartain so think of this as mike if you're watching also think of this as sort of like a primer to the show that i would like to have with you so we can have this discussion uh, i want to get into the nuts and bolts of the differences between uh what uh, dr david buss calls uh mate shift or mate switching shifting switching hypothesis versus ovulatory shift and do the dual uh, mating strategy. I'm going to dig into that today. That's actually going to be the, the primary direction of today. Uh, what you got here, Myron is very direct. Yeah. Um, yeah, he does. And I wanted to also point out that um, uh, going into a, uh, going into a, a, somebody else's podcast, right. Where you don't know the variables. I mean, I understand like we we told Myron from the from the rip that I mean, it's his show. We, it was on Fresh and Fit. He has a much larger audience than we well, certainly access Vegas. Now, my audience is what am I at? Two hundred two hundred and eight thousand 
uh, subs, okay, organic subs, and yes, I know or subs are a vanity metric, but still, that's the way people like to, you know, measure the quality of a show. Um, but he obviously has a much larger market share than Access Vegas does because we're playing to about a thousand live views, and he's playing to about fourteen thousand live views. So it's his show. From that point, we ran it that way. He, uh, we ran it just, or he ran it just like a uh, fresh and fit show. So uh, it's uh, they did, while they didn't collect um, cell phones like they usually do, it was like please put them out, turn them off, try, you know, uh, you know, put them in your purse, whatever. We're not going to take them from you, but we don't want that distraction going on. So that was number one. See, that's how we run things a little bit differently on Access Vegas. We are okay with the girls having their cell phones because they like to watch you guys. They like to watch the chat. They really, if they're watching the chat, that's one thing. If they're getting you know text or whatever, and they look bored or whatever, yeah, then then that's I can understand that. But uh, the girls like to watch the chat. And we're okay with that because we want them to respond to the chat. That's actually part of like our show. That's not part of Fresh and Fit. So that was number one. Uh, number two, there's a history with Toy Hardy and uh, and the boys. And I did not realize that until it was too late. I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, those are pretty good. That's uh, that's Clytus is King. Uh, you can go find him. Uh, he follows me. Just uh, all you got to really do is just like Clytus is King on like um, on Instagram and uh uh, Twitter. He's not, he's all over the place. He, he's a really good friend. He's a friend of the show. And I, I don't know why he got banned. He, I, is he banned? Cause he said he can't comment on the show. I have to figure out what's going on with that. But Gladys, if you're watching, I will definitely unban you if that's the case. Uh, I didn't think you were, but who knows? Maybe I have some overzealous mods. So anyways, the, uh, yeah, I mean, is a distraction sometimes, but if the girls are like watching the chat, which is what I do more or less on every show, you'll see my phone is there on a rack and I'm watching the chat. I have to, I mean, I want to make sure that I'm getting to the, you know, the spicy, uh, super chats because I really feel that that's the primary interest in what I call engagement media, right? Which is what we're doing right now. We're engaging in engagement media. So, um, yeah, I, 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 the the criticism was primarily that uh, Myron was a little uh, too confrontational, like unnecessarily confrontational. And I can sort of get that, but I also I can understand that, but I can also sort of get that as well. Um, the reason why there was conflict between uh, Myron and Fresh and Toy Hardy is because she was Mike Rashid's ex. And she was she really wanted to come on the show. I met her at Babes in Toyland the weekend before. Uh, once I think she'd figured out who I was and th then also discovered that we were going to have Myron and Fresh in the studio in Vegas, she really, really wanted to be in. And I was like, well, oh, great. Well, you know, more the merrier. Let's have her on. She wanted, she flew her in, flew in from Hollywood or from LA just to do that show. And now I know why, <laughs> because I, there is some history with her, uh, breaking up with, uh, my, I think they were together for, I don't know the details. I don't pretend to know the details, but I do know that there's a backstory there and it made much more sense once she got to the studio and a lot of stuff went on like before and then after the show as well. So but before you guys go and, you know, pass judgment on the whole show, understand there's a lot that went on behind the scenes that you guys really don't know about. So. Uh, Rolo, do you think the red queen hypothesis can be applied in the SMP? Yes, I can actually. And the selfish gene, although that's another bull, actually. Well, I do, okay. So the red queen by Matt Ridley, uh, excellent book. You want my, one of my top 10 books. That's one of them. Uh, the, the red queen by Matt Ridley. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit older now. So I have to sort of qualify that it's, it's a little older, but I mean, the principles are more or less the same. Um, in foundations, it's still, I think, a valid book, but uh, so and and yes, can absolutely be applied to the sexual marketplace today. Uh, people kept asking me about like my top ten books. Maybe towards the end of the show, I'll, I'll at least like rattle off five or six of them today. But uh, at some point, I probably will do a, a full book uh, show. I have now, I'll also explain why I have a hesitation about doing those things because. I think a lot of people look for answers and solutions to their problems in a book when, and I'm not saying that, that please read my book, right? But it's also in the application. Is that book applicable? Can you take what you, is the information in that actionable? And are you going to implement that? That I think is almost more important than actually reading the book. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, well, I tried, you know, I think a lot of people thought, well, you know, oh, Rolo and Mike are just sitting there with their dicks in their hand and they're not saying anything. It's their show. No. 
it, we ran it as if it was a fresh and fit show. They have a much bigger audience than we do. And yeah, we were kind of in a, we were kind of in a, in a, in a bind, right? We've never had a, um, a castling on our show. In fact, that was part of our sort of, I don't say mission statement, but our charter anyways, is not to kick girls off. We have, uh, you know, I think that that was actually the most girls we've had on any show. So when we've got 10, uh, it's hard, man. I think we had like nine, nine girls and then us. I mean, it was, we had all, it was 11, 11 people were on, were on that show. Maybe it was less than that. Maybe it was like, I think it was like eight girls and us somewhere around there. Anyways. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was a, it was a learning experience for sure, but that's not our chart. Like we have a different show than my, you want to know, like people say, Oh, you guys are just trying to be like the Vegas version of fresh fit. No. And I think that the last show pretty much explains why we're not. So people think, Oh, you, you don't go hard enough on the girls. Well, if, if your if your favorite show is Myron and fresh or for your favorite show is whatever podcast, if your favorite show is, um, you know, where the, there's a potential for the girls to like either, you know, castle themselves or get castled as well. Maybe we're not the show for you. We, that's why we're not like that. So we're kind of in a tough spot, you know, it's their show and Myron can run it however he wants to. And we, we said, you know, from the get go, Myron, it's, it's on you, man. And I did, if you, you'll notice that the access Vegas show went for the first hour of the three hour plus show. And once we hit the hour mark, then we killed my stream. And then it was just on my, on fresh and fit at that point, it's a fresh and fit show. So, and it's, is it Mike's friends? Yes, it is. Um, a lot of people say, well, we should have kicked off Myron. I'm like, I'm not, like uh, imagine where our position is where Myron's running the show and we're like, is she going to leave? Is she not going to leave? I mean, she, she took up, you know, took off on her own. So it worked out, but like from the get go, she was already kind of confident. She like toy Hardy was very confrontational with Myron. And I knew that was, I, I knew probably within the first five minutes that that was what's going to happen. So there you go. Um, yeah, I try to, I try to stay humble. I really do. It's hard. It's hard to be humble. <laughs> uh, uh, Rolla looks max for Asians. Okay. Um, <laughs> K-pop, K-pop, Max, don't don't do it, <laughs> please don't do it. <laughs> yes, I know what K-pop is. Unfortunately, uh, you know how I know what K-pop is because what is it? Tim Henson from Polyphia, Polyphia was uh, like I I there's he's like very popular to that set, and I know who Tim Henson is, and so I'm like, whoa. Uh, lost all respect for her on the age thing, but I really hated her when she made a stupid comment about having cancer. Uh, if you're uh, a weak man, uh, big L. Okay. Um, what else you got here? Throw that out. Uh, I love the FNF access Vegas. I thought it was a good show overall. I thought it was, it was, I would love to, I'd like to do it again, but like, you know, sort of get the right people on there. Um, by the way, Oh, let me finish here. Uh, I knew the girl who refused to say her age was trouble. Yeah. Um, and you'll notice that every other girl was just completely okay with saying that. So at that point, I think really what that was, was sort of a battle of the egos. It wasn't even so much age. I think it was who was going to establish frame and Myron was establishing frame and he knows how to do that. And he will, he's actually very, he's very practiced at that and very good at it. Uh, Myron should also realize hypergamy isn't a straight jacket. Myron tends to speak in absolutes. Uh, yeah, but sometimes necessarily so. Um, because it's hard to get a point across that's, you want to know, gosh, man, you really want my opinion on this. I'll give you my opinion. Uh, I don't like to do opinions or judgments, but I will, I will point out here the, let's see, like contrast, let's, let's contrast, um, fresh and fit versus like, say someone like, uh, Brian from whatever podcast who is starting to starting to go up. I think, I think Brian is probably going to overtake Pearl here very soon. And probably because Pearl's kind of dropped the ball recently. Um, but Brian's already, you know, getting Michael Knowles on there and getting, you know, he's sort of like, he's kind of like playing to, I don't say the lowest common denominator, but he knows he's starting to figure out how the game is played. And, um, but if you look at the difference, like say between um, uh, Brian, who is the host of whatever podcast, and you contrast that with Myron, Brian's not going to say, okay, bitch, get off the show. Like that's not going to happen. He doesn't, Frank, they castle themselves. There's been women who like, like walk off. Sure. But they castle themselves. And he's like, okay, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, but he's not confrontational in that sense. Um, when you look at Myron and Fresh, it's good cop, bad cop. You got um, Myron, who is the bad cop or the, you know, the 
the, the taskmaster, right? He's the one who's going to lay down the law. Fresh is there to just kind of like, you know, what's going on? What He's kind of like that fresh kind of, that's why I call it fresh. Right? He's got that kind of, I want to say naivete, but it's not really naivete. It's a, um, it's a, he's much more, I say agreeable, but he's more amenable. He's like easier to sort of, he's more easygoing than say Myron. And that's the one thing that whatever podcast lacks, there is only Brian. There is no, he's like the bad cop and there is no good cop. Right. And he's not even really a bad cop. It's just sort of like, I'm going to deliver these lines. I'm going to read from the script and ladies react to me. You know, it's like Jim Rome <laughs> react to me. <laughs> um, and, and we'll take it from there kind of thing. So when I look at the differences between those two hosting styles right there, um, you can definitely see the difference in the contrast between those two. So uh, what's this? Still, it's your show. At least uh, you say we will cut our show in, uh, instead of Myron going blindside. Well, yeah, but uh, we kind of we kind of prefaced it that way. You know, we said, hey, it's going to be their show up until a, an hour in, and then we're going to we're going to we're going to kill the feed. Uh, I think that's an extreme Rolo. We don't want uh, to castle girls, but you always said you were swing right and swing left. I do call it the BS. When you see it, uh, I sent uh, two super chats, access Vegas. They never got read. Let me explain something else to you. Where did you send them? Did you send them to me or did you send them to fresh and fit? Because fresh and fit had like 14,000 live views. And so if you were on fresh and fit and you did super chats, I can't really help you with that. Um, the other thing is, is we also have, uh, two guys who were running production at the time. It was George and Travis were there and um, we can only get to so many of them. Also, if you had it and we had to kill the stream, then if we hadn't got to it, by the time we came back to the other stream, our, like my super chats were gone. We're, we're done at that point. So it would have been fresh and fit at that time. And again, they're 14,000 subs. And I mean, the chat is just like, whipping by not slow mode just whipping by if i didn't get to your chats if you want to put them back up here man uh, uh avm i'll be happy to read them but uh I, I apologize if we didn't get to i tried to get to every single chat but again we're trying to you know like i said there's a lot of moving parts there so uh brian from whatever needs uh, yeah i think so i think he would do very like that show would really take off if he had a co-host i think and I'm not suggesting it's me because I don't want to move to Santa Barbara. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think he would do better if he had a if he had a fresh right if he had a co-host, but who was a little bit more I don't know affable. Is that, a, that the word I'm looking for? Not really sure. Yeah, yeah. Myron's very agreeable, and that's cool. He's he's easy going. That's why I love Fresh, and that's why I love my well. My fresh is is agreeable. Did you say? Did you say? Yeah, Fresh is agreeable. Yeah. My, and, and that's why they're a great freaking combination, man, because they each balance out each other. If it was just Myron, people would be like, oh, it's just like this, you know, hard you know, punch in the face one after the other. Whereas like fresh is there to soften the blow. If, if it's just fresh, then it's kind of it's, it's a, it lacks the focus that it takes between the two of them. That's why they are so good together. So uh, let's see. What? 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 From what year is your Twitter throwback picture? Throwback picture. Oh, oh, you mean where I'm sitting on the on the bench? On the on the stool? <laughs> was I 28? <laughs> uh, men love idealistically, women love opportunistically, except when women fall for bad boys, they lose their minds, even if bad boys treat them like shit uh, and don't provide. It's not opportunistic, but uh, an emotional infatuation. Uh, yes and no. Um, it's also sexual arousal. There's an arousal factor in there. We need to stop prioritizing emotion as if that's the, the be all end all. And if there's one thing that I have learned over the course of really doing, well, certainly doing live podcasts with women on the shows, um, it, the medium is the message. I think I knocked it out of the park with that, with that chapter in, in book one. Um, don't watch what, don't, excuse me, watch what a woman does. Don't listen to what she says, people go, oh, that's good. People, you know, it's funny is people lock on to that, but they fail to really read the rest of that chapter or the rest of that, the parts. And that, by the way, it's not an iron rule. That's just a, a probably a, I don't know, a prominent chapter in the first book, which is the medium is the message, right? And yeah, no, I didn't come up with the medium is the message is actually somebody else said that, but I'm saying that I'm reapplying that towards red pill and the mass variant intersexual dynamics. The meaning of the message is this is like, there is no such thing as mixed messages. 
There is no such thing when you when guys say, oh, I don't know what to think. Roll this girl sending me mixed messages. No, she's telling you exactly what she means. It's just that you don't want to hear it or you, you're, you're unable to sort of like uh, understand her language. And what that language is, is, is she flaking for on dates? That's the message. Is she kind of like standoffish? Is she not 100% interested in you? Are, are there behavioral cues that kind of give you the, that sort of give your like peripheral awareness, the idea that maybe she's not all that into you? That's the message. That is the message. So that's the, that's the difference there. Okay, here we go. Uh, Emilio, Emilio, Fenicio, Fenicio, Emilio, the Phoenix. Uh, would love to see a study of who reproduces more Men father from homes of fatherless homes. Uh, if con if convicted criminals reproduce at higher rates with multiple women, the criminal men tend to come from fatherless homes. Um, yes and no. There are actually studies. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any of those loaded up because that wasn't really what I was uh, going to focus on. Um, if I later on, if I can um, go back, opt to go back to my my bookmarks and my Twitter to sort of uh, dig those out. But yes, the the short version of that, Emilio, is uh, criminals like guys who are like dark triad personality traits, guys who are convicted criminals, guys who are gang leaders, guys who are ba stereotypical bad boys tend to reproduce more than nice uh, pro social, agreeable guys. In fact, um, there is a negative correlation between reproduction and agreeableness in men. I've got several studies on that as well. Um, let's see. Uh, what do you got? Man, you guys are on fire today already. I'm trying to keep these up. If this is a four hour, okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the vote of confidence, man. <laughs> uh, Mike Sartain's face during Frank Castle is hilarious. Yeah, my face was too. <laughs> Sorry. I knew it was going to happen. I absolutely knew it was going to happen. So, um, you know, at that, at that point, what do you do? Like, like, like put yourself in our position at that point. Like, what do we do? Do we kick Myron and fresh off the show? Of course not. You know, um, and in favor of keeping toy on the show. No, most definitely not. However, I will say this is like, I don't think that there's any really necessary. There's no reason to, Pre, to pre-establish the fact that um, like women are, women are stupid, 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 right? But it was at the uh, um, name three countries, right? And that's, that's minor and fresh. That's okay. And that's cool. It works very well for them. Uh, it wouldn't occur to me to like throw that one out there. And so like Mike and I, after the show, me and Mike, were, we were kind of talking, we we're kind of, you know, summing up, you know, cause we always usually do like sort of a review after every show. And I said, we should start the next show where we ask each other like to name 15 countries a piece, like both me and him. Like, well, let's, let's make it really hard. We got like just off the top of our head and we can't name the same countries that the other guy did. Um, really, what's the point of that? To establish that women don't know geography? Yeah. But I would also point out that like I've seen like, what is it? The Jay Leno man on the street kind of thing or the uh, I forget what it is, like uh, Conan O'Brien or something like that, where they go on the street and they just ask people, general people, like, where is this? Can you point on, on a map to where Iraq is? Can you point on a map to where Estonia is? Can you point on a map to where Tokyo would be or, you know, like stuff like that? And of course they only ever really show, and it's not just like women I mean, mostly, but it's like, you know, even guys who are like supposed to be like college graduates, they can't, you know, Americans are stupid when it comes in general are stupid when it comes to geography. They can't point to where our troops are in Kazakhstan, you know, or wherever they, you know, Obekistan or whatever stand somewhere. Right. So, but like, what's the, what's the point of establishing that? And again, you can still, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying that there's other ways to do so. So I was watching um, just recently, there was a, uh, was it Sterling Cooper was on whatever podcast and Sterling Cooper went in there like a freaking surgeon and he doesn't have to go. He doesn't like try to make the girls feel stupid from the outset, but he catches them in contradiction after contradiction after contradiction. He delivers it in such a way where it's like, respectfully, you're wrong. And let me explain why. Right. You just said that you do OnlyFans and yet you're you have a problem with guys with a high body count or whatever. Like he's finding these these contradictions, but he lets women make their own mistakes. He points out the cognitive dissonance. He points out like in, you know, in very artful. I mean, it's like an art to watch Sterling do this. And so he'll pick this stuff out 
and he'll explain things like closed on your end, open on my end when it comes to like uh, polyamory, poly, whatever he wants, you know, multiple women. Right. Um, and then he waits, he waits for the moment because he knows what they're going to say. He knows what the reaction is going to be, which is, oh, that's so unfair. That's a double standard. Well, OK, now we're now we're in the double standard and he uh, that that topic. And now he can tease out stuff out of that as well. That's a different approach than just from the get go, uh, you know, it, it, like blood force trauma, as opposed to, you know, being a surgeon and just surgically cutting out the heart of women's um, opinions or their understanding of intersexual dynamics or their, uh, their, their, their really cognitive dissonance. Sterling's very good, but again, it's just different approaches. It's just different ways of doing it. Like Mike and I do it in a different way than Sterling or Myron and Fresh. Sterling does it way differently than Myron would do, right? And if you go and you watch the interview or the, the quote unquote date with, with Myron and Sean Reynolds, he doesn't from the rip come out and say, oh, sorry, Sean Reynolds, you're stupid because he's on her show. But he did very, very well on that interview because he was like he was a surgeon. He was he knew what he was going to say and he knew what the counters were going to say. You do this long enough. You know what's going to happen. You know what the, the most common comebacks are. You want to know why I did so well on Dr. Phil? Because I knew what I was. I, I went in there knowing how to defend a point. Thank you very much. And I think that, like, certainly Sterling knows how to do that. Myron knows how to do that, too. He just has a different approach. So, PP, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Thank you for that, my friend. Here you go. PP? PP! <laughs> well, I'm a whore. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, PP. Thank you for your, uh, there it is. Uh, always a pleasure to do. Uh, do you have any plans on coming to the Northeast, like Pencil Pennsylvania? Um. The only time I'm up that way is when I go and I do, uh, I'm usually there once a year thus far <laughs> when I go see the Sable brothers. Um, and far as that's concerned, it's usually like Connecticut, but I don't see any problem with like uh, going that. I know uh, people want me to go, uh, you know, meet up with me in like New Hampshire and some other, like New York, of course, too. Any good books on podcasts on men's mental health? Uh, we'll talk about that actually a little bit later, man. Uh, books. Well, the thing about it is most books on men, men's mental health are written from the perspective of what would work for women. So do I have any off the top of my head? No, I, I'm sorry. I don't, but yeah. Um, yeah. And if you're feeling burnout, uh, I can, I can definitely talk to you about burnout. Uh, oh, I got one more in here. This was pretty good too. Uh, Emilio, sorry, I didn't get back to you. Uh, so there's a, so there are documentaries about the Tinder swindler but never a documentary about men who are victims of paternal fraud, let alone uh, legally obtained a DNA test. Why doesn't Dr. Buss explore that? Because Dr. Buss isn't interested in those things. Um, Dr. Buss is, let, let me, uh, you know what, uh, in the course of today's show, I will definitely get to the reasons why that is. Okay. So maybe we should just dig into that, shall we? Um, recently, Dr. David Buss, who is a, uh, the patron saint of uh, evolutionary psychology was on uh, was on Joe Rogan again. I mean, I think he's this is like the second or third time he's been on there. I, I'm sure I've seen him on there once before. Um, who else? Uh, doc, or excuse me, Dr. Jordan Peterson's been on there several times as well. And every time it's um, it's kind of a mixed bag. I think Jordan Peterson was much more on top of his game, like in 2018 or 2019. I don't know when it was. 2018, I think when he was first on Joe Rogan and he was uh, definitely a different person and a different personality. Now a lot's happened with, with Peterson since then. Uh, I have seen Dr. David Buss on Chris Williamson. I've seen, well, he's, hell, he's done a show with Mike Sartain. Uh, I've seen him on Lex Friedman. I've seen Friedman, Friedman. How do you say his name? I've seen him on a lot of different things. Uh, it was primarily when he was promoting his most recent book, which is like what men behaving badly. Right. And that was a that was a rough book. I could not get all the way through that because it was just it seemed like it was very contrived. And of course, they're going to say, "Well, Roll, of course you would think it's contrived because you're well, you're a misogynist, sexist prick. You're a red pill guy, and he's talking shit about your people." And I'm like, mm, "Not really." And I don't even have a problem with people if they if it's a valid you know concern, if it's a valid fact, it's factual. 
please tell me why I'm full of shit. I would love to know. Like whenever people want to like debate me or, or they want to have some, like I have a bone to pick with me. It's me that they have a bone to pick with. Not what I said, not the factual basis of the things that I, I put forth in my books or, or my essay, or by the way, my sub stack, please. I've just started a sub stack. If you guys want to get involved in that, uh, it, I believe I put the link down in the, in the description. Um, if I haven't, I will. Um, but I'm doing, uh, I'm doing sub stack, you know, my books, my, my blog, I've got 20 plus years doing this. And yet people still want to throw rocks at me personally, rather than what I've said, or they want to throw rocks at me because they think I said something and they don't have the intellectual, you know, wherewithal, they, they're intellectually lethargic and they don't want to read anything more than like sort of the cliff notes of the rational male rather than, you know, oh, Roland, I've, I've heard that he doesn't have cite any sources. Well, what, first off, the first book wasn't about that. Secondly, go look at the, go look at the book five, go look at book four, hell, even book three sources cited all through those. Nobody says jack shit about that, but they want to throw rocks at me because somebody told them somewhere at some time that Roland doesn't cite source. Yeah, because I'm, I wasn't, I'm not an evolutionary psychologist. That was the, the rational male wasn't meant to be a science textbook, but you know, apparently that's what they, they, that they think is my purpose here. Or they think that that's my, my ideology or something. And, oh, well, he doesn't talk about sources. I talk about them all the time and we're going to talk about them today. And if you watch this show, even for the first hour, I usually put, yeah, I put, put some studies up. Nobody says anything about that. I mean, that's a problem then, but, um, the problem I have, I got to give you a caveat here before I start the uh, the video. Um, and I've got some other stuff too besides this, but I do want to definitely start off with uh, with uh, David Buss here. Um, my caveat is this. Whenever I talk about anyone or I am critical of what they're saying, I am not trying to be critical of the person. I might be critical of their motives because it, if it affects the way they interpret data, I will definitely point that out. Doesn't mean I think you're a bad person. It just means I think that you're interpreting this data set or this information in such a way as it will fit in with whatever your lifestyle is or your ideology is or your convictions are or whatever is going to benefit your brand, your, your brand of me, <laughs> your brand of personality. So I will talk about that. But like whenever I talk about Jordan Peterson, whenever I talk about Michaela Peterson, whenever I have uh, it does, even Chris Williamson, whatever, it makes no difference who it is. I'm always going to, you know, take flack for someone saying, oh, you're just professionally jealous. Roll really? Again, because that's usually the first thing that's out of anybody's mouth. So I always have to throw the caveat out here. I'm not attacking the person. I'm attacking the ideas here. And I don't think that they're well thought out, especially when it comes to mate switching hypothesis. I think that's an important uh, distinction to put on the end of that. Um, so I'm going to dig into that because there's this section, about a 15 minute section of the Joe, and I sped it up just a touch. Um, and hopefully I don't get the, I'm, I'm going to say right here, uh, you know, fair, fair use. I'll, I'll put the whole thing out there. Hey, thank you very much for that. Oh, wait. Keep a Ned off the pole. <laughs> off of only fans <laughs> on the pole too. Uh, one super chat at a time. Um, so I'm going to dig into uh, Dr. David Buss here, but I want to, again, give you the caveat here. I'm not trying to attack David Buss. He is like the patron saint of evolutionary psychology. He has been the teacher of such luminaries as my favorite, uh, uh, Gad Saad, Dr. Gad Saad, who, by the way, is sort of like dipping his toes in like the manosphere, sort of. Um, uh, Dr. Marty Hazelton, uh, Dr. Gangstad, um, Dr. Uh, David Schiff, who was a, was his partner for, not like partner, partner, but like his like colleague, maybe I should clarify it like that. His colleague uh, who's written quite a few books and has written books with, or papers, I think with him as well, uh, who I, I quite like Dr. Schiff as well, but and nobody even knows who his name is. They only know who Dr. David Buss is. Uh, it, you know, Dr. David Schiff is not getting interviewed by Joe Rogan. <laughs> so uh, I want to point that out as I'm, I, I do not give two shits about being professionally jealous or otherwise of, of, of David Buss. I think he has definitely contributed, like more than contributed to the field of evolutionary psychology. And I think he's definitely uh, should be uh, a, a 
quotable resource with respect to the red pill and the manosphere. But I think he is sort of fallen prey to what I see a lot of guys falling prey to right now. Um, I happen to very much like Rob Henderson as well, who does not quite have his doctorate yet, but will soon. He'll be an evolutionary psychologist and, or I think, or sociologist. I'm not sure exactly what his major is, but he is bound to have his doctorate like within the year, I think. He's still at Cambridge. I'm not sure. Uh, anyways, I have, I have nothing but respect for that guy. Got nothing respect. You know, from a from a professional and an academic perspective, I got nothing but respect for even uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. I think he's wrong on a great many things, and I think he is wrong because of the direction that is that Michaela is sort of pointing his brand. Um, I think he's a completely different person and a completely different brand since uh, he joined up with uh, Daily Wire. But you know. That's my professional opinion, but it doesn't mean that he hasn't done some significant work. It also doesn't mean that Dr. B the, Dr. Bus hasn't either. So what are you saying? Uh, never underestimate a XX's ability to rationalize irrationality and cognitive dissonance are both the same. No, no. What is cognitive? Oh, God damn it. What? I don't even know how much this is. What is that? I don't even, what is that? Is that a like, form of currency? Is that? No, the difference is, is that cognitive dissonance, the, the actual cognitive dissonance is holding two or more <laughs> conflicting ideas and then sort of like, but not, not really resolving the conflict between those ideas. Those ideas might be completely rational, but they conflict with each other. They both make perfect sense, but they conflict with each other. So don't think cognitive dissonance is, oh, it's irrational. That's how it could have lots of people do. In fact, in some cases, it's the only way you can sort of uh, test the strength of either one of those ideas is by like holding them at the same time. It's OK to consider things that might seem very abhorrent to, to people. It doesn't mean you're endorsing those ideas. It's called a thought experiment. So, yeah, in that case, your thought experiment might be an exercise in cognitive dissonance. And both of those ideas might be completely rational, but one's probably going to cancel out the other one. So what's this? Batman and Robin. Yes. Yes, they are. Nah, 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 nah. I need that theme song. I need the Batman theme song. Anyways. Okay. So we're going to get into this. Now, let me give you a little bit of build up here because a lot of people uh, over the years, by the way, you, you, this is not new. This is not novel. Okay. Nothing I'm about to get into is novel. I've had this discussion really since 2018, 2017. One of the first lectures that I did at the 21 convention. And I will, I'm very proud of this, the work I did there. I don't really, I'm not proud of the people I did it for, but I'm, I'm proud of the work that I've done. The very first talk I did was, um, was based on um, ovulatory shift and how uh, your friend menstruation. And I got into, let's see, where is it? I think I might have this loaded. That's where, where did it go? That's where you'll see stuff like this. That's where I, I come up with the the timeline. You know, when we talk about men's peak uh, sexual market value, pers prospectively their peak SMV versus women's. You want to know where we start talking about, like when you when Myron starts rattling off stuff about um, about how women are given like a million dollars in their sexual agency and they have to find a way to invest it before they get to be thirty. This is where that comes from. Okay. That, you know, in principle, this is where that comes from. So when women get to be, tw you know, 23 years old, they're, they're at the peak of their sexual agency. The, they're at their peak sexual market value and the peak sexual market agency, the power that comes from that. And any woman telling you different is full of shit. In fact, women are embracing this. You want to know where hypergamy comes from? It comes at a woman who's 23 and it comes out of where a man is like 36 or thereabouts. Okay, Fight me. I don't care. It's also where this comes from. Okay. So when I start talking about ovulatory shift, people say, well, that's the, that, that's the underpinnings of the red pill. Mm, yes and no. I think that even if, it, if tomorrow we say, oh, you know what? Ovulatory shift's out the window, but here's another, here's another competing philosophy or competing hypothesis or competing experiment research, whatever. I'm willing to listen to that. I still think that from a... Um, a lived experience, you know, perspective. I think one of the problems that a lot of people have with research today is that you can quote all kinds of, you cite all kinds of sources, right? You can uh, quote all kinds of research 
uh, that say, oh, look, this this conflicts with the manosphere, right? Look here. It's like that dude, from, uh, Alex from Dates, like, look, I found all this stuff that is like, you're going to find what you're looking for. We can have dueling research and we can go and say, well, that's invalid because they didn't have a large enough sample size. That's invalid because it doesn't uh, replicate, right? The crisis of replication, which I've done a full show on with, with, uh, with Ryan. And I know this is some really dry shit. Like people don't like the, Oh God, what's replication. <sighs> is it true or is it not true? I got to go back to my next TikTok video like that. Like it's dry stuff. So when I do a quote unquote pod class and I'm not kicking bitches off the show or I'm not like, you know, making girls feel stupid or I'm not like, that's not even the point of the show. I mean, the topic of the show. Yeah. You have to have a real keen interest in this stuff and not enough people do. So I am in this constant state of chasing my tail about like accuracy. Like I was with Chris Williamson. Um, accuracy is number one. The other thing is like, where does that come from? People want to say, well, Rolla doesn't cite sources. I start citing sources and people are like, <sighs> they zone out. Nobody, can, like, if, if I did that with every single thing I did, if I did that, imagine me doing that. Imagine, <laughs> imagine me doing a series of TikTok videos where all I'm doing is citing like this, you know, <laughs> or I'm citing, uh, let's see, let's discuss the four laws of behavioral genetics. That'll be really thrilling on TikTok. No, no, it won't. <laughs> but I can talk about it. Here. Hey, oh, the triune mind theory. Let's start talking about that in an Instagram reel. N nobody cares. No, nobody cares. No one cares. But they do care if I go, hey, look, this bitch did this guy wrong. Oh, my. <gasps> then that place. Yeah. You know, people say, oh, Rolo, you're selling out. Mm, no, it's everybody else sold out. And so when I do something that's even remotely like that, people think I'm selling out because all I think he's not doing dry shit anymore. <laughs> Just dry up and blow away. So, yeah. Remember that uh, while we're getting through this, because. Uh, I think this is actually a pretty interesting conversation. If you follow me and uh, and why aren't you uh, on Twitter, uh, Roll Tomasi at Rational Mill, um, or on Instagram, you can find me there. I'm a little bit more animated and f I'm much more fun to be around on Instagram than I am on on uh, Twitter. <laughs> much, it's almost like a different personality. <laughs> but uh, but you can check that out. But uh, you know, a lot of people come to my they they come to this spot and they read my books because they want to have a little bit more, um, they want a class, man. They want to be educated as opposed to just, like, it's not, I've tried to entertain, hope I'm entertaining you, but uh, I try to be entertaining, certainly on Access Vegas, but I'm also trying to educate. And there's always a fine line and there's a balance between those two. You know how I know? Because whenever Mike and I start talking about evolutionary psychology on Access Vegas, the women's eyes just go roll back in their head, right? They, it's, it's like they zone out. Until we come back and start talking about Kim Kardashian and how it applies to what we were just talking about in evolutionary psychology. Oh, I, I saw her. You know, you know what I'm saying. So it ends up becoming some very dry shit. And so bear with me as we kind of get through this because it's kind of a uh, it's sort of a paradox that I have to deal with all the time. So without further ado, this is uh, Dr. David Buss on the Joe Rogan Show. Hopefully, I don't get a strike for this. I uh, flipped it. I sped it up a little bit, and I turned it black and white. So hopefully, I don't get uh, too much of a, I don't, I don't get any, um, I don't get any uh, strikes, well, not strikes, you know, copyright claims. Uh, I'm, if I'm correct, uh, to feel outraged seeing these obese women lionized upon advertisements from Victoria's Secret. Yeah, you know, you're correct. You know why you feel that way? Because that's an imbalance. And I, I will use the term feel in this in this case. That's actually a pretty good question um, because you see an imbalance. You're supposed to, you're not, you know, I, what's interesting is you, when it comes to body positivity, and he actually talks about this, when it comes to body positivity, um, the, uh, it, it's, it's, it's okay for women to want to bang Jason Momoa, but it's not okay for you to want to get, get with, I don't know, name a hot bitch, right? Name it, name a hot girl. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's not okay for you to want that because then suddenly, like evolutionarily speaking, women want women are okay with a guy who is, is six foot three, like Jason Momoa, or how tall is he? Um, or, or Justin Waller. They're okay with that. He's got to have six pack abs, he's got to has has that arousing features. But if you will like that, then you're a very bad, bad man. 
Well, the reason for that is because it's evolutionarily speaking, you see a discrepancy. You see an imbalance. When you see a hot chick at the beach in a thong and she's holding hands with a guy who's like morbidly obese, he's like 600 pounds, 400 pounds. And you go, how to spot a rich guy, right? There's something that's offsetting that oh, she would never be with him if it wasn't for something else, right? Yeah, the reason why that bugs you is because it's an imbalance. It's an incongruency. And guys, you want to, you know, what makes us laugh? Incongruency. You know, what makes us outrage? Incongruency. You know what, uh, um, you know what sells very well on TikTok? Incongruencies. That's why. You're just noticing the incongruency and you're upset about it. And, and you don't know why you are, but am I, am I right? I don't know. You tell me, are you right? Because <laughs> the judgment call is up to you, not me. I'm just, I just work here, man. Uh, why not speak with professional in Evo Psych if you're about accuracy? Uh, I've, I, well, I, I would, I would like to, I've already put my, uh, my feelers out there for Dr. Gad Saad. Um, the problem is not a lot of these guys want to talk to me because I think I would ask questions like I'm about to here right now. And I'm not popular in that set uh, because the, I think they're, I'm not saying they're afraid of me, but I think that maybe they're afraid of the questions I would ask uh, or simply other people in the field like Reeves. Reeves was a good, would dis, was a good discussion. And you know, and what happened? What happened when I did that? Oh, Rolo, you should have punched him in the face. He's a liberal leftist. That's what I get. That's why that doesn't happen very often, <laughs> because there's always going to be a set of people who say, oh, man, Rolo and Mike really pushed out. No, we didn't. We're setting it up for a future conversation so that there is sort of this mutual respect for one another. So he'll want to come. And by the way, he wants to come back again. So we'll do it again. And we'll probably get into something a lot longer because we didn't have enough time. We only had like 90 minutes because he had another appointment. But you don't know about that, do you? I do. You don't. But you presume you do. <laughs> Uh, who cares about uh, a squeaky wheel, women or men? For two bucks, we're going to move on. <laughs> okay, so this is the uh, this is the interview with uh, with uh, Dr. David Buss and Rogan. Before I do that, though, we are going to actually lay this out because I want to make sure that there is no room for misconceptions here. This is. Uh, fair use is a is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing nonprofit educational or personal use tips the balance and the reason I have to do this is because this is the primary theme of today's show I'm going to riff on this and this is my own creative work based on there so and you know maybe four or five leading hypotheses about why women do it and uh, this is a one area where I've changed my mind on. Uh, pretty dramatically. So uh, early on, a former student of mine, Marty Hazelton, who's now a professor at UCLA. And okay, Marty Hazelton is probably the single most quoted resource I have ever used in the history of me being for 20 years, by the way, I have ever since back in the so suave days, I have used Marty Hazelton as a resource. And I'll explain to you. Actually, I will show Gad, Gad Saad will explain to you why. Other friends and colleagues like Steve Gangestead and Randy Thornhill put forward this idea that the reason that women do it is that they're pursuing a dual mating strategy. That is, they're trying to get investment from one guy, like the good dads, uh, but good genes from another guy. Uh, oh, wow. And, and so it's... it's uh, and but is there any research done on what type of mate a woman is likely to cheat on? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. So um, there's been some. And it's not conclusive, but basically the only way this could work, uh, and I have to back up just a second. I, I okay, let me let me uh, help him back up just a second. No, there's actually quite a bit of research on this, uh, and I I don't understand like why I don't understand why it's Roll Tomasi, this guy who with just a bachelor's in behavioral psychology, has to point this out. It should be guys like Steve Stewart Williams. It should be guys like Ro uh, Rob Henderson for sure who should be doing these shows. Not me. You guys should be doing this. You're the ones with the doc. You got the DR in front of your name, but I'm the one that asked it. Yeah, but I got to pick up the load for you here. No, there's a lot of research on this. There's a lot. What types of guys? Well, we can also look at, maybe this is not in the purview of say like Rob, a Rob Henderson or an Evo psych doctor, but it ought to be. It ought to be uh, it ought to be uh, Dr. Gad Saad doing this show, not Rolo Tomasi. It ought to be Dr. Marty Hazelton doing the show, not me. 
but I, but I'm what you got. I'm the hero you didn't ask for. <laughs> There's a lot of, of studies. There's a lot the robust studies of the kind, like of the, the dark triad guys that women want who like, I mean, literally even just the idea of the character of like a, was it a Christian gray from you know, 50 shades of gray. There's a reason why it sold 65 million copies within the first like six months of a self published book. Women want that. I think, you know, I can say, well, we need more research. No, actually, all you need is the sales stats for that book. That's all you really need because it's a, it's a sell. It was not advertised. It wasn't even published by like, you know, Random House or like a real publishing house. It was like a, a self-published book that later became a movie. Why? Because women want that. Or there, it's pretty good. I mean, correlation is not causation, but that's a pretty strong correlation, my friend. So there's a lot of uh, either research or there's a lot of data that just sort of like slips out of the, you know, it's swept under the carpet or it just slips through the cracks. And so I think it's a little bit disingenuous to say, ah, there's not much on, no, there's quite a bit if you are looking for, if you're aware of stuff like that. And maybe he's not because those studies or the, that data might not be something that is actually within his wheelhouse, like the sales stats for, for 50 shades of gray. I know that maybe, but I can't expect like, you know, guys who are, you know, eggheads in the Evo psych, you know, wheelhouse to understand. Uh, uh, we know that affairs are very costly for women. So if discovered, they result in um, infidels, result in violence. Sometimes they result in killing, you know, getting to the killing. I don't know if we want to get into that maybe later in our conversation. Um, yeah, you wrote a whole book on murder. I wrote a whole book on murder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, the murderer next door. Uh, but, um, uh, but also women suffer more than men. If an infidelity is discovered, they suffer reputational damage. Okay. This is true. And he's, the, I just think it's incomplete. He doesn't, what really where he should go with this, and he doesn't go here. You will see here in just a minute. So I'm going to go here. Yes. They suffer reputational damage. Sure. But that's, that's a social contrivance right there. Depending on the society, they might, oh, they might not. You want to know why, like, for instance, we are having this discussion right now about poly, polyamory. Go look at the work of, go look at the evangelism of Dr. Jeffrey Miller and Diana Fleischman when it comes to poly. But yet we're going to ignore the robust data and robust, I hate using that word, um, experimental stuff, robust research. On the dangers of infidelity, the day here he's just saying, you know, they might kill you, you know, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. You can go like as long as you have this mutual understanding between you and the your wife. Uh, go ahead and and you know farm her out on Tinder, or that's okay. You wouldn't want to you know crush her ex you know life experience. There's a reason why we have monogamous pair bonding as human beings because it works better than poly. It works better that way. That's you want to know what the bedrock of Western society has been for the longest time. It's because it's been like socially enforced monogamy. And by the way, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson didn't pull that out of his ass. That's a sociological term. What do you got here? Uh, according to the DSM, hybristophilia isn't just sexual attraction. It's also proper infatuation. Yes. Uh, would you say women love bad boys idealistically and beta males opportunistically? Yeah, you could you could you could put it in those terms. Uh, I might refine that a little bit, but that's, uh, you know, in a nutshell, I'd say that's true. Uh, thanks for the book. Uh, it helped a lot. Well, you are welcome, Alberto. Um, yeah, but see, there's there's so many different, like, it's, it's one thing to be stuck in one wheelhouse. And I think that this is one of the strengths of the red pill, by the way. I don't want to hear this crap about like, oh, really, it doesn't cite sources. If I was just citing sources, you could go and say, well, this source says something different. And we can get into dueling research papers and dueling PDFs about, you know, here's what, here's what they said in 1994. Here's what they said in 2004. Here's what they said in 2014. Like, we can get into that dueling shit all day long. And I could do, I'll be happy to do that with you. I, I have no problem, you know, really getting down in the mud when it comes to that. But that's really what it comes down. But there's, it's more than just experimental research it's more than just the lab it's also the field work and i think that uh the the manosphere the red pill the pickup artist community in in particular gets really short shrift when it comes to their contribution to fields of sociology 
psychology, certainly evolutionary psychology, behaviorism, they get short shrift. It was, and if you've read my books, I think it, uh, it wasn't in the first one, but I, I, de- oh, I put it in the fifth one for sure. Uh, I've quoted this twice in a couple of my books, um, but it's Nick Krauser, pickup art, well, former pick, I don't know if he's still a pickup artist. It's Nick Krauser. Anyways, former pickup artist, Nick Krauser, and I paraphrase here, says something to the effect of that the, the pickup artist community has done more for the understanding of intersexual dynamics or gender dynamics, whatever it is, social dynamics, in just the past, like, what, 10, 15 years than 60 plus years or even more than maybe 100 years of sociology and psychology because they are willing to go into the field and do the experiments out there in the wild. They are willing, for obvious reasons, <laughs> they want to get laid to do experiments. And that's essentially what those were. They didn't know they were doing that. They want to go out and get laid. Hey, guys, let's go try these techniques. If it doesn't work, we'll come back to the lab. To the, And the lab in this case was like alt fast seduction, so suave, whatever the forms were at the time in the, in the mid-2000s. And if that doesn't work, we'll compare notes and we'll try something else. We'll do, hey, the, uh, theory, practice, hypothesis, experimentation. But they were willing to do experiments that you would that would seem unethical and would not have gotten any kind of funding to do those things in the wild in, you know, the United States or a Western country when it comes to the to, the, uh, you know, dating and mating. Pickle bars were happy to go and do that, but we'd want to ignore that as being sort of unscientific. But the fact of the matter is, is the stuff that we came up with at that time, at least in those communities, I'm not saying I was PUA, but they came up with at that time were way more valid than doing it. You know, hey, let's do a self-report. How many people's dicks did you suck today? Oh, 12, okay. You know, it's, it's again, it, it comes back to the observer effect. When people are observed, they act differently. When they're out in the field and they're at a martini fest and Rolo's there taking mental notes of what's going on, I would say, I would argue that that's far more accurate than bringing people in and having them do self-reports or having them do uh, qualitative research in the lab. And in that case, it's like, okay, we're going to ask you guys these questions. And we think that the outcome of these questions will indicate whether or not X, Y, and Z is true or it is false. Okay. In the, I'm not saying that that, that research is wrong or it's wrong headed. I'm just saying it is less quality than going out there and seeing it live in real time, which we have a much greater ability to do today with a cell phone. You know, this right here is the best invention when it comes to, Figuring out what it is, what are here? Clearly, this chick is cheating on this girl. Clearly, this is what's happening here in the wild. Has it been happening all this time? Probably, but now we're more aware of it because everybody's the media. Everybody has a camera. Everybody has an opinion on Twitter or on Instagram or Facebook or nobody uses Facebook or TikTok, right? Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a take. Everybody has a video. Everybody, it's and it's all data, data, data point, data point, data point, and just by. Little by little, one video at a time, one person at a time, one, you know, hot take at a time. And do some people make money off of it? Yes, but like not everybody, I would say the vast majority don't, but still doesn't matter because they're all taking videos and they're all contributing to the knowledge base, the, 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 yeah, the knowledge base of intersexual dynamics. So when I see, you know, guys who have been doing this for like pretty much his entire career, bravo. Yes, sir. Academic, nothing but respect. But now we have more access to more information and we have to look at things in not just one research, one, one source cited. We have to look at it in multiple sources cited. And how do we interpret all of that? It's one thing to gather data. It's another thing to interpret that data. Uh, they suffer, suffer uh, sometimes social ostracism. Uh, it's uh, cataclysmic for their relationships. So, you know, it's, in fact, it's one of the leading causes of divorce worldwide across cultures uh, is if there's a female infidelity. Um, and, so it, and so the issue is what benefit could be so great to a woman that she's willing to risk all, the, all these costs if it's discovered? And so the good genes dual mating strategy argument could work in principle. Okay, why? Well, I, I, this is where it's like, I want to know more. Why would that in principle be something that could work? And why do you think something else works better? Because I know, 
I know why it works because it's yeah, it's alpha fucks beta bucks. It's it's classic hypergamy, and I mean hypergamy from the respect that it's women are looking for the best short term benefits and they're looking for the best long term benefits as far as uh, long term security is concerned. When we're talking about alpha fucks and beta bucks, alpha seed, beta need, that is the dualistic hypergamy. Everybody drink. Oh, let's all drink. Sorry, hypergamy, hypergamy, hypergamy. There, go get drunk. Take a shot after every time I say. It. Um, but that's really, excuse me, uh, I got, uh, I put MCT oil in it today. Um, so that's, that's really the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of, uh, hypergamy it comes back down to aviatory shift, right? I, I, again, like I said, when I did the first, uh, the first, uh, speech or the first talk I ever did at 21 convention was, it was like the hypergamy micro to macro i should probably maybe do it like a re revamp that at some point but the micro side of it was i was talking about ovulatory shift you have to know what the, so you have to have an, at least a working knowledge of women's like ovulatory cycles or menstrual cycles right so i've got you know the proliferative phase you've got the ovulatory ovulation point you've got the uh the luteal phase you got to, you know when is she going to get pms it's like I've, I've done those shows before but essentially that micro side of things, the, the biological realities of women's sexuality, which is psych cyclical, cyclic, just comes in a cycle. Men's is always on, women's is cyclic, okay? And when you look at the particulars of women's mating or biological evolutionary mating strategy, hypergamy, alpha fucks, beta bucks, when you look at that, it tracks perfectly with women's, uh, uh, the, the, the behaviors that are, prompted by ovulatory shift as 25 years, maybe 30 years now of uh, Marty Hazelton doing that work, Gangstad doing that work. There's others too. I just use Marty Hazelton because she's the most, you know, but I guess maybe Gadsad did too. Also student of David Buss, Gadsad, student of David Buss. I don't, I don't know if uh, Steve Stewart Williams is, he might be, but the, uh, certainly those two. So it's like, oh yeah, I was a big proponent of it until 2020 and we'll explain why he was suddenly he had a change of heart about it but uh you know just for between then and there uh just pearly things issued an apology for having fuentes on oh yeah so when rollo says something about it no nah, get this guy he doesn't know what he's talking about but when mtr says something about it oh now she has apologies for it must have seen that video that went up about what eight hours ago six hours ago don't worry. We're going to get to that too. Let's, you know what? Let's start this and come back to it. All right. Um, Rollo sounds gleeful. You're goddamn right. I sound like, wait, wait, wait. Say my name. Goddamn right. Goddamn right. All right. So what I want to know is why is it that we're, we're pre presuming that mate shifting, mate switching hypothesis in any way relates to women's innate mating strategies? And honestly, I think that Dr. David Buss has sort of a, a personal reason for this, but I'll, I'll dig into that later as we go. Um, and it would, could work if there were no cost. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why men and women um, commit infidelities in, in secret. You know, it's been driven underground. They, and people don't go on Twitter and say, hey, I just, hey, I just had an affair on my partner. You know, um, uh, it's driven underground. People try to keep it under wraps so they don't experience the cost. And of course, there are. OK, yes. But there's also another reason, and I will show you what that is right here. The one thing that it's, it's one thing to if you have a confounding theory, if you have a it's like, you know what? I think that's right, but I got a better idea. You better be able to like steel man the other person's theory before you can sort of build up your own and say, I think this is a better, better way to go. So since maybe he didn't have the time or didn't think about it, I'm going to try to steel man it for him a little bit. The reason why women keep their affairs um, under wraps or underground is because we tend to do that with sex, period. We tend to get go off and pry. I mean, unless you're like a swinger, or you're really into public, you know, like getting after it and, you know, orgies or something like that. And even orgies are done privately, right? Like, oh, hey, let's get 10 guys together and do a video and we're all going to we're all going to get after it together and bump fuzzies. Right. But you're still going to go like <laughs> if you're going to record it, like for whatever your OnlyFans is. You're still going to go on and get it and do it in a uh, 
largely you're going to do it in a, a hotel room or someplace that's probably your, your house or something like that. You're not going to just go out to, you know, Gillette stadium and go, you know, get after in an orgy on the, in the middle of the, you know, the football, the halftime show at the football game. You're not going to do that. The reason for that is because by and large human beings, when we have sex, we do it privately. And there's a reason for that. Uh, in fact, uh, let's see if I've got it. Do I have this on tap here? Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't label these before I did this. I think it's, where, oh, oh, I know what it was. It was Rob Henderson who did this. No, not that one. Where did it go? Uh, is it this Rob Henderson? Ah, here we go. This is perfect. Okay, so here's why this is. Um, actually, let me, uh, let me take this out for just a second so I can read this. Okay, there we go. Uh, selection pressures may have been stronger on women than on men to adopt clandestine, clandestine, uh, tactics to conduct their affairs. This may have, this may help explain why men indicate a greater amount of uncertainty about whether their partner is having an affair rather uh, an affair than women do. So this kind of conflicts with that whole thing. Well, not conflicts, but maybe slightly. Like it sort of sort of puts it, gives you something to think about. Okay. This may help explain why men indicate a greater amount of uncertainty about whether their partner is having an affair than women do. So when we're talking about uh, infidelity, first off, there has to be monogamy for there to be infidelity. There has to be some sort of implicit contract between men and women that says, look, I'm not going to bang other people. Okay. Me too. Okay. Got it. Forsaking all others. I mean, that's the marriage contract in a nutshell, right? The answers may lie in the use of secrecy as a defense against being killed. People only become homicidal if they are aware that they are being wronged. Their ignorance can provide those who sneak behind their backs some measure of protection from being killed. A sexual relationship behind the back of one's partner, for example, could benefit men in the form of additional offspring and benefit women in the form of access to superior or different genes. I'm emphasized, if I could bold that, I would. And to additional resources from an affair partner. Okay. By the way, quote, Greeling and Dr. David Buss 2000. Enter Dr. David Buss 2023. Selection should have favored the use of secrecy to defend against the cost of infidelity being discovered, which includes being killed by another. Okay. He's so he's pointed this out. But this is a biological reason. This is an evolutionary reason. This is not a social reason, although that he might have a point in that as well. Okay. Or the social reason or the social con uh, conventions are downstream from the evol from the evolved biological reasons for this. Okay. In case of sexuality, uh, so, excuse me, of sexual infidelity, there is a clear pattern in the risks of being killed. Men are more likely than women to kill their partner for a sexual infidelity. Uh, you can see who the, where he's quoting this. Again, 2004, 1992. That's old data. As a result, and I'm not saying that's inaccurate. I'm just saying, look at the, if I were to quote this, people would, the first thing people would say is, hey, man, that's from 1992. Okay. As a result, selection pressures may have been stronger on women than men to adopt clandestine, clandestine uh, tactics to conduct their affairs. This may help explain why uh, men indicate a greater amount of uncertainty about whether their romantic partner is having an affair, an affair than women do. Dr. David Buss, 2000. Men encounter fewer cues uh, to partners' infidelity. Clandestine uh, strategies, however, are not always successful. Some men discover their partner's infidelity, as homicide statistics demonstrate. Again, Dr. David Buss, 2005. Dr. David Buss versus Dr. David Buss. So when we're looking at these stats, I'm not saying he's, like, he's correct about this, but when he's going to offer a competing mating strategy we have to take into a, an account of what he's talking about in the first place because he said from the very get-go of this interview that he's changed his position so men as well by being discovered they're just not as uh, cataclysmic as they are as they are for women so the only way it would work though is if the getting back to your original question uh, is if there's a, a large discrepancy between the woman's regular partner uh, and her affair partner in terms of the quality of his genes or the okay so again we're looking at 
only one side of the equation here, his genes, because that's what he will characterize aviatory shift as. It's all about the genes. No, no. Aviatory shift is a lot about a lot more than just that. But it's also the provisioning side. The problem, the biggest goddamn problem I have with pop evolutionary psychology and you've heard me say this about uh, Jordan Peterson. I don't think he knows what the fuck he's talking about or he does, or he's simply ignoring the other side. He does know what he's talking about. He just simply ignores the other side is they only focus on one side of hypergamy, the beta buck side, the provisioning side, protection, provisioning, and parental investment. That's the only reason a woman would spread her legs for anybody. No, no, they don't. They will spread their legs for the hot guy in the foam cannon party. I was drunk. He was cute. And one thing led to another. You know how we know that it doesn't, we don't have to have, we don't even have to have qualitative studies for that. We can go and look at how popular 50 shades of gray is. We can look at how popular Jason Momoa was in Aquaman. And suddenly everybody's a, every woman on planet earth is a big fan of DC comics. All of a sudden, no, there's a reason for that. Why is MILF Island a popular show? <laughs> Not because those kids have protection, provisioning, and parental investment potential. No, they don't. Well, what do they have? And again, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier when I pointed out the fact that women advertise and men are the, are the, are the pitchmen. Where they're the salesmen. That's the, the, the dynamic between those two. It's also why women don't want to put their boyfriends in an Instagram shot. That's why they have the soft launch. It's like, here's your, here's, here's our soft launch. That's our soft launch right there. <laughs> soft launch. <laughs> Give me feet too, I guess on the beach somewhere with a Corona, right? There's a reason for that. <laughs> it's because there might be a better dude. They're going to lose market share if they do that. <laughs> if, if women's have the perception that they are, first of all, entitled to a better dude or a possibly better dude than it is in their best interest to behave as if there might be a better guy that comes along. So do we need a qualitative study where we're going to ask them if that's the case? Or do we simply look at their Instagram and we say, I'll see this. <laughs> this is not much. That's the, that's the data, man. That's the data set. Why am I the one that's, that's pointing this out? You know? But it's again, the, the, uh, and, and I shouldn't even point at, I, I don't want to even point a finger just at like Evo Psych. I also have to point a finger at Tradcons because it's in their best interest to point out the same thing because they think that, oh, let's, you know, we're going to save the West by just focusing on the beta buck side of hypergamy because we can't pop. Oh my God, my stars and garters, the women actually like to fuck. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Maybe not as much as guys, but certainly more than we give them credit for. Right. What have I said in the past? You know, women are not as sexual as men. That's a biological impossibility, physiological impossibility. However, women are a lot more sexual than most guys give them credit for. So there you have it. So you win a little bit, girls. <laughs> but uh, I think that it's a it's a tragedy that guys who do know better don't want to focus on the unflattering part of the alpha fuck side of hypergamy. Now, there's a counterbalance to that, too. You get the doomers. You get the look smaxers. You get the guys who are like, oh, it's never going to work for me. I'm not six feet tall. My face is not symmetrical. My jawline is not like yours. I'm not the crimson chin. <laughs> I'm not the nega chin. I'll never, I'll never amount to anything. Girls only want hot guys. That's the opposite effect only focusing on the, the, hot, the hot guy or only focusing on the physical, only focusing on the alpha fuck side, because there are variables from the beta buck side as well that sometimes can offset those things. Just depends, right? Again, it's, there's our variables on both sides. That's why hypergamy is not a straight jacket. I made that exceedingly clear on the last show, but nobody remembers. Nobody cares. <laughs> Anyway, chin cells. Yeah, chin cells. There you go. Wow, man. The crimson chin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but again, I it's um I, I think that there, especially when you have guys who have an illustrious career, such as uh, you know, Dr. David Buss, um, even Rob Henderson, 
there's a lot of guys I could put, I could throw Dr. Sean Smith into that, uh, that category too. They spent a lot of time going to school to get their degree. I don't know what, how, how long does it take to get a doctorate in psychology? Like eight, 10 years, something like that. Probably around that. Then you got to go get a practice. Then you got to go get malpractice insurance. Then you got to go and get a, you know, get the rent. You got to have insurance insurance. You got to hire the front desk chick. You got to charge X amount. Of, you got to know the business of psychology. If you're going to go into a private practice and be a quote unquote clinical psychologist and you're going to have, have people on the couch kind of thing, you better damn well have a lot. There's again, a lot of moving parts. And so, but that's not enough. Even today, that's not enough. You've got to be on YouTube. You've got to be, uh, you have to be, uh, even, <laughs> Dr. Gad Saad is, is really good at it. And he's gotten better at it recently. But Dr. Gad Saad, probably when he got his doctorate in psychology, wasn't thinking, hmm, I guess now I better start a YouTube channel. <laughs> because that wasn't a thing back then, but now it is. And so there's a certain amount of, pull this up here a little bit. There's a certain amount of, of, marketeering that goes along with that and not just psychology there's other practice or other things that like used to be old order old school 20th century careers now have to uh be online they have to be on youtube they have to have that and then so as as thus ergo you see uh dr david buss doing joe rogan you'll see jordan peterson clinical psychologist doing everything <laughs> on daily wire right and I think maybe in some ways it's kind of, it's a tough, it's a tough gig because especially for people who like, he's like pushing, I think was he 68, right? He'll be 70 this year. And you know, how do you stay relevant? How do you stay making money? How do you stay on top of your game when there's like all these, like when, when John from Modern Life Dating is doing like, you know, body language mastery and making money hand over fist, he never went, he didn't go to 10 years of psychology school. Roll to my seat. I got a freaking bachelor's man. That's, <laughs> You know, I don't have to, I don't have malpractice insurance for, for this stuff. I just, I have a keen interest in it. But, so let's keep And going. so what these, um, these good genes, dual mating strategy theorists propose is that there are certain markers of good genetic quality. They hypothesized masculine features. Um, and there's a logic behind that. Uh, mm -hmm. They hypothesize symmetrical features. So we are a bilaterally symmetrical species. So normal development, you know, you have, you know, our, hands or arms or legs grow, you know, more or less symmetrically, but there are things that cause deviations from symmetry. So uh, mutations, so genetic mutations can cause deviations. Um, diseases can cause asymmetries um, and um, environmental insults in a variety of ways. And so what they, the good genes theorists argue is that if someone is, uh, if a male is very symmetrical, then that's a marker that he's um, not experienced a history of disease or environmental insults um, or a high mutation load. Uh, or has a, a what they call a developmental system that's very kind of impervious to these insults. So even though they've suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, they still maintain that symmetry. Well, I think there are, there are, there are problem, problems with that. But anyway. Okay, that is a bonehead way of describing what he knows better. He knows it's not just about symmetry. There's also behavioral cues as well of dominance of dark triad personality traits that, that get women wet. Even just the characters imagined in Hollywood or in a book that have dark triad traits get women hot. It ignores like maybe over, a, probably more than that, maybe a century's worth of romance novels that follow a pattern that always succeeds. In fact, if it deviates from that formula, you can guarantee you won't have a good romance novel. Why is that? Why is it so? Why is that? A, why is a romance novel a predictive framework to the point where you can see that the closer it sticks to that formula of pretty much every damn romance novel, which is usually bad boy versus the prince who has lots of money, who is basically the ideal beta bucks guy versus Tarzan. Jason Momoa, <laughs> worth the is it's it's uh remember that song Two Princes by uh, uh Spin Doctors? That's pretty much the formula. You got the guy who's sort of this happy go lucky dude who's like he's good looking, he's he's fun, he's 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 in there, he's gonna he's got potential. And then there's the guy who's like well healed, has a lot of money, comes from a rich family, probably has a few degrees. He's not as exciting as the bad boy. That's the paradox, and that's what always works in a freaking romance novel. Why is that? 
Why and why is Rolo Tomasi the one bringing this shit up? <laughs> Please. And again, it's giving the dual, dualist hypergamy, the dualist mating strategy, and it is a mating strategy, not an infidelity strategy. They, we have to make a distinction here. It's one thing about mating. It's a nut, like getting together in the first place. And then it's another thing about staying together. That's the, that's the, that's the, I'm, how am I going to have sex with the hot guy who's fun and likes to skydive and is, uh, wants to like put me in, is into BDS and M right. Or is, uh, who's the guy, who's the guy on sex life like that again, why is that a, a popular show? Because it's the same formula. Where is that? I mean, it's, you, do you need studies for that? How about I just show you the sales? How about I show you the popularity? What is, or what number is it on Netflix right now? Maybe it was when it first came out. It was more popular. Why is Tinder Swindler popular? Well, it's the same guy, but he's selling the same excitement. And God forbid anybody like step in the way of these poor ladies, you know, coming up with what nine different bank loans to give to this, this Mossad agent. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> it's dualistic. Do I need to point this out? But no, maybe you know better than I with mate switching. And the reason why mate switching is such a popular thing right now, or it's even being discussed is because it's way more flattering to women. Well, the reason why they cheat is because they're trying to, it locks in with hypergamy, right? They're looking for the bigger and better deal. We want to level up. Well, the guy that I got with, he's not going to amount to much, but there's this new guy. He's a, he's a millionaire and I want to get with that dude, right? What's it at? What's the, oh, okay. Uh, hold on. Hold on. This just in. Uh, let's see. Adam Demos, is that what the dude's name is? So, uh, sorry, uh, Sam Botta is giving me some information on sex life. Star Adam Demos explains scaled back role in, in season two. Is he the bad boy or is he like the, the good guy in that? I don't know which, which dude that is. I don't, I don't care to watch. I only, I only did a, a, a breakdown of the first season. I haven't watched the second season would probably, you know, I would lose my mind if I did. Is he the good guy or the bad guy? Adam Demos is his character. The good one. Is he like the, the beta bucks guy or the alpha fucks guy? Not really sure. Anyways, it's still a popular show. Why is, why is The Bachelor a popular show? The possibility that they, they can have their cake and eat it too. The cake being, I want the alpha fucks, but I also want the beta bucks too. It's, and by the way, it still locks into everything that he's just said up to this point. Um, back to, uh, to backtrack a second, why it changed my mind. So I used to advocate this. Well, this seems, it's, it's logically plausible. Um, he advocated as we know from as far back as, well, probably the mid nineties, but certainly by 2000, because I just quoted those things to you. Uh, but I started to doubt it. And I started to doubt it for two reasons. One is um, some um, replication, some larger scale replications uh, of the work started to fail to replicate. Uh okay. Now we have to get into the, the nitty gritty here. Why did they fail to replicate? First off, I can, I'm going to, I will show you as soon as this is over, I will show you Marty Hazelton's, which it's not actually a response to this, but she explains to Dr. Godsod the, um, the analysis or the, uh, the, the reason why certain things didn't replicate. It's not because they were invalid or the previous, uh, the previous, um, uh, experiments were invalid but because it didn't re replicate. It's because of what's known as p-hacking, which is if you go start looking for stuff and you start looking for ways to disprove a particular theory, you can fudge the numbers. And she'll talk about that. I'll, she'll ex Actually, she probably explains it better than I could. But uh, it's essentially, it's uh, people have a bone to pick with you about uh, aviatory shift. And she defends it quite well. I remember when this happened because everybody came at me too. They go, oh, isn't all your theories based on this? Mm, yeah, but let's look at this. Let's, let's see if this is valid. Also, the crisis of replication started right around 2012-ish. And you'll also notice he said just recently, as recently as his most recent book, which is Men Behaving Badly. 
that's when he decided to sort of uh, downplay ovulatory shift and downplay dualistic mating strategy and started like uh, picking up on this. Um, and I'll read you the article here in a moment. Uh, started picking up on the mate switching hypothesis. Hypothesis. I think that there's a reason for that. I'll explain to you why. But you have to understand the crisis of replicability started the moment more women started getting into psychology. So all of the work that Marty Hazelton had done with her colleagues for 25 plus years at that point, suddenly everybody wants to attack. Why? Why do they want to attack that? Why do they want to find some way to either do, you know, fudge the numbers or they want to say this didn't replicate? Well, I'll tell you a few things here. Let's talk about replication. I have done the show with Brian. I'm not going to bring Ryan on because you guys either love him or you hate him. I love him. But let's look at a few things here. Um, number one is this. This is from Steve Stewart Williams. Most recently, by the way, is uh, October 14th of last year. Scary. 73 teams tested the same hypothesis with the same data. Some found negative results, some positive, some nada. No effect of expertise or confirmation bias. Idiosyncratic research variability is the, a threat to the reliability of scientific findings. This is the result of the crisis of replicability. It's been something that has been talked about in psychology. And I'm, by the way, not just evolutionary psychology, just psychology in general, the quote unquote soft sciences, right? The replicability crisis started right about the same time that women came into psychology in huge, huge numbers. How do I know that? Well, let's go with this one right here. Only 5% of American psychologists who are 30 years or younger, or 30 years of age or younger, are male. Does that look like a crisis of rep? Do you think that the women who would be in this would be either for or against the idea that they, there is such a thing as alpha fucks and beta bucks? And would it not behoove someone of the, let's see, the the legacy and the gravitas of uh, David Buss to change his mind when these are the demo, these are the demographics here. That's number one. Okay. I got something else for you here too in just a minute. Uh, which one is this? Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, that's actually part of the big, ah, here we go. Uh, I got something else here. Is this it? That's the dating thing. Sorry. I did not get these all. That's different. Uh, ah, that's it. That was the one I was looking for. Okay, this is Rolf. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, again, this is as far back as just February 24th. Approximately one in every 10 citations across leading psychology journals in uh, is completely inaccurate, misrepresenting or even contradicting the cited findings. Again, a product of... The crisis of replicability. The present study represents a massive undertaking that was analysis uh, analyzed the accuracy of 3,347 empirical citations from 89 articles across eight psychology disciplines. Perhaps the most alarming finding is that approximately one in every 10 citations is completely inaccurate. The citing claim was not even examined in the original article or directly contradicted its findings. Developmental psychology had the highest proportion of citations in the inaccurate category, 14.1%, whereas psychological sciences had the lowest finding parallels, uh, uh, parallel those in uh, disciplines found in similar. Okay, I'm not going to read the rest of that, but you get the idea. So first off, if we're going to talk about, well, these failed to replicate, when did they start failing to replicate? And why would that influence you to come up with the mate switching hypothesis as a mating strategy, as opposed to a strategy for infidelity? Those are two different things. Uh, the original finding. So what they did is how did, they, how did they test this? What they looked at is do women change their preferences when they're ovulating? So because it's only in that narrow window of ovulation that she's going to be getting the good genes. So, so what they looked at is women's normal mate preferences, and they tracked them over the ovulation cycle, and do they change to prefer more masculine, more symmetrical features when they're ovulating, and then go back to their normal preferences. And the initial studies... You'll notice that he conflates symmet symmetry with masculine features, okay? It's way, way more than that. It's also smell. It's like the, uh, the what is it, the sweaty t-shirt experiment. 
uh, which uh, Dr. Hazleton talks about quite a bit. It's also sexual ornamentation, meaning you want to know why I always joke around with about like hoop earrings, the bigger the hoop, the bigger the hoe. That, that's sexual ornamentation. Go watch any porn porn movie. I, I would challenge you to find a woman who's wearing just stud earrings and not big ass hoops when she's getting after it. That's why that's sexual ornamentation. I don't know why it's hoops. Don't ask me why it's hoops. I don't know. But apparently that's the the call sign for, you know, <laughs> wait, that's a call sign for. Well, I'm a whore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a call sign for the hoe. Right. Um, and I and we joke about that or a red dress. Right. When women wear the red cocktail dress, by the way, that's not just a trope from the Matrix. It's true. The reason why women wear those that the those particular app uh, outfits is because they are ovulating or they're getting to the point of ovulation to the point where they've done those studies as well. It's not just about symmetry. It's not just about uh, masculine features. It's also about masculine behaviors. It's also about dark triad personalities. There are so many variables and he knows this, but we're going to just throw all that shit out the window, like 25, 30 plus years of very robust research that he participated in from as far back as at least 2000. And now we're going to throw it out the window. Why? Why would that be? Suggested, yes, they do. Um, initial studies suggested that when women have affairs, it tends to coincide with when they're ovulating and some other things like that. Um, How did they get, gather this data? Uh, well, it's very difficult and time consuming data, but, um, you know, it's another point to remember. Very difficult and time consuming data. Yeah. You know why? Because they're doing it all in the lab. Because it would be unethical and they would never get funding and certainly not in a uh, in academia that is largely controlled by women in the first place. It wouldn't even occur to them to do the kinds of experiments, as Nick Krauser was saying, for the last 15 some odd years, pickup artists have been doing in the field. Like there's field observations and there's lab observations. Everything we've talked about thus far has been self-reported qualitative studies. And I would say, and even, you know, Marty Hazelton as well, it has to be because that's the only way you get funding for quote unquote ethical studies. So, you know, take that with a grain. Started of out you know, with crude methods such as estimating the woman's time of ovulation through a back, through a counting, backward counting method. Right, but I mean, how do Wrong. And he knows that that's wrong. Marty Hazelton herself talks to Gad Saad, which I'll show you the interview here in a moment, uh, about the fact that they actually take um, they take hormonal tests to see is she ovulating, is she in this time? What are her what are her what are her progesterone levels? What are her estrogen levels? What are the what are what is her like hormone cocktail look like at a particular time? It's not just is this person like a reporting, hey, I'm having a period right now. No, it's way more than that. It's far more robust than that. And again, he knows this. They get people to even become a part of a study where they admit that they have cheated on their husbands. Oh, well, so, th so that, that, that's, a, that's a different question. What they, th these studies just looked at changes in mate preferences. So um, right, but you're talking about affairs. It's not just it, changes in mate preferences. It's a decision to have intercourse right, right. with someone other than funny because here's here's joe figuring this out figuring out what everybody else is figuring out there's a difference between mating strategy and infidelity strategies why would a woman cheat on her on her regular partner that is a much different question than why does that woman get into the relationship with the partner in the first place especially in an age where women got no use for guys where women are the advertisers and men are the pitchmen Again, comes back to what I was saying earlier when we talk about guys and women coming together into a monogamous situation, women are still advertising and men don't get to sell themselves anymore. In fact, if he does, that is cause for that. Those are grounds for termination of the contract of being monogamous in the first place. Women are allowed to advertise from within the relationship because if they aren't, then the guy's insecure. But the guy is not allowed to sell himself without having some sort of impropriety or some sort of suspicion or or uh, some kind of dread, right, that he's actually out there doing that. And that's bad form. But it's not bad form for that woman to keep her Instagram or not to even like it was not even an afterthought to delete it in the first place, which is exactly why I asked that question on the Fresh and Fit slash Access Vegas show last week. Would it occur to you? Ladies, to delete your Instagram if you found the right guy. Not that he asked you to, 
Because when you say, see, that that's why you, there's that setup, right? And I said this on the show, the reason why I asked this question that needs a little bit more refinement, it's not about if you could find the right guy, would you delete your uh, Instagram if he asked you to delete it? Well, he wouldn't be the right guy if he asked me to delete it. Okay, end of conversation. Okay, wrong question. Would you take it upon yourself would it occur to you? Would it be a thought in your head? Would it be a concept that you would consider that, you know what, this guy's I'm right or die. This is the guy for me. I am a hundred percent certain of this. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. I don't want there to be any doubt in his mind that I am with him for the rest of my life. And I only want to fuck him. I am going to delete my Instagram of my own volition of my own accord. It's going to be me and that's what I'm going to do. And I don't want anyone to think anything else. So therefore I'm going to let that go. I'm going to stop my only fans. I'm going to stop my, you know, Twitter, whatever it is. I'm going to go off because, oh, and, or, and, or I'm going to take a picture of him. It's us together. I love you. You love me. Mwah, mwah. Like that's the, the, and I'm so proud of you. And I really want you to, it's no soft launch. It is a hard launch. Would that occur to you? 95% of women would, it would it's like, what? It's like, I'm speaking Swahili. Like I'm speaking a foreign language because if you, if you characterize it in those terms, rather than like, Oh, well, if he asked you to, well, then it's an obligation and he's not the right guy because he asked, he's a, he's a, he's a weak man for asking me to like go off of my, my Instagram. But if you say, well, would it naturally organically occur to you in your head? It would even be an afterthought. Most women were like, no, <laughs> it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even occur to them. That's why I'm taught. That's what I'm talking about. Now here's Joe Rogan figuring this out. That's coming together. That's like, that happens right after the, uh, the, I don't know, the implicit contract of monogamy. So if a woman is already in a relationship and she decides to cheat, well, what are the reasons for that? That might be another, maybe you got a point there, but how do they get together in the first place? See, I don't think that any of what Dr. David Buss is, first of all, I don't think he, it's very well thought out. And then second of all, even if it is thought out, it only applies within the state of an already pair bonded couple. Why would she want to cheat? It's very costly. She might get killed. Why would she cheat? Well, David Buss thinks it's, be, it's a status issue, and I have a real problem with that because a lot of well-meaning uh, evolutionary psychologists, pop evolutionary psychology is very, very, they have a new love affair with social constructionism, which they should know better. And in this sense, that social constructionism tries to explain why women would, would, uh, would cheat on their partners. Well, it's not because he looks like Jason Momoa and I really want to fuck him and I have the opportunity to do it and I simply like sex. It's because, well, he has more money and he has a higher status than the guy I'm with and I'm willing to take that chance. And by the way, as we have progressed into the 21st century, women have become more and more comfortable with cheating. Yeah. And maybe not as much as guys, but they're they're catching up. In fact, I've seen again, you want to have competing studies. I've seen the studies where it's like some in some cases, depending on the age demographic, women are cheating more than men are. And by the way, that's from 18 to 23 or, or excuse me, 18 to 20, 28, that 10 year window, the, the whole phase. They're more inclined to cheat once they get to 29 years old. They're less inclined to cheat. And guess who is more inclined to cheat after that point? Guys are. Why? Because when women are on the declination of their sexual market value and men are on their ascent, who, who do, what does, who, which party, men or women, does monogamy serve the best? The woman who's uh, the, the female who is uh, exiting the sexual marketplace, so to speak, you know, by getting into the relationship, obviously, she would be exiting because she's monogamous. She's no longer on the market, although she's still advertising, right? Or is it the man? who is now finally coming into his own and realizing his real value on the sexual marketplace. And, ho and his, you know, the girl is hoping he's not, you know, smart enough to figure that shit out. Now he's on his ascent and she's on her descent. Who does monogamy serve the best in that situation? In this case, we can look at it in, uh, let's look at it in graphic terms here. When you look at the, uh, the, the this really is dualistic meaning, but this is the, the, the sexual market value graph. 
right? If you look right there dead center at the, the, the confluence between men and women right there, right around 30 some odd years old, which by the way is 29, 30 is the average age of first marriage. Hmm. But ain't nothing like monogamy in marriage, right? And so right there is the peak sexual market span years, which is about 15 to 16 years from 23 on the female side to about 37, 38 on the, uh, on the male side. But right there is where that confluence is, right where those two, like where the pink bell curve meets the blue bell curve. That's when monogamy is expected. That's when women start talking about their, uh, their biological clock ticking. The biological clock ticks right there, right at 29. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Right as she gets into the epiphany phase and she finds Jesus once again. She gets back, or if she's already a single mother, she starts going back to church and living her life, right? Right here. Again, let's look at the timeline one more time. This applies just to women in this case. But if you look at the 30-year-old area era right there, that's when beta long-term qualities start to become something that, that is important to women. Not that a good-looking guy is not, you know, on the menu. It's just that the priorities shift at that point. But men are like, well, of course, I guess now she's finally completed her journey of self-discovery. And now she really sees me for the real. The, you've been here all along. You waited for me. I went through my whole phase. And you know what? All those other guys were wrong and were, were not the right fit for me. Now I know myself better. Now I want to marry you as you're on your way up to, to your uh, peak potential. And you better do the right thing, mister. You better wife me up and put a ring on it. That's the, there's, there's a reason for the convenience. There's a reason for those, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> there's a reason for that coincidence. How do we explain that? How do we explain that it is in women's best interests to suddenly become monogamous right around 29 years old? And for men, it's kind of at a, they're at a disadvantage because they're just coming into their own. There's a reason for that convenience. Than your husband. Like right. How do you, right. how do you run a study? Right. right. Like and, that? They, and they haven't run studies like that. So they, they haven't said, they okay, haven't? Uh, yeah, no, no. So, so how do they know? Uh, they don't. It, it's mm. just, do the mate preferences change at ovulation in the predicted, in the ways predicted by the theory? Okay. So how? Okay. But it does matter because you're discussing apples and oranges. So what he's trying to say is what, what I, oh, I think, okay, this is me interpreting this. What Buss is trying to say here is that the reason why women will cheat is because they want to have they want to have their cake and eat it too. It's what I've called retroactive or excuse me, proactive cuckoldry. There's retroactive cuckoldry and there's proactive cuckoldry. Proactive cuckoldry is uh, I am going to I've got a man. I've already married him. I'm with him. I'm a ride or die girl. But you know what? He's kind of a wimp. He's kind of his, his genes are shit. He uh, he's not as masculine as these other guys that are attracted to me at the gym or my personal trainer. I think I'm going to fuck the personal trainer. I will get pregnant by that guy. And then I will tell my husband that it's actually it's your baby. That's proactive cuckoldry. And by the way, it happens a lot more than we think. And now in the day, in the age, in the 21st century, where we have DNA, you know, testing either proactively or, re, you know, or reactively. Uh, by the way, the retroactive is the woman who has children with prior lovers and becomes a single mommy. And then the husband, then the new husband or the guy, you know, suddenly sees her at church or whatever, wipes her up and decides to be the man who stepped, not the stepdad, the dad who stepped up. That's retroactive cuckoldry, which, by the way, Joe Rogan kind of uh, falls into that category. Just saying. Um, but that's the retroactive cuckoldry side of thing. And that might be why he's kind of like having a problem with this, because essentially, if you marry a single mom, you are assuming the parental investment responsibilities of another man's DNA. You've decided to say, you know what? I love you so much. And I'm so optionless in the sexual marketplace that it seems like a good adaptive strategy for me to wipe up a single mommy. Because if it, if that's the cost of me getting, getting my DNA into you and, and into perpetuity, then that's, I guess, what I'm going to have to do. So I don't care if you've got two or three kids from two fathers. I'll still step up because it's the noble thing to do. But it's also the most practical thing to do for a single mommy is to find a guy who's ignorant enough to do that and has the resources to do that and thinks that it's his noble, you know, noblest oblige. It's his obligation, his noble obligation to wife up the single mommy because God said so or society said so or female culture said so. 
And so that's the retroactive cuckoldry side of things. But the reactive side or the proactive side is is what Dr. David Buss is talking about. Here. Would they find that out? How would they find okay. out if a woman's mate strategies changed and if her preferences okay. changed so, based so, on ovulation? So they basically get women and then they track them throughout the cycle. Uh, and so the, and they can do this now. They, they can do it through uh, hormonal assays. Uh, so there are, you know, ovulation kits that they can. Actually, they've been able to do that since the mid 2000s. But continue. Um, Assess so what do they have like a like a, like a like a survey they fill out like who are you attracted to today Harry Styles what about tomorrow it, so, something like oh, that Jason it, Momoa it, I must it, be ovulating right right or, see I'm not the only one that says Jason Momoa or basically they show f photographic images and so the women just rate oh how attractive is this guy hmm. uh, and so what they and then they independently attracted attraction again is not the word to be using here how arousing is that guy they can assessed masculinity like for instance and, and again that's this, that kind of like like sets this up for failure here we just used jason momoa hey how attractive do you think jason momoa is well, very fucking attractive how attractive do you think harry styles is well very fucking attractive because they're both celebrities now and that's not who they're using in the experiments of course but we already have this preconception of those people being sort of the images that are planted in our brains at this time like Jason, how do you pronounce his Momoa. name? Momoa. Momoa. Aquaman. Uh, yeah, he's uh, like super masculine. I, I remember him. Uh, I don't think I saw Aquaman, but I remember him from uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, when, when Conan my, the Barbarian too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he would be a perfect example. Yeah. Well, see, I don't think Jason Momoa was a Conan the Barbarian. Maybe he was. Highly masculine. Yeah. Features, you know, the um, square jaw, heavy brow ridge, ridges. You know, uh, you know, uh, a, a good. Um, shoulder to hip ratio so uh you know typically masculine features the guy who could lay down the good d uh and so they would look at do women rate the photos of these masculine and symmetrical guys more attractive when they're ovulating than when they're not ovulating. that's basically what, mm. they, what they did and um uh the, the bottom line is so there there's some conceptual problems with that of you know what well, does symmetry and masculinity why are these the sole features that mark good genes because there are also a lot of things that have moderate heritability. It's one of the things we know from the heritability studies. Um, a zillion things show moderate heritability. Um, no, a lot of heritability. In fact, so much so that uh, you don't want to talk. Well, again, you want to talk about dry material. Um, this is this is really where to go. God damn it! <laughs> Did I pull that out? I don't think I pulled that out. Where did I put that? Um, well, damn it. Oh, here it is. Yeah, this is heritability for you. The four, law, the four laws of behavioral genetics. You want to talk about heritability? All traits are partially heritable. The effect of the genes is larger than the effect of the shared environment. A lot of variance in behavioral traits isn't attributable to either genes or the shared environment. And most complex traits are shaped by many genes of small effects. So... Yeah, you might want to reconsider some things there about heritability, Doctor Buss. Uh, but here's the here's what really convinced me. So, so one is the failures to replicate those studies. So the larger scale studies failed to find those preference shifts at ovulation. No, they were there. They were just subject to the crisis of replicability. By the way, a lot of his research from as far back as 1994, also part of the crisis of replicability. But when you started to, when I started to look at the literature about women who were having affairs and the reasons that they're having affairs and the nature of the affairs, there are things that cropped up like, like this. 79%, um, one study found 79% of women fell in love with or became emotionally involved with her affair partner. And to me, this is exactly the opposite of what you'd want if you're trying to pursue that dual mating strategy idea. You want you. OK, again, apples and oranges. Right. Oh, they fell in love. OK, one would presume that they would have been fucking before they fell in love. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was the other way around. Maybe they fell in love and then they started fucking. I don't know, but you know, I do know this, and this is just from my layman's experimental, you know, experience here is that women will always say, you know, Hey, I gotta, I gotta feel something for a guy before I have sex with them. Well, that's not why women get jealous when it comes to infidelity. Women, when a man cheats, wants us to know one thing. Are you in love with her? 
because that represents a loss of of um, of resources and a loss of investment. It is a, a capital loss if you think about it. Why would I mean, we, it comes back to like when we talk about infidelity, we have to understand the difference between men's jealousy and women's jealousy and why men will make guard. Women will make guard too in different ways. They'll try to fatten you up. It's the extra, as MLD would say, it's the extra scoop of rice, you know, or it's the dad bod thing. I, I, I laugh my ass off when I listen to uh, uh, Chris Williamson talk about the dad bod and why it's so attractive, like why women are really attractive to it. No, no, they're really not. But the, the type of woman who would be attracted to that man is way different than the kind that wouldn't be. And usually it's a demographic shift. Women who are looking for a long-term partner are they're willing to accept a dad bod because that dad bod implies long-term security. It implies parental investment. It implies really just investment period in the relationship to begin with. So he's not, he's he's attractive enough for women to want to get with him. He's just good looking enough to be okay, but he's a dad or he has the potential to be a dad, and therefore he becomes he becomes attractive. Right at the same time that women need that kind of security. He'll never cheat on me. Look at him. No woman wants, no, most women don't want this guy. And then of course it comes back to like, you know, uh, was it a uh, uh, mate, uh, mate copying. So women of a certain demographic are going to find a guy with a dad bod, or they're going to say anyways, they will claim to want to get with the guy with the dad bod, which is complete horse shit because all you got to do is look at, you know, shows like Sex Life. Uh, look at what is it, 365 DNI. That was another one. I forgot about that. Uh, Twilight was the forerunner of all this. You know, it was uh, uh, what is it, Love Me Vampire, Fuck Me Werewolf? <laughs> Those are the that's that's Alpha Fucks and Beta Bucks, right? Team Edward versus whatever team, whatever what was the guy, forget the other one. Who's a werewolf? <laughs> um, or uh, or uh, 50 Shades of Grey, man. That's again, it's that template, it's that formula once more. We're going to just completely ignore that, though. Right? But again, it's why why would a woman want to cheat on a guy in the first place? Men get jealous of women who have had affairs. And the first thing they ask is, where did you fuck? Was it on the couch? Was it in the kitchen? Was it in our bed? Uh, did he does he have a longer dick? Did you get off? Blah, blah, blah. And like they want details. And usually he want to know why guys get angry and they get come to. I, he was just saying it, 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 sometimes we resort to violence. It's because it's a capital loss because for men, the number one most important thing when it comes to sex is, is this woman a good candidate for carrying my DNA into the next generation? And if she's not a good candidate, then I am at a complete loss. That's why cuckoldry is so so important. You want to know why body, by the way, I, I see uh, Brian from uh, whatever podcast watching here. Um, the reason why body count is so important to men and women know this, like on some level of consciousness is because that woman is not a good candidate to carry his DNA into the next generation. Because if she's getting, if she's the town bicycle, if she's got an only fans, if she's doing the soft launch and doesn't, you know, is not a ride or die guy and is saying you're insecure for even having a, a, a have an, a, an opinion about body count. The reason why women hate body count questions is because they can't get away from it now. In the data age, you have a digital footprint. And if you're if you were hoeing yourself out 18 to 28, well, you know, you better hope that the guy's ignorant or you better hope he believes in um, in uh, in male insecurity for you know wanting to know whether you had partners before. The reason why guys get jealous and the reason why guys have um uh, or perform mate guarding behaviors is to ensure paternity. It's not social. It's not religious. No matter what freaking Michael Knowles says or whatever the fuck else it is. It's not ethics. It's not morality. It's not God. It's none of that. You know what it is? It's basic nuts and bolts pragmatism. You're not a good candidate for the, to carry my kids off into paternity. I don't know that the kids will ever be mine. That's all you have to say. I know it kills the magic. I know it's not outrageous enough. I know it's not Maury Povich. It's not red meat enough. So we got to like throw in all this other crap on top of it. Like it's a big fucking pile of nachos here. But the chips beneath the nachos is basically one thing. I need to know the damn kid is mine. 
That's what it boils down to. That's why guys get, that's why guys, when they get jealous and when they do mate guarding, they want to know one thing. Where'd you fuck him? Did you get off? Does he have a bigger dick than me? Is he better in bed than me? Did you do it in our bed? Did you do it in the kitchen? Did you do it in the bathroom? Did you do it in the hot tub? Wherever the fuck you did. I want details. And the reason they want details is because they want to assess how likely it is. They don't care if you're in love with the guy. They don't care about the men don't give two shits about that. They want to know if you are pregnant I'm not taking care of that fucking kid because you cheated on me and you cuckolded me unless you're like Will Smith or unless you're, you're you're an evolved human being, which is, you know, dubious at best. It's nonsense. They get jealous because they want to know sexual details because they need to know if there is a child that was produced by you getting off and him having a bigger dick that he's going to have to be held responsible for your infidelity in the form of a child. It's not fucking rocket science i know it kills the conversation i know it's stupid right i get it you're not going to fucking sell tiktok you know 30 second tiktok videos on that but that's really the nuts and bolts of it why would a woman cheat now why do what do women focus on when it comes to jealousy and it comes to mate guarding it's a loss of investment how does that work out well when you look at if you, if you look here let's let me point this out to you in graphic detail here's the graph right here If a woman is between 23, let's say she gets to be about 23 years old, 22, she's at the peak of her agency. You will never hear women go, oh, yeah, I'm looking to get married then. I mean, very few, unless they come from like a religious background or unless they have a uh, um, they have a really good upbringing or they have some there's some sort of like, you know, extenuating circumstances. You most women don't even think about it because between 18 and 28 years old, that's the hoe phase. That's the party phase, right? See, look, I called it the party phase. That was it. Party years, not the hoe phase. I was nice, but you can call it whatever you want to. (laughs) But the reason for that is if you look at women's peak sexual market value at 23 and then it declines, women know on some level of consciousness that that's their only real true agency in this life is their sexuality. Well, if they make a bet on the wrong guy, that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Now, the only thing that could throw that off is not so much the guy fucking another girl. It's, is there a child being produced by it? Am I going to lose on my investment? Because if they do, then they have, let's say she does get married earlier. Let's say she gets married at 25 and then she's on that declination right there. The problem is the problem with that is if the guy cheats at thereafter in his, his ascension right there, If the guy cheats at that point, that is a capital loss of sexual agency. That's why women are more concerned about the guy's emotional investment. in another. are you in love with her? (laughs) It sounds very romantic, but it has a practical purpose to it. Did I just waste my investment of my peak sexual market value years in a guy who's not going to honor his end of the deal? Right. That's really what marriage is. It's it's a. It's a negotiation, really, between two mating strategies. Men's mating strategy is I will only get with you. I know my mating strategy is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, and it serves me better to pursue a what a R selected mating strategy, which is spread the seed, right? Nail as many bitches as possible and produce as many children as possible. That is the most pragmatic way for me to go and breed. But you know what? You're special, baby. I'm going to stick with you. And I'll tell you what. I will love you. I will uh, marry you. I till death do us part in sickness and health and in richer for poorer. Remember those are those for richer for poorer sickness and health um, uh, forsaking all others. The, the richer and poorer, the sickness and health really benefits the man in that contract. Whereas forsaking all others benefits the woman in that in that situation. Those are, that's, those are, ter- those are negotiation terms. That's a, that's a compromise. The terms, uh, a comp- um, they're, they're the terms for negotiating the cardinal rule of mating strategies, which is this for one mating strategy to succeed. The other must be compromised or abandoned entirely marriage. The way we used to do it, the good old days, was a compromise between two of those. Today, we just say, men, you can't, it's, it's closed on your end and open on her end. That's modern monogamy, by the way. I, I should have pointed that out on a, 
on uh, the show when I was at here. I'll pull this up for a second. I should have pointed that out on Access Vegas when I was talking about this. Um, when I talk about how women are the advertisers and men are the salesmen, when in the modern form, you want to know why marriage doesn't like very few marriages work today is because it is a an agreement or it is a an arrangement, a compromise where the man must abandon his sexual strategy, which is going out there, selling himself. Uh, hey, you want to go out? Hey, you want to do this? Initiating all that stuff, selling himself. He has to abandon that because if he doesn't, then he's that's infidelity. The woman, on the other hand, does not have to abandon her advertising. That's how you get like Aisha Curry and Steph Curry, like Aisha Curry on like Red Table Talk. She's like, well, I still want to keep my OnlyFans. I still or not only I still want to keep my Instagram. I still want to feel sexy. And, you know, then you've got, uh, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith going, you go, girl, you know, and encouraging that. What they're encouraging is open on Aisha's end and closed on Steph Curry's end unless they have some other arrangement. Right. But. For, the, for a modern marriage right now, a man would be insecure or considered insecure if he had a problem with his wife's Instagram. He would be insecure if he had the soft launch thing. He would be an insecure guy if he had a problem with other men finding his wife attractive. That would make him insecure. What that means is open on her end, at least in the form of advertising, and closed on his end. Where have we heard that before? Andrew Tate. Myron. Kevin Samuels open. You know, you want to know why women lose their shit when guys say open on my end and close on her end, because it's a complete 180 from the way we do it right now. Only we don't, we kind of do it soft, right? We don't do it. Like um, we don't build it up to the, to the point where it's like, she's like overtly doing that. Cause then it sounds like she's on Tinder and she, you're hoeing around. I guess some people do destiny does Jack Murphy did, I guess, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, I'm okay with cuck being cuckled did essentially is what it is. What is that? Well, in this case, it's, a, you know, ostensibly it's open on both ends, but women are the ones who can facilitate that way better than men can today. So, but you're insecure. If you, if you insist on it being closed on her end and open on your end, in fact, you're insecure for wanting it to be closed on your end and closed on her end, which is the good old fashioned way we used to do marriage, which is that's how I work my marriage closed on Mrs. T's end and closed on my end. I think it's going to make a comeback heterosexuality. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> yeah. Closed, closed on my end, closed on her end. That's the way we use that. <laughs> Traditionally, that's a marriage, right? But now I'm insecure if I say, oh, no, my wife doesn't get to have an Instagram. No, I'm, of course, she doesn't want one. She, my wife, you will not find my wife on Instagram. You will not find her on OnlyFans. You will not find her anywhere on social media. One second, my fucking monitor's acting up. Um, you, because she doesn't want, that's because it wouldn't even occur to her to have those things. First of all, she, doesn't, she's, she hates freaking social media. But second of all, it's, that's just the way our marriage is, right? Closed on my end, closed on her end. Oh, you're a beta male. Well, okay, I guess I'm a beta male, but I'm a beta male telling you about closed on closed on her end and or open on her end and closed on your end. I figured that shit out. That's you again. That's why when you hear Myron say closed on your end, open on my end, it's because it's a it's a switch, it's a shift, it's a complete like mirror of the way that women expect a relationship to be now. Because they won't stop advertising. They, in fact, it's offensive to even ask them if it would even occur to them to stop advertising. It takes a very special woman to, though, you know what? Hmm. I don't want there to be any confusion. I'm going to take down my Instagram, even though I've pretty much made a living off of it. It's next to impossible, especially if that's where you're, you know, if you're a very hot girl and you're in bikinis and lingerie pics and you're selling your ass, even if you're not on OnlyFans and you're doing it on Instagram. That's a tough decision. You have to really be in love with that guy. Most women will not do that, even though they'll say that they will they, in, in behavior in action. They will not do that. That's the difference closed on your end, open on her end. As far as in, as far as advertising goes, because women are deathly afraid that if they are, they're deathly afraid, the existential fear, by the way, I've, I've mentioned this before is not it i've in the past i've said the existential fear of women is having to um be ha having to uh, having hy the hypergamous choice made for them essentially 
having to bear other men's children. It's the, uh, what is it? The handmaiden's tale. That's the existential fear of women being forced to have babies that they don't want to have by that's not their choice. Right. Essentially that's the ultimate, like there's the proximate goal and the ultimate goal. Ultimate is they don't want to be, you know, bearing children that they didn't, they had no say in the, in the actual, like, you know, prearranged marriages and shit like that. That's, that's an existential fear. The other existential or the other, an, an addendum to that or an extension of that is not being able or, or losing the fear of losing uh, sunk cost, right. Of, of opportunity cost. That's why open on her end for advertising and closed on his end. He has to do what he's supposed to do. He has to do these things, do the right thing. You do what's right for you, girl. Men must do the right thing. Women do what's right for them. What's right for them is keeping that Instagram open, keeping that advertising going. Don't let, because you never know if this guy, because you're going to lose, because women understand your sexual market value is perishable. You're going to lose on that equation over time. He's going to increase in value. So as you're on your declination and he's on his ascension right there, that is a very precarious position for women. And he better be in love and he better you know, do the right thing. And the right thing is fulfilling women's mating strategy. Again, cardinal rule of mating strategies. For one to succeed, the other has to either be compromised or abandoned. In this case, in modern marriage, why does Rolo have a problem with marriage? This is why. Because it's not about a compromise anymore. It's not about closed on your end and closed on her end. It's about you abandon your mating strategy. Imagine. What would happen if you said, okay, look, uh, I know that um, we're going to get together and we're going to have form a marriage and we're going to form a monogamy and I'm going to be exclusive to you and you're going to be exclusive to me. But I'll tell you what, uh, I'm going to write into the marriage vows here, honey, that I get to go um, occasionally go out to the clubs and pitch myself as if I'm, I'm still available. I'm going to take off my wedding ring and I'm just going to pretend like I'm available at the clubs. I don't know what, four or five times a, a year. Would you be okay with that? Can I write that into the vows? Because essentially that's what women are doing without, without saying it. I'm going to keep my Instagram open. I'm going to keep advertising myself. But if it was open on his end and open on her end, women would never come to the table because it, it well, first of all, it's not a compromise and nobody's abandoning anything, but you might as well be single at that point. She's advertising, you're pitching still. That's not a monogamy because there's no contract of exclusivity right there. Nothing that's even really implied. That's why when we talk about jealousy and we talk about polyamory, that's why po the, the main reason poly will always fail is because the human machine was never built for that. That's why we want to talk you go with Dr. Jeff Miller, Dr. David Buss. Uh, I wouldn't say Robert Henderson, but there's, there's several people of uh, Dr. Diana Fleischman. Anybody who's promoting or uh, evangelizing for poly right now, the reason, well, for the trying to force fit what they know about Evo Psych, but the uh, the reason why it will the reason why I am like adamantly against poly is not because of morality, not because it's impractical. We're not built for that. We're built not necessarily for monogamy. We're built for both promiscuity and monogamy. But we will we will perish as a race unless we can actually come together and pair bond and be parentally invested in children so that they can go on and have babies themselves. And the reason we get jealous, the reason we make guard is because we're, we're protecting, we're trying to ensure our investment in the other person. That's why women get upset and jealous about a guy falling in love and men get jealous about the woman fucking in the bathroom. That's why. Let's continue. I get the good genes and then forget about the guy. And so it's not to jeopardize your investment from the regular partner. Um, and so, and so, it's really it's a design feature that's counter to that notion. It can I stop you here? Doesn't it? But it seems to me that you're pursuing this like as if it's a logical endeavor that's based uh -huh. on trying to achieve an outcome. And I think it's far more likely you're dealing with mental illness, alcohol, no, no. you know, uh, um, emotional imbalance. Uh See, I, okay. And now this is another way that uh, this is cope. Sorry, Joe. This is cope. They must be damaged. There must be something wrong with them. Hybristophilia, by the way, this, this, this is the classic cope for hybristophilia. There must be something wrong with them. They must be da only damaged women would do those things. Only damaged women would want to bang convicted criminals. 
And I will just simply point to the most recent case of this, which is the, the chicks who worked at the prison system who like set up this entire system so they could fuck the inmates. They got let go because uh, because they discovered that the, the prison guards, the female prison guards were nailing the prisoners. Hybristophilia. OK, not all women are hybristophiles, but only women are hybristophiles. It's a female thing. There are very, I, if somebody can show me a, if somebody can show me a, a qualitative study or even a qualitative, a quantitative study of men seeking out convicted criminals, like women in the prison system to like marry and have conjugal visits, like, like say Richard Ramirez or the Boston Marathon bomber or Nick Cruz or Anders Brevik, all these, you know, in these horrible inmates who have committed heinous atrocities have fan clubs of women show me the fan clubs of guys and then maybe we can talk but until then hybristophilia is a female thing and not all of those women are damaged goods they just see this and they go you know what this might be a good idea this i'm, I'm really hot for that guy the girl who was uh the, the police officer who was basically doing a blacked videos with the other black police officers recently who now is claiming to have been groomed right and her by the way her her cuckled white husband is sticking by her again too right that was just in the news not too long ago was she damaged she would probably say she wasn't or did she do it because you know she wanted to if she wanted to experience, I don't know, getting a train ran on her in a black video. Who knows? A extreme desire for attention, narcissism, which leads people to seek out exorbitant amounts of attention from other people. Like you have to take that into account, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So uh, that's a fair point. And those things um, aren't necessarily inconsistent. If you ask, like, wh who has affairs and what are their personality characteristics? OK, but affairs happen in all cultures or virtually all cultures, unless the women are extremely cloistered as they are in some cultures where they're like they cannot leave the home without a male bodyguard right um but affairs happen in all cultures and Would so you like some coffee uh sure i'd love some <laughs> devil mountain coffee so affairs happen in all cultures yeah affairs happen in all cultures and so uh, a competing hypothesis about why and this is the one i'm currently <laughs> um putting my money on if there's a, like a horse race is what I call the mate switching hypothesis. Here we go. Uh, and, and this is the notion that women who are in relationships, who are uh, where the relationship is going south, perhaps the partner starts out looking promising, but has failed to live up to his promise. Perhaps he becomes an alcoholic or a drug addict or loses his job uh, or, um, or starts um, abusing her, starts beating her up. That, that women use affairs as a mate-switching device either to divest herself of her regular partner um, uh, or and or to trade up in the mating market to someone who's more desirable or to make it easier to transition back into the mating market uh, on the notion, on the assumption that she'll be able to find someone more desirable out there. I think we should call this not the mate-switching hypothesis, but like the mate fail safe hypothesis because really in some i understand how he comes to this to this conclusion because if you go and you look at like the number one reason why women divorce men it's because of a loss of status it's because women get a promotion at work they get a uh, you know they the guy stops it's because like women like even women who are like at parity like with, with in income she makes more she, she gets higher status. She starts work. She starts making more money. Now, suddenly he's a burden. He's a child. He basically takes the position of a child, right? She's the breadwinner. And as many women will tell you, if he's not making that kind of money, he doesn't get to make the rules. Wealth enforces will. That's essentially what it boils down to, especially in a, in a mating market, in a situation where it's closed on his end and open on her end, at least as far as advertising is concerned. And no one would blame her for having an affair or or divorcing him so that she could go and get with somebody of a higher status because now she married him on the prospect that he was going to make more money or he's going to have higher status now suddenly she discovers that she's got a promotion at work and now she's making more money that is the number one precipitator of divorce by the way women of course initiate divorce more than men not 
forthcoming from anything Mr. Buss is saying at this point. I'm not, I'm not saying he doesn't know that. He probably does, but it's conveniently sort of swept under the rug right there. And maybe that's part of it, right? Maybe that's maybe that's the reason. Maybe he's right when it comes to that. But I don't think it disqualifies or invalidates the dualistic theory. It's just focusing on one side of hypergamy, the beta bucks, provisioning protection and and uh, a parental investment. It doesn't matter that he's a great dad and reads to the kids and takes them to soccer practice and goes to every piano recital. He's not making as much money. Wealth enforces will. He's not as valuable as the guys that I see for 40 hours a week at the, the, the company at the workplace. So therefore, I'm going to decide that I'm going to just trade up, right? And essentially, that's what hypergamy from the beta bucks side of the dualistic mating strategy is really about. So yes, women women initiate 80, about 80%, so 75 to 80%, depending on who number you, you use, they initiate the most, the most divorces. What precipitates those things? Primarily for women, it's money. I mean, so like men, you know, it could be sex too, but like primarily for men, when men have a problem with women, it's about sex. For women, for women and it's usually about status of the guy that they thought was going to be the winning horse. And he's not wrong about that. But that doesn't invalidate the other hypothesis of ovulatory shift. Why do people get together in the first place? It's not so that they can like, you know, cheat on each other. They're not thinking of that in the first place. They just want to get with each other. Well, what is it that happens prior to a couple actually becoming a fucking couple? Well, in that case, maybe we should be focusing on the alpha fuck side of hypergamy rather than just the beta buck side. And the reason we do, David Buss, Jordan Peterson, God knows whoever, you know, Hafiz, everybody. The reason why we only focus on that side is because it's flattering to the female ego. We want to say the right fucking thing rather than have Rolo Tomasi show up and go, you know what? It's actually about alpha fucks, too. It's actually about Jason Momoa. It's actually about Justin Waller. It's actually about Mike Sartain. Right? It's actually about the hot guy in the fucking foam cannon party. We don't want to have that conversation because that's unflattering. Because that is being judgmental. And God forbid, that's the cardinal sin of the gynocentric social order is to ever like call women out on the fact that you want to know why what, this, is, this is me spitballing. You want to know why my, what my opinion is about the crisis of replicability is because so many women are now involved in psychology and they don't like the unflattering truths that Marty Hazelton and other gangstad and the rest of them came to as far back as like the what the mid 2000s all the way up to the mid the. 20 teens and then suddenly out of the blue that doesn't replicate anymore well actually it does replicate and i will show you why uh because i also happen to have where did it go uh, i've got this data set right ah here it is okay here we go uh th oh, okay so this is a sorry that's the main copying one this is the one i'm looking for okay jonathan palson okay uh this paper mentions several studies that show h and then by the way this is as this is as far back as january 8th 2021 right around the time dr david buss decided to have a change of heart okay this paper mentions several studies that show a change in female mating desire depending on hormone levels and fertility seems to me that there are some studies showing this is the case and some possibly lower powered studies that show no results. Okay. Ovulation, sex, and hormones. I've happened to, I, you got, you would have to pay for this is a, behind a paywall, but I can at least read you the abstract here. The dual mating strategy hypothesis provos, proposes, I'm reading to you from the, the Cynet uh, site here. Uh, the dual mating strategy proposes uh, that uh, women's preferences for uncommitted sexual relationships, uncommitted, 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 uncommitted sexual relationships with men displaying putative fitness cues increases during the high fertility phase of the menstrual cycle, that being the proliferative phase. Results consistent with this hypothesis are widely cited as evidence that sexual selection has shaped human mating psychology. 
However, the methods used in most of these studies have recently been extensively criticized. Here we discuss new empirical studies that address these methodological problems and largely report null results. And in alternative models of hormonal regulation of women's mating psychology, that can be better accommodate uh, these with this new data, can be accommodated with this new data. Essentially what there's, and I could read you the conclusions here too. Essentially what they're saying in this study is that the jury's not out on this, okay? There's still very robust findings in spite of the, uh, the, uh, the crisis of replication. So why does David Buss think that this is a better idea? Why, do, why are we trying to apply infidelity to the overall mating strategy? That's where I have a problem with this. I see all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm a layman here. I don't have a doctorate in any of this shit, but I can see this. Why is, why is Rolo Tomasi the one banging the gong here? That's what I want to know. Uh, and so, uh, and so there's um, um, at least a, a fair amount of circumstantial evidence that supports the mate switching hypothesis, like the one I just mentioned. Um, women uh, with 79% of women becoming emotionally involved or falling in love with their partner. This suggests, you know, it's not just, oh, I'm seeking transient attention, uh, as you mentioned. Now, that some women might do it for that, of course. Um, but it suggests that they're um, uh, forming a long-term attachment to this other guy rather than the regular partner. So here's, here's another one. And this may seem like super, super obvious, um, is that women who are unhappy with their regular relationship, either sexually unhappy or generally unhappy with their overall relationship, they're more likely to have affairs. Now, this seems like the most obvious thing in the world, right? Yeah, sure. Tell me something I don't, your grandmother couldn't tell you. You're unhappy in the relationship. You're more likely to have an affair. Uh, but it turns out the same is not true for men. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let's back the truck up here a little bit. Dr. Marty Hazleton already covered this in ovulatory shift. Why is that? Well, let's go back to what I said last week about hypergamy not being a straitjacket. Okay. So what do guys say? You want to know here? I, I think one of the reasons why a lot of guys are like trying to lean towards the mate shifting, switching, whatever the hell we're fucking calling it. The reason we're leaning towards this is because there's too many incels and too many black pill doomers and Spurg Tau or whatever the hell we're calling them right now who think that hypergamy means that she will always cheat. She will always want to get with the bigger and the better deal. I'll never compete. I'll never be a, a contender. I'm uncompetitive. I can't do that. And even anyways, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. You want to know why these guys are trying to come up with big, with, with different ideas? It's because of you doom tau guys talking about, oh, well, hypergamy is a straitjacket. No, no, it's not. And the reason why I say that is because Dr. Marty Hazelton herself has said, that when women are in that ovulatory phase, in that proliferative phase, that if that woman is either single, and this is her, okay, again, I'm paraphrasing, but is either single or she is dissatisfied in that relationship she happens to be in, then she is more predisposed, more sexually proceptive to go out and seek extramarital, extracurricular, extra relationship uh, sex with guys who look like Jason Momoa. And they use Jason. I'm going to use him. <laughs> but, but, let's put the, insert the but here. Okay. But if that woman is in a satisfactory or a relationship where she is comfortable and enjoys being in that relationship, she is still more sexually proceptive. With the dude she's with, that's her, not David Buss, but she's a student, I guess, but is more sexually perceptive with the guy she is in a committed relationship with if she's in a satisfying relationship. Her words, not mine, not Dr. David Buss's, completely out the window, completely ignoring that side. It's alpha fuck side from within a relationship. That's why it's not a straight jacket. But if all we ever hear about is guys are fixating on this beta buck side and women are always going to cheat because I'm never going to make enough money and I don't look good enough. Yeah, I can completely understand why people are like, well, I better think of something else. Right. No, it's because when women are in a satisfactory relationship, they want to fuck their boyfriends that much more. Surprise. Wow. What a what a shock that must be. That's her. That's from the ovulatory shift dualistic mating strategy side of this argument. Can we please progress? There are at least some studies 
that show that if you compare men who have affairs with men who don't, there's no difference in how happy they are with the relationship. Yeah. Um, and exactly. that's why you can have men, and just to bring up, I don't know, movie star examples, um, uh, like uh, this is an older one, but Hugh Grant was um, involved with uh, Elizabeth Hurley. I don't know if you remember yeah. uh, that, that one. And he's like having sex with a prostitute in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why is he uh, uh, cheating with Elizabeth Hurley? Um, because he wants the strange. And, and then the other thing is we presume Elizabeth Hurley isn't like frigid. We're presuming that she's just, she looks, hey, she looks great. Yeah, well, sometimes a Lamborghini has a VW engine in it. So the looks might not necessarily match the the intent or the drive on top of it. People always wonder like why, uh, like why would a guy cheat on a hot piece of ass? Well, it's not, it's not because it's not as, um, people will say, well, it's because guys want variety. Well, we can get variety off of porn. You want to know why guys like get addicted to point ways because it satisfies unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. I got, I'll say it again. You know what? I do not care. I will say this one more time. Pornography has prolonged more marriages, prolonged and say saved prolonged more marriages than it has ever destroyed because that guy stays in the relationship, stays in the, in the sexless, you know, marriage for the kids, right? Well, how's he going to stay? He would not stay in that marriage as long as if he didn't, if he didn't have pornography to stroke one out every now and then. It's not about variety so much as it is just like trying to figure out like how to adapt to a to an environment where he's not getting sex. So just because we see Elizabeth Hurley as a hot piece of ass, that doesn't mean she was all that into Hugh Grant. Kind of crazy. Now, in his case, in that case, uh, the male motivation for affairs differs on average substantially from the female motivation. Uh, and that is that men are. Uh, right. have this tremendous desire for sexual variety, maybe the variety, variety of word. sex partners. Uh, okay, that is true. Unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. The one thing I think that gets swept under the carpet here is we always say variety. Stop it. Stop it with the fucking variety thing, okay? They, especially if you're a, a, a significant, you know, evolutionary psychologist, Cut that shit out. It's not just variety. Or if you're going to say variety, at least qualify that by saying men's innate mating strategy is our selection. It's spreading the seed. It's like having sex with as many women as possible. It's not just about variety, which it is, but it's also about other things too. Perhaps Hugh Grant was not getting his dick sucked the right way. And I'm sorry to be vulgar, but maybe that's just the, maybe the, that's the case. We don't know. Is it just, well, he just wants to have variety. He's Hugh Grant. What well, was it? Uh, Tiger Woods. He just wanted to go and bang random hoes. You know? By the way, the best song written about Tiger Woods is Just Like Tiger Woods by Steel Panther. You want to know the story of Tiger Woods? Listen to one of the best songs they ever did. <laughs> but yeah, he figured out he's Tiger Woods. I can have more bitches. Fuck yeah, I'm in. Maybe he was, he made, a, maybe it was Hugh Grant finally figured out he's Hugh Grant. Maybe. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio isn't such a bad guy. Maybe he's just prioritizing his mating strategy above the women that he gets with. Oh, that's terrible. He should get with an age appropriate woman. Now, age appropriate for most guys is going to be 23 guys who are 50 years old, 23 guys who are 18 years old, 23 guys who are 93 years old, 23. That's age appropriate from a male mating strategy, younger, hotter, tighter, fertility, youth, beauty. That is appropriate for guys who want to have children, who want to have babies, who don't want to get with women who have baggage who don't want to get with women who are not a good bet for their paternity. That's why. It is absolutely appropriate when you look at it from a male primary way of looking at the sexual marketplace, if that was the case, right? If, it was, oh, we live in a patriarchy. Father Abraham is going to have sex with girls who are like half his age, right? Yeah, because it makes practical, pragmatic sense. Especially you know, if you're 60, he's almost 70 years old. It's in his best interest to get with women who are half his age. 35, <laughs> at least, maybe younger than that, right? Probably younger than that. There's a reason why most men at every age find women about 22, 23 years old to be the most attractive at every single age. Oh, that's sick and disgusting. Only 
if the predominant social narrative is that we need to fulfill women's sexual strategies. That's the only reason it's disgusting. That's the only reason. Oh my gosh, I can't believe Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> yeah, you know why? Because you think the world revolves around women. You think the world is run by women. You think gynocentric social order. You don't know anything outside of that. So yeah, I'm sure it does seem disgusting. But when we look at it from a male perspective, if it were a, uh, not a gynocentric, if it was androcentric, that would be perfectly logical. That's, that's wonderful. In fact, the opposite would like, if it was a guy who's getting with an older woman, that would be like, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. And women, even women in an andro, if the, if the society was an androcentric social order, women would find the opposite disgusting. That's why it's just whatever the narrative is, what you, what you think is correct right now. We think whatever fulfills a female mating strategy is the correct way. Whatever benefits women is the correct way of thinking. That's why. And that, by the way, just that simple fact is enough to, to, to explain why he has, why he has decided that, uh, why Dr. David Buss has decided that it's not about like dualistic mating strategy and it's all about mate shifting. That's why, because that's the, that's the, uh, the predominant social narrative. Men tend to have a higher sex drive uh, in general on average. Uh, and so they try to satisfy. So even, even men who are involved with their married to classically beautiful, beautiful women sometimes have a period where people are very puzzled by this, but that desire for sexual variety is what drives most men in, into affairs. And so- the Okay, why do they have a desire for, for variety? Clarify that, for fuck's sake, clarify There's that. There's a dramatic sex difference in why men have affairs with um, desire for sexual variety pushing most men into it. You know, it's like- Okay. The other thing that he's not explaining here is like, especially because this, by the way, this is straight out of men behaving badly. This, these, you know, they look for variety. Yeah. What he doesn't describe is this is like guys, like, like who are the girls that he used? What Hugh Grant is a, as a, an example, you go, Oh my gosh, why would Hugh Grant want to get with those dogs? You know, he had Elizabeth Hurley. Why would he be, want to fuck these girls who are in no way the same caliber as Elizabeth Hurley? performance first and foremost <laughs> maybe they're just like all over him why would tiger woods want to get with escort after escort in blue martini in orlando um why would he want to well he's hey, oh my gosh he's got a swedish bikini model he, with he's got two kids with her <gasps> my stars and garters why would he want to do something like that because if you look some of the girls i mean some of the girls were all right but like like why would you want to get with those skanks Tiger, um, big performance, and he's talking. He figured out he's Tiger Woods because a lot of those girls weren't as hot as his Swedish bikini model. But that doesn't mean just because she looks like a ten doesn't mean she has the performance of a ten. Like I said, a Lamborghini with a Volkswagen engine. I always say that you, know, you guys, you thought that you guys thought this was a joke. Like when people ask me about like the Tomasi one to ten scale, right? I try to I try to be as scientific about that as possible, right? But like, if you have a girl who is like, there's no such thing as a perfect 10 ever. Um, only because like perfection doesn't exist. But uh, that being what it is, even if that were the case, I wouldn't say I wouldn't, I would never place a woman above a nine unless you sleep with her. Because that last point to half point is earned on performance or it should be earned on performance because it's not, it's not enough to have a really nice looking exterior. It's you have, there has to be a performance that's attached to that. So if you got a woman who's like a dead lay, if you got like a starfish sex and she looks like, you know, a Swedish bikini model, like that's probably in, probably more frustrating than getting with a chick who's a seven who really just blows your doors off, you know, when, when it comes to sex, right? There's a performance side of it too. But we're not going to look at that because to do so would be unflattering to women, which of course is not where any of these new pop psychology, pop evolutionary psychologists want to go. They simply don't want to address, even when they're addressing male sexual expression, they still don't, they have to do it within the context of, is it correct with the beta buck side of hypergamy? They don't, certainly don't want to talk about men's sexual natures as being correct or incorrect. They just want to say, oh, they just want variety. No, there's a lot, it's a lot more to it than just variety. Well, I think it was Chris Rock said, you know, men are only as faithful as their opportunity. You got a low cost opportunity, a lot of men act on it. You know, if you're uh, like an academic, 
you're away at a conference, you're in a different town, you know, uh, some fall into bed with someone else, one night stand, a brief affair, and and that's that. Um, yeah, hit it and quit it. But I also, you guys still got to point out that that whole thing about, you know, men are only as faithful as their options, right? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, but when it comes to that point, most men don't have options. That's why they opt for porn. That's why they'd rather stroke one out than cheat on their wives. Again, <laughs> pornography has prolonged more marriages than it has destroyed. Why? Because it prevents guys from actually having to make, take the effort to go out and seek out an affair because most guys don't have opportunity. I love how it's like, oh yeah, you know, these guys are out there away on business and they're out somewhere else and they're at a convention or something, you know, some chicks have, you know, liquored up and they go back to the hotel room and it's a one-off and they say, you know, shake hands and they're goodbye. In what fucking world, man? Nine times out of 10, when guys are cheating on their wives, it's because they are creating those opportunities. They'll go see a hooker. They'll be a sugar daddy without the girl knowing. They'll be a, they'll be a simp or, a, or a, a pay pig for someone on OnlyFans because it's much safer, much, uh, le much less investment cost and much less uh, risk of, of loss on the guy if, that's, if it's easier to do it that way. Why would you have an affair unless someone's really, really wrong? Like I've, you've heard me say this before. When men cheat, there's half there. Well, when people cheat in general, but when men cheat, there has to be two things. There has to be an opportunity and there has to be a reason. Okay. The number one, the reason why most guys don't have, don't have affairs or don't cheat is because they have no opportunity. <laughs> Nobody wants to fuck them. Sorry. You know, they, they're just not fuckable. In fact, so much so that their wives probably don't fuck them, right? But they don't have the opportunity to actually go out there and put themselves in a position where they might meet someone attractive who might actually be into them, who they might be able to say the right things, who they might be able to, you know, suddenly have one too many and end up in the hotel room. Like that, I would say, is a far more rare case than women like manufacturing or, or uh, uh, let's see, scheduling an affair. If men cheat... It's usually because, oh, do I have Echo? I don't have Echo. Uh, if, oh, or is that, or is Echo in the chat right now? Everybody's saying Echo. Do I have an Echo? I don't think I have an Echo. Stop fucking with me. Um, but as far as like opportunity is concerned, most guys don't have opportunity. They have lots of reason. They're in a sexless marriage. They're, you know, there's no performance, whatever. They, whatever, they're, they have lots of reason, which is why guys like opt for pornography to satisfy that, that need. Right? They'll stay in the marriage for the kids, but as long as they can stroke off now and then, but they don't have the opportunity. If they do, it's usually because they create the opportunity with like Ashley Madison or an escort or something like they'll go to Vegas for the convention. And then it's not because they ran into some chick. It's because they go, okay, I'll meet you at the hotel at this time. It's going to cost me $400. Here you go. That's manufacturing opportunity, although it's not really opportunity, um, but they have a reason. Most guys don't have they have a reason. They just simply don't have the, they don't have the options. They don't have the opportunity. Then there's the guys who have lots of opportunity and no reason because they're taken care of by their wonderful, beautiful wife who is, uh, who understands what her husband does and is uh, more or less, um, you know, accommodating. And there's no reason they have a very sexual relationship and are, you know, there's no reason to do it. So you don't go seeking out opportunities if you're already, if you're getting home, good home cooking, you know, like, yeah, I'm a good dog, but you got to pet me to keep me on the porch. <laughs> That's Ron White, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, let's finish this out. Uh, but women, it, it's really different. Of course, some women do it just for sexual variety too. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, most do. That's why they have a plan B. That's a minority. If you ask, if you ask the question, why do most women have, a, have an affair? I think that's the mate switching notion. All right. So that's it. Okay, now we can come back. Now I can kick this out of here. So that is the the, the part that I wanted to get to. Now, uh, to, to put a period at the end of this before we move on to another topic here, um, I also wanted to point out, first of all, I have a problem with this because there's a lot of inaccuracies in here. There's a lot of presumptions in this. The other part of it is, is biologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, it's inaccurate. Um, simply because men and women get jealous and they are mate guard for different reasons when it comes to, to, to prevent infidelity. Okay. Why am I the one bringing this up? 
why am I like, I, I can go and read, you know, Rob, soon to be Dr. Rob Henderson, when he talks about envy and he talks about uh, jealousy, uh, Dr. Uh, St- uh, Steve Stewart Williams, same thing, ape that understood the universe, talks about mate guarding. Why is that not even part of the fucking conversation? Right. I mean, I, I was reading, there's actually a full on, uh, uh, when was this? I, this is as far back as 2017, 2018. When is this? This is a, an article in Eon, which is a, our it's a evolutionary the theory says men and women increase offspring, but what motivates women when women stray, uh, enter the mate switching hypothesis. Now, oh, there's a lot of holes in this. It's on Eon. I'll, I'll put the, uh, I'll put the, uh, Maybe I'll put that in there. More, more or less, it's he he explains a lot of this stuff in uh in what in his Joe Rogan interview here. I want that. I can put this up. I'm trying to look for the salient parts in this. I've got this article that he actually wrote himself in Eon, A E O N. Um, actually, let me go grab the. Hold on a second. I'll put the. Uh, we'll put this in the chat. There you go. So you guys can see which one I'm talking about. This is a. This is the Eon article here. No. Chat. Okay, so uh, essays and stuff. This is the the mate switching hypothesis. Now, I want to also point out. Um, I won't get into too much detail into that one. Um, I'm, I also kind of want to point out a few things here. Um, when we're looking at Doctor, because the reason why I got into is again, as I said, this is not to shit on Doctor David Buss. I'm just saying, have we? Can we consider these these if ands or buts about mate switching hypothesis? Because I've heard people like Hafiz or even, you know, Mike Sartain talk about, you know, Dr. David Buss says this, this and this. Oh, OK. But can we have a discussion? Can we have a dialogue here where I'm like, well, how do you explain mate guarding? How do you ex- especially in poly? Right. How do you explain jealousy and the differences in jealousy? What makes women jealous? How do you explain um, the rise in or how do you explain the the uh, infidelity for women between 18 to 28 is, is at its highest point. But after 29, the demographic shifts. So at 29, which happens to be the average age of first marriage in the United States, and it's actually even older than that for people in the UK and, and uh, Western Europe. How do you explain the fact that, well, first of all, more people aren't, aren't getting married to begin with, but right at that 29 year old you know, point on the, on the timeline there, it shifts. Men become more likely to cheat after 29. Women are more likely to cheat before 29. Why? If the mate switching hypothesis is accurate, then what would explain that in the mate shifting hypothesis? And why do we, why do we take that as something that's even like a, a challenge to a well-established theory again of the, of ovulatory shift? And does it not only apply to couples that are already in a monogamous relationship to begin with? What made, what made the girl, what made the girl want to fuck the guy in the first place before they even had a relationship? What got, what got her hot? If it's, if it's about, if, if mate switching hypothesis explains women's mating strategy, how does it account for the relationship that happens prior to the relationship? No, she's just looking for a guy who's the bigger, better deal. And he better have a good job, mister. And he better take responsibility. And he better, you know, want to marry my, you know, better want to adopt my kids. Right. So. What is this? How did this come back? Did it come back just right now? When did this happen? Did I get that? When did this happen? Did this just happen? I'm sorry. Where's Sammy? Sammy, did you say something to me? Oh, shit. God damn it. Oh, I was offline for a minute. Okay. So it must have been, they must have figured out that I, w- I had Joe Rogan's thing on there. I, by the way, I claimed, uh, you saw me claim fair use. How is that not fucking fair use? You want to know why the shit like this happens is because they don't want you having this. They don't want me having this conversation. They don't want, like, that's the only conclusion I can draw right now. It's, oh, well, it's copyrighted for you. Okay. I, Sped it up. I put it in black and white. Monotone anyways. I've changed it more than 50%. Done all this stuff. And I, yet I'm offline for about a minute. Is that what it, is that what just happened? 30 seconds? Something like that. Fair use, fair use, fair use. I mean, I'm like, if, if you can't, like, they always tell you to put this. Like, what the fuck is this? Like, they always tell you, use this. Here you go. 
YouTube, here's why I use this. I don't think that this is a copyright infringement. I'm using this as a basis for opinion. Down for less than a minute. Okay, thank you very much. Well, okay, at least you got most of that. Because I, I wasn't looking, sorry, Sammy, I wasn't looking at your chat when I when all this was going on. All right, so we've got that. That's taken, that's established. I also want to point out a couple other things. So just so you know that I come correct when with all of this. So let's, let's switch over to this. Just so you know that I come, let's go for another camera angle because I'm about to do these. Where to go? Let's go through, uh, let's go through our studies today, children. Wait, where we go? There we go. Okay, children. Hello there, children. How's it going? Okay. Well, we already we already looked at the uh, behavioral genetics. Uh, let's also look at this. Okay, monogamy. Okay, monogamy reduces the ability of men to exploit women by creating greater equality. <laughs> under the poly under polygyny, uh, males can exploit females quite ruthlessly without suffering any costs. Uh, no, no, they can't. Uh, as a result of imposed monogamy socially enforced monogamy males behave in a less exploitative way towards female partners okay this may or may not be true i'm gonna i'll explain to you why i i, I halfway agree with this uh, i'll just read the highlight parts here um monogamy reduces the ability of men to exploit women by creating greater equality between them in their reproductive output um, Holland and Rice demonstrated this by forcing monogamy on the natural polygynous fly <laughs> a fly, a house fly, just so you know where, what we're experimenting with. Here. Uh, individual males and females were housed together over 32 generations under polygyny. Males can exploit females quite ruthlessly without suffering any costs. So remember to read your, your, your species here before you get into this. After several generations of monogamy, Holland and Rice uh, examined the effects when the control group of polygynous females were allowed to mate with non-monogamous new males the females benefited from the decreased toxicity like that, like how they, who's, who do you think is writing this, right? Toxicity of the male's seminal fluid. Okay. Which is normally harmful to them. Reciprocal. Okay. This is absolutely useless, Rob. Why are you even bothering with this? Um, but actually I shouldn't do that. Actually, I shouldn't say that. The reason why we get this is because there is this new predisposition for evolutionary psychologists to find some sort of middle ground or some reason why um why monogamy ought to be something ought to be the norm and without by the way uh imposing some sort of ethical moralism moralism on anyone oh there's here's why here's why monogamy should really be the thing and you might have a case for that but again monogamy in respect to most evolutionary psychologists all rides on the beta buck side being the correct way to think about things. Oh, we're going to have babies. We're going to get married. We have to find some way to fulfill the female mating strategy. Why is it that that is the correct way of thinking about it? Why is it that marriage is at an all time low right now? 5.1 per 1000. At least that was what it was in 2021. I don't know what it is right now. Why is it it's certainly very low? Okay. I mean, lower than it's ever been <laughs> since they started, you know, tracking stuff. One would think, that even if you're not religious, that monogamy and marriage would be the most beneficial way to live your life. Why is that? Oh, well, men are the gatekeepers of relationships. No, no, they're not. Not in 2021 or not in the 21st century. That's for damn sure. Women are the ones who they, they want. They know what they want when they want it. And when they want it is usually after 29 years old, as we can see, statistically speaking. <laughs> Why is that correct? Why is Andrew Tate not correct? Why is Myron? Why is Kevin Samuel? Again, I realize Kevin Samuel didn't say all of whatever that. But why is why is not closed on her end and open on my end? Why is that not the correct way of thinking about things? It's uh, we can. Do you want to talk about social constructionism? Is this society this and that? Okay, well we why? If you believe in social constructionism, then why isn't the opposite way around? Well, because. Studies show that when when men have more than one wife, or when they have, I should say, when they have, when they entertain more than one sexual partner, there's jealousy involved, and women like really crazy jealousy, because it represents an opportunity cost loss for women. Okay. Um, where is that other one? Is this the one I wanted to look at? Uh, women are less likely, especially in personality traits, are less alike especially in personality traits, 
and basic human values in countries that have invested the most in gender equality. Based on the literature, based on the literature review, it can be seen that the research supporting reduced gender differences in most uh, gender equal countries like Scandinavian countries, I'm sure, is scarce and inconsistent. Research supporting a positive link between gender variance and gender equality measures appear to be more robust and consistent. Men and women are less alike, especially in personality traits and basic human values in countries that have invested the most in gender equality. Evolutionary theorists argue some gender variations are sensitive to context-related fluctuations, demonstrating a gene-environment interplay, gene-to-environment interplay. In societies in which conditions are favorable, gender-specific genes flourish due to the lower prevalence of diseases, lower ecological stressors, and lower starvation rates. This is, uh, per this view, wider gender gaps in gender equality nations most likely reflect a more general biological trend towards greater dimorphism, meaning differences in research rich environment in resource rich environments, meaning we can afford this. The more equal the society, the more men and women default to our traditional or conventional gender roles. They st it doesn't matter what the society is. You can say like you used to, we used to be able to like argue that a woman could, was forced into a particularly patriarchal uh, situation because of the because of the the nationality, the tribe, the belief set, whatever. But when those are removed, we still default to the conventional norms, regardless. So uh, let me go back here and let's go back. We should answer these real quick. Marriage causes divorce. Thank you. Once again, seems like the sisterhood Uber Alice is strong in academia and is censoring unflattering views as is true in family courts and dealing with excess judges. By the way, it's not just family courts. Um, where is that? I have, I have new data here that I did not, pull. did I load this? I think I might've loaded this. Hold on. I'll put this up here. Since you, since you asked, um, actually you didn't ask. Since you asked, let's put this up. Actually, I'll just put it on the screen. Hold on. I'll share this for you. This is new data I picked up just recently. Um, there we go. Here it is. Law school enrollment by gender. Look at that, boys and girls. Check that out. And there goes a the snowmobile. <laughs> Hello there, children. How's it going? All right, law school enrollment by gender. Look at the disparity right there. It's already, you know, 1970. What happened in 1971, children? Hmm. Yeah, here's another. This is another one for the 71 uh, uh, article. I'm well, actually, I should write a freaking book about this. Maybe I'll write a small book about what happened in 1971. All right. So uh, look at the look at the enrollment. This is enrollment, by the way. This is not graduation. Might, the graduation numbers might be actually higher on the female side of things. But men are simply not even enrolling in law school. Now, uh, the, the reason I got a hold of this. Go pull this out of here. The reason I got a hold of that, uh, that data set right there is because there was a discussion about like how women in law are changing society. I usually talk about like, uh, well, psychology, that's in academia. Uh, when we talk about women in like the W, the WMF, the, the European Central Bank, uh, the global monetary, the GMF, global monetary, global bank, whatever. We look at who's holding the purse strings when it comes to like, like large nations. It's largely women at this point, or it was, I'm not sure who's in them. It's in the ECB right now. I know it got changed, it changed hands not too long ago, but you know, who's controlling the purse strings? Okay, we can talk about that. One thing I don't really talk about or haven't really gotten into was law. Who's making the laws? Well, pretty soon it's going to be mostly women. So when you guys are talking about, oh, most women are going to college, more women are making more money, more women are in the legal system now, more women are in academia, your kids are going to be taught largely by female teachers, your psychologist and your marriage counsel are, are 85 to 90% likely to be a female. Um, shall I continue? Oh, but we don't live in a gynocentric social order, Rolo. Where's the proof? Well, if you look at point after point after point, the proof is there. Uh, let's see. What's this? 
Rolo, you missed my super chat. Did I uh, bring that back up for me? Bring up Adolf hipster. Maybe that's why I missed it. Adolf hipster. Thanks, bro. Bra. Bra. Sorry, I don't. I didn't get Adolf hipster. I'm sure he'll bring it up. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, God. No, actually, I do have it. Sorry. I've, I just have it start here. Actually, let me go to the stars here. I'm going to go to the stars. Just pearly things issued an apology for having Fuentes on. Okay. Hold that thought. I will come back to that one. Um, in my previous life, I went to Eastern Orthodox Seminary. And yes, uh, the ch nice church girls are just as hypergamous as the thoughts uh, covertly. Hypergamy is, is like a subroutine. All women are hypergamous. How they express that and in what context and and what what the environment they're allowed to, like in, in an orthodox Christian way, in a Muslim way, they're still just as hypergamous. They just can't exercise it in the same way as the club thoughts on Fresh and Fit, right? So let's go to the next one. Rebuttal to women who say people hook up without the intention of having kids, but we have DNA tests. Well, we do have DNA tests. Is that a rebuttal? Rebuttal to women who say, oh, do you want, oh, hi, Brian. Do you want, or thank you for your $5. Dude, I'm not, how many times have I given you $25 super chats? I don't get it. I don't get them read because it's like, you're only doing like 50 and a hundred or $58 and above. See, I'm going to be cool with you right now. See, I read everything here. Uh, rebuttal to women who say people hook up without intentions of having kids. They do, but we have DNA tests. Okay, well, and, but we have DNA. Okay. So women do hook up without having the intent of having kids. In fact, I would, okay. So really what that, what that boils down to is two things. Okay. You have to understand the difference between proximate goals and ultimate goals. Why do women hook up in the first place? Not because they go, Hmm, this guy looks like a good dude that I want to, I really want to have his babies. You're at the club, you're at Zook, <laughs> you're at wet Republic. I don't care you're in Vegas and you see some hot piece. I will tell you this right now. When I first met my wife at a club, at a gig, I didn't go, hmm, I bet she'd be a great mother for my future daughter. I did not say that. I did not. That those were, that thought did not enter my brain at that time. You know what I did? I looked at her. I looked at her tits. I looked at her ass. I go, yeah, I want to tap that. <laughs> That's proximate. That's a proximate goal. I want to tap that is a proximate goal. The ultimate goal is, oh, well, we're going to have babies at some point, right? Maybe she, maybe later on after I tap that, I can decide whether or not she would make a really good mother or not and worked out, right? That's the ultimate goal. Reproduction is the ultimate goal. Proximate goal is I want to fuck that. I want to get on it. I want to get after it. So when we're talking about like, uh, you want to rebuttal to people hooking up without the intention of having kids, that's because it's a proximate goal. They're right. And you're right. It, two, those two things are not mutually exclusive. The ultimate goal and the proximate goal are both correct. Right. So, yeah, I, well, I don't want to have kids. Well, what's I, I've had, I've literally had women tell me this. Well, I don't think about reproduction when I want to get with a hot guy in the foam cannon party. Yeah, my, yeah, exactly. But the purpose of sex, the purpose of you getting hot and bothered in the first place is because there's a possibility that maybe you want to bear that kid's, ch that guy's children. Sexy sons theory. You know, Red Queen, you want to go back to them? Okay, we'll talk about, we, somebody asked me about Red, Matt Ridley and Red Queen earlier. Okay, so your rebuttal, is, you're, you, you really want me to hear, you're for $5, this is worth way more than five bucks. So remember this next time I'm in your chat, Brian. Um, but the, the answer to that is the difference between proximate goal and an ultimate goal. If you want to learn more about that, read, read, read. <laughs> The Ape That Understood the Universe by Dr. Steve Stewart Williams. It is the, that would be next to 48 Law. Well, not, my book would be at the top of the list, but next to 48 Laws of Power, I would put Ape Who Understood the Universe. And it's and it's an entertaining read. It's fun. You will laugh, you'll cry, you will kiss 10 bucks goodbye. It's uh it's a really great read. And it's it makes it makes evolutionary psychology fun to read. Uh, and it's informational, but it will explain to you the difference between an approximate goal and an ultimate goal. Okay. Uh, but we have DNA tests and, but we have DNA. Okay. We, we do have DNA tests. The problem with that is that it is politically uh, unpopular for guys. We, we have DNA tests, but we don't have any laws 
that say every birth, every live birth has to be tested to see if the father who is supposedly on the birth certificate is the actual father of the child. That needs to happen. In fact, when I talk about like marriage and, you know, we talk, well, why does Rolo hate marriage? I don't hate marriage, right? I, I think marriage is a, a, a wonderful thing. And I hope you guys can find happiness and love and, and joy and find your unicorn. Like what's her fuck was saying, right? I just say, I just disagree with the way that we do it now. And I believe that we need to find some way to reform marriage. Part of that reformation of marriage is we need to test every live birth for uh, DNA compatibility with the, the, the stated father on the birth certificate. Why is that not even, that should be a no fucking brainer. And it should have been a no brainer since the late seventies. Why? Why do we still, it, because in a gynocentric social order, it is, it is a, I don't say pol polite, but it's, it's more expedient. It is more practical. It serves gynocentrism. It serves the female reproductive strategy for men not to know. I, I hate it. Absolutely. I hate answering this question because you already know the goddamn answer. I have guys go, Rolo, how come DNA is, testing is not standard and blah, like what I'm saying. I agree with you, MRA guy, MGTOW guy. I 100% agree with you on this. Yeah, it should be. Oh, how come it isn't? Well, I think you know the answer to that. You live in a gynocentric social order. And even in some countries and in some states, you can't even get a DNA test without the express permission of the mother. And in fact... If that child is found to be a not to be a genetic match with the father through like a blood test or like maybe has a genetic disorder or they're 23 and me or God knows what. Like there's some way where the the medical staff figures out that dad ain't dad. They are they are um, bound by law not to tell the father, the father, the non-biological father that the kid really ain't his because they don't want to set themselves up for a lawsuit. And it goes back to the Duluth model of feminism, which is the man is always considered to be the aggressor. So the logic goes like this. If we tell non-biological dad that he ain't, the, he ain't the dad, he might lose his shit and kill her. He might lose his shit and uh, get violent. It's the same reason why the cops will take you to jail and not the mom or not the, boy, not the girlfriend. It doesn't matter if it's your house. It doesn't matter if she's in domestic dispute. The man is always presumed to be the aggressor. Similar thing. That's why you don't have DNA tests. That's why it's, excuse me, impolite to even ask or to even joke about it. It could be 100% true, but the very fact that you would even joke about it is offensive in a gynocentric social order. Again, going back to the, the global narrative right there. So... But we have DNA tests. Yeah, we do have DNA tests. It's not the fact that we have DNA tests. It's the fact that we can't get those. It's the fact that it's not standardized. Because in a, in a, in a gynocentric social order, rather than an androcentric social order, that's what we get. I'm going to explain the difference between androcentrism and gynocentrism here in a second. But that was a good question. Remember me, brah. <laughs> Remember my name. Say my name. Say my name. Rolo, I theorize, theorize uh, that care of body count along with what did you do uh, with him, where, when, okay, is also a need to know, is he getting her best? That is true, but, okay, let's keep going. Uh, it's uh, not, did you let him go... <laughs> Anal. Uh, it's did you do with him what you refused to do with me? Yeah. Did he bring out innate, feral, genuine desire and lust in you that I can't? Now, I agree. You're you're right. But what you're also focusing on again is proximate cause versus ultimate cause. Ultimate cause is how likely is it that because because you have primal feral lust for this guy and not me and you're willing to do crazy ass monkey sex with this guy and not with me really that's the proximate cause okay the proximate cause is what did you do why are you having sex with how hot was it did you get off does he have a bigger dick yada yada the, that's proximate cause ultimate cause is this did you get pregnant by him because the more into it you are and the more you're willing to, like you're going to, well, let's go back. Let's rewind the tape. 
women break rules for alphas and they make rules for betas. And you know what? Every guy on some level of consciousness knows this and women know it too. Only they don't want to talk about it. It's something that's unspoken. I'll talk about it because I got nothing to lose, right? Oh, you're a genius, Roll. No, I'm not a genius. I'm just articulating something you guys haven't, you guys already know, you know? Same thing with uh, DNA. T- you already know that, you know? Uh, what about, you know, what about this? What about that? You already know the answer to that. You already know damn well why we need DNA tests, but nobody wants to talk about it. Right? Same thing with this. Why? Did, uh, yes, it's, it's, am I getting her sexual best? Mm, yeah, but that's approximate cause. And, and you're right. Both can be true at the same time. Okay. That's the proximate cause. Ultimate cause is this because you're more into sex with this guy and you have genuine desire for this guy to the point where you're willing to do things with him that you won't do with me, the likelihood of you getting pregnant by this guy is way more that with him than it is with me. That's the ultimate cause. That's why. But you're right. You're 100% right. It's just, let, let's add a little, let's refine that a little bit more. But good question. Good theory, my friend. Um, what's this? Rolo, read the book three. Oh, book three. Positive masculinity is book three. Uh, gross seven figures today, stay ripped year round. Good for you. Having the hardest time finding other men at the same level to befriend. Yeah. Good luck. Uh, could you point me in the right direction? Absolutely. I could all here's the right direction. Here's the right direction right there. It's called men of action. It's the only group of guys that I, well, I mean, I shouldn't say the only guy I have a Patreon group as well, but as far as guys who have a collective guys who get together and compare notes, guys who actually do things, um, from a practical sense, everybody says I'm all about theory, which is more or less true. But if you want to put things into practice, go check out uh, Men of Action. The uh, the link right there is my link to uh, Mike Sartain's Men of Action group. And if you want to find guys at the same level that you can befriend, there here's the direction. There, I'm pointing to it for you right now. Do check that out and use my link. <laughs> uh dark dev uh dark night dev what do you mean by a woman's agency is her sexuality and do men have the qual have a quality as their agency okay okay let's go back to let's what is this five bucks here's your this is worth way more than five (laughs) dollars okay why do i say that women's only that women's first best agency is always going to be their sexuality because that's where they can get the, if when women can, women will always have their sexuality depending on how in shape they stay and how sexy they are and, you know, whatever, you know, women can do more or less to maintain that agency. But when I say agency, by the way, I'm not using agency as my word. That's a feminist term is agency. You will hear feminists say agency. I just stole it back. It's really power. It's really leverage. It's how do I get what I want? How do I make things happen? Agency is basically another, it's, it's the nice way of saying power because you don't want to say sexual power. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. That's exploitive. But if you call it agency, like Betty Frieden and Gloria Steinem did back in the seventies, it sounds a whole lot better. Um, so when I say, um, women's agency is her sexuality, her first best agency and women understand this from a very, young age when women hit puberty and they start to grow breasts and boys start to take interest in them and they are willing to you know do their homework for them and carry their books home from school and ride wheelies down the street and try to get their attention that's agency all i have to do is look good and you know like you know arch my back a little bit and (laughs) and guys will do things for me right that's agency that's why women always get naked right when they want to be heard it's the easiest, easiest point from the easiest way from point A to point B. Take your clothes off or show more skin, right? That's how you get men's attention. You get them to do something for you. That's agency. It's, it's leverage. Maybe we should call it leverage, but women's really first best in some case, and probably for most women, only agency is their sexuality. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that it has an expiration date. Expiry date, expiry date, according to the U to say it in the UK, in the British parlance, <laughs> expiry. That's your vocabulary word for today, by the way. Um, yeah, so that's that agency is right there. So do men have a quality as their agency? Yeah, but you got to remember, what have I said in the past? Men must become and women just are. And yes, that's out of, I want to say book three. 
Uh, that's a that's a Roloism. I claim that men must become women just are. You will, maybe it's book two. Men have a burden of performance. Whenever you hear that, that's book two. Burden of performance. Thank you very much. Take a bow. La, 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 la. When you hear that, that's a Roloism. That's not anybody else's <laughs> burden of performance. And, and, uh, and by the way, I'm going to take response. Uh, that I will take. That's mine. Okay. Burden of performance is this guy right here. And the reason why I'm taking that is because I ate so much shit for saying that. People want to say, oh, Rolo, it's not really a burden. It's a challenge. It's a privilege of performance. And people gave me so much shit for calling it a burden. And the reason why I called it a burden is because women don't have it. Men have a burden. Women do not. That's why I, I, I characterize it as such. And I ate a lot of shit for that. So when people start ripping me off for that one, I'm going to take that one back because I fought hard for that freaking phrase. Thank you very much. But yes, they do have quality as their agency. But it takes here, uh, but let, let's put you back on here, Dr. Dev. But it takes longer for men to develop that agency than it does for women because we're different and we look for different things in each other. Men must become, women just are, and it takes longer for men to become. The end. Chalk T, uh, Rolo speaks, we listen. Like H&R Block. <laughs> You guys don't even know what that is. <laughs> Aaron Clary will know that, that reference. I think it's a H and R blog talks. We people listen. It's uh, I think it's time. It, I think it's a shame. You don't get the love and respect from the Evo site community because I ask questions that they don't want to ask. I'm not any smarter than they are. I'll, I'll say this right now. I'm not smarter than David bus when it comes to this shit. I that which is why it's more frustrating for me than anything, because they know better and I know that they know better. <laughs> uh, but they'll go and talk and collab with people like Chris Williamson. Of course they will, because Chris is a shill for Peterson's. Uh, the reason Tradcons are so interested in Evo Psych in 2023 is they saw 68% of single women voted Dem in the 20. Yeah, uh, you might have that. You might have a point with that, Ben. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got nothing else. I got nothing else. Uh, readers digest. If she is in love with you equals you're good. If not, you got problems on the horizon. If not already. Yeah. You know what that here, James, let me, let me give you another Roloism. If mama ain't happy, God ain't happy. If mama ain't happy, you're not doing something right. Because in a gynocentric social order, I said it, everybody drink. Do I have anything left? I know. Oh, wait, I do. Now I'm done. Double Mountain Coffee. Go get it. Use RMS as your code. You'll get 20% off. Here, I'll put the I'll put the scroll on in a minute. Anyways, um, yeah. So um in a gynocentric social order, um, everything that is the uh, by the female interpretation, the female experience is the correct experience. That's why. And let's go. Uh, Carlo, Carlos Valle, Valle. I will say Valle, Valle. Carlos J. Valle. Thank you very much. I need a, I need a um, Antonio Banderas uh, sound drop. <laughs> I think the most, uh, I think most of these guys have cognitive dissonance. Yeah, but I can't excuse it. I can't excuse it about, about, for the same reason. Brett Weinstein, good example. Richard Reeves, mm, Richard Reeves, yeah, but he's not really, he's a doctor, but he's not a doctor of psychology. Uh, to even Dr. David Buss, yes. The only way I'd change my mind is if he wrote a sequel called Women Behaving Badly. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> I contend that he never will. Yeah, you're, you, cont you contend, wait, wait, here we go. He chose poorly. <laughs> yes. I, I 100% agree with you. Um, yeah, it, that's why it was a tough read to get through because I could see the agenda and the bias behind it. He know there's there's so there's so many qualifiers for the stuff that he came up with. And really, it's just pandering to, to a female narrative. I'm going to explain to you why here in just a second. Uh, yeah, OK, so Adol, Adol, Adolf, uh, engineer friend likes second cousin who lives uh, three hours away from his place in New York. Engineer friend likes his second cousin. Female, I hope. <laughs> uh, he got IOIs, uh, but distance is an issue. 
Um, no, second cousin is the issue, <laughs> not the distance, bro. <laughs> he meets her mom at his place whenever he visits parents. What should he do? Uh, like spin more plates. That's what you should do. Tell him this. Tell him Rolo said exactly this. Spin more plates. Got it? Good. Great. Now we can move on. Finally. And I have to do this right now, right here, right now. I'm going to do this. Okay. Pay attention. Everybody listen up. Here we go. I got to put this on there. Uh, greetings and salutations, Mr. Grollo Tomasi, with an exclamation point at the end of it. I got this in my email not too long ago. Okay, I am Kina from the Philippines. I've been with my boyfriend, Joval, for Joval, for 14 years, and he'll be celebrating his 43rd birthday on the 28th of this month, which happens to be two days from now, which I guess will be Tuesday. Okay, I was hoping to include you in the video montage of for him. He doesn't know. Okay, so you want to, <laughs> this is so great. So this year was really special and memorable for him and our relationship. He came across your channel, read your books, and some of the gentlemen from the Manosphere changed his life and our relationship and a lot and a lot and now he's or he's now in the process of reclaiming his manhood he looks up to you a lot and i know he'll be thrilled if you he ever saw you greeting him uh greeting him with a happy birthday hmm it doesn't have to be lengthy but you can feel free to add any if and a happy birthday joval would do uh i don't uh i don't i bleh, would do uh, i know you always have a lot on your plate so a five second video Oh, we're going to do more than five seconds uh, would do. And I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, I'm not sure if you do this kind of request. Oh, oh yes, I do. <laughs> Appreciate your time and reading uh, this. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, more success, sir. You're always grateful. Uh, always grateful for you. Thank you. Regards, Kina. Okay. His name is Javal. Here we go. Javal on your 42nd birthday. Namaste. <laughs> I don't know the Tagalog. I should know this too. I don't know Tagalog for happy birthday, but whatever it is, happy birthday, Javal. Congratulations on what what you say? 43 four, on your 43rd birthday. Happy birthday. I'm glad I could be a benefit. I'm glad you could benefit from what I do, Javal. Happy birthday. Peace out. Namaste. Uh, whatever it is. And, Philippines. Thank you very much. Uh, there you go. That's your happy birthday. And uh, keep watching, bro. <laughs> See, that's the kind of stuff that you have to do uh, on whatever podcast on Fresh and Fit. See, it's all goodwill. I love my I love my people, man. Uh, what was this? Oh, there's a significant disparity in dating interests between single men and women. Nearly half, 47% of single men Report being open to dating compared to only 36% of single women. The gender gap is dating uh, in dating is even wider among young singles. More than half, 52% of young men say uh, they are open to dating compared to only 36% of young single women. This, by, by the way, is, was just in the news not too long ago uh, in January. And this is, you're seeing, I won't, the reason I'm throwing that up there is because you're going to see those stats just thrown out willy nilly, right? Oh, and 63%, and which is correct. But you're going to see all the people who want to like shit on the manosphere say one thing, and the people who are like all about it, they're, gonna, they're too happy or they're too pissed off about it. But I want to throw that one out there. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? I don't think I have anything. I got some other shit to go, get into, but uh, let's see. Let me go back. I have this. I will get to the just pearly things here in a second. Pearly just issued an apology for having Nick Fuentes on. So, Pearl, I guess you found out who Nick Fuentes is now, huh? Bravo. Wow. Here we are at the end. You're sitting having coffee with him in another video not too long, which we'll talk about. Well, I'll, I'll just bring it up here in just a second because we've got to bring that one up. But uh, mediocre uh, tutorial guy uh, really kind of took her to the woodshed. He's not going to say anything. maybe I'll just let a little bit of it run for you here in a second. But. Um, so I guess you do know who he is. I don't know. I didn't know who he was. I just brought him on. I really didn't. Mm, no, you, in fact, you've done several videos with him and you know damn well who he is. 
And if you didn't, you should have. Uh, you go, well, I don't care what your opinion is. I'm, I don't care about, uh, well, I, I, do, I do later. I, you'll understand. I do care. But when I was making that one video, I didn't care because I care more about the fact that you are a little bit disingenuous and not knowing who he was and what his message was and why he's, why he is who he is because he was with Kanye West and Milo Yiannopoulos on Tim Pool's show. Not, but what, two months ago? The infamous walk-off event, probably the most viewed Tim Pool episode of all time next to, you know, Steven Crowder. <laughs> Don't give me this bullshit, man. And if you didn't know who he was, well, you certainly do now. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if I can catch up here. See, I like to try to keep up with these. Did my stream get nuked again? I don't think it did. Oh, wait, that's old. I'm not echoing now. Am I echoing? I don't think I'm echoing. Sam, am I echoing or is this guy? If, if I am, then de delete that dude. <laughs> mm, yeah, well, it's back now. So what was that 401? What time? Oh, that was way back. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going. I'm back through the, the back of the stream. No, I didn't miss your thing. Um, I wondered if it had gone off again. Seems like sisterhood Uber Alice is strong in academia. Yeah, okay, we got to that. Um, oh, what are the best books on Aviator Shift? Would you hold that thought? I will get it for you. I have it right over here. Sorry, I had to get it out of a different bookcase. What are the best books on Aviatory Shift? This is the number one best book on Aviatory Shift. Let me pull it out. This is, as I said, Dr. Marty Hazelton, Hormonal, Hidden Intelligence of Hormones, How They Drive Desire, Shape Relationships, Influence Choices, and Make Us Wiser. This, if you can get like every damn chapter, she has to get her feminist street cred because she knows feminists are going to come at her for Aviator Shift. This is the book, Hormonal by Dr. Marty Hazelton. Number one book on Aviator Shift. That's 25 years of, of her, well, at least the summation of 25 years of, of her research. Also, Dr. Is he a doctor? Is he a doctor? Tim Burkhead. Dr. Tim Burkhead, Promiscuity. This is a very expensive book. The hardback. Thank you very much, Jack Napier, for sending me this. <laughs> I used to have the uh, the softback of this, but uh, Promiscuity. It's you want a deep dive into like intersexual dynamics, and not just with human beings, like just like animals in general. I quote a lot out of this as well. So those two books, I would say, are the best ones. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Rolla, why is it that a good, a good lover, wait, wait, why is it that a good lover and a good provider are never hardly ever personified in the same body? By the way, thank you for being the dad in the room. Oh, wait, in okay, case you said dad, I got to turn off the porn music. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, they didn't used to be, that's the thing. Uh, the reason why it's so unbelievable right now is because women don't expect to find dad and CAD. It's dads versus CADs. It's alpha fucks, beta bucks. The reason, because it's not believable anymore. And the reason why that is, uh, this is actually a really, uh, really important question there, Chris. Thank for, thank you for that. Um, the reason why it's hard to find it in the same guy is because first of all, women don't expect to find it in the same guy. And the reason why is because the things that make the guy a good dad 
and the things that make a guy hot and sexy, dark triad. Like I want to, I want to fuck a shoe. Like was it Eddie Murphy said this in one of it was in a Eddie Murphy raw during the eighties, like one of his stand up routines. What would you rather get with the guy, the the woman who says, "Oh, make love to me, Eddie," or "Fuck the shit out of me, Eddie." Like those, that's one of those is reserved for the alpha. The other is reserved for the beta. The things that make the beta attractive. The th- and by the way, I'm not like saying this is not a judgment call. One's good or one's bad. Cause you could say the alpha is a son of a bitch. And you could say the beta is a, 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 a doormat, you know, simp, or you could say vice versa, depending on the person. But the things that make the beta male guy attractive in the first place are also the things that don't make him fun and exciting. And he they make him predictable. Remember, perfect is boring. And that's the thing is I'll be perfect for you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll be a good dad. I'll read to the kids. I'll make a lot of money. I'll do everything that I'm so I'll do the right thing. I'll stand up and do the right thing. I'll take responsibility. I, I don't care about the, you know, the costs. I don't care about the authority. I'll just do the right thing. That guy is boring. Next to the guy who's the fun, sexy, alpha male, you know, likes to go skydiving. He's the helicopter pilot. <laughs> Name it. I don't know. But the things that make the guy sexy are also the same same things that make him unreliable. And they make him like they you want women want to definitely tame the the Tars. They want to Jane wants to tame Tarzan. You know, T-Rex wants to hunt. Right? They want to tame them. T-Rex doesn't want to be fed. He wants to hunt. And the things that make the guy sexy are also the same things that don't make him a good bet for, you know, parental investment. So that's why it's really difficult to find me. And, and then also, there's also timing too. So suddenly women are reprioritizing what is attractive, not arousing, attractive to them at 29. And they're saying, you know what? He's got to be good looking, but it that's just slightly less important than a guy who's got a good job, comes from a good family, wants to have kids, likes Disneyland, likes rainbows, long watch, walks on the beach and likes puppy dogs, right? So that's why, because it's timing. And then the things that make one, the one guy sexy and the other, the qualities of the other offset the other. That's why. Uh, do you need me to tell you? You know who should be saying this? Dr. David Buss. How come? Uh, explain why no often, why no often means yes. And why no often means yes. And hooking in when hooking up. Uh, actually, yes means yes when hooking up. No means mm, maybe sometimes, and sometimes no means just simply no. I would never, I would never presume no means yes, especially right now. But I don't necessarily think that it often means yes. One girlfriend did this to me, uh, and uh, uh, me did this to me. Day we met, the day we met, uh, while hooking up, and overtly said days later, sometimes. Chic, no means yes. Shake, shake. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, similar behaviors happen often with others. Uh, thanks, not my real name. <laughs> yeah, I figured. Chic Daddy is not your real name, huh? <laughs> well, thanks for clarifying that, bro. Okay. Um, so yes means yes, no means no, blah, 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 blah. What's consent? What's not? That's It, it boils down to consent. And uh, when we have ambiguous ideas of what consent is and what is no and what is yes. It's, I think it's always probably a better, it's a better part uh, to err on the side of no means no. No doesn't mean maybe and no never means yes. If it's no, it's no. And it's like, if that's the case, I'm out for most guys. Okay. Well, she, I, you know, she told me no, but I pressed on. The reason why I don't think that that's a good idea is like, I, I kind of, part ways with the guys who talk about like last minute resistance LMR in the pickup artist community. Um, there were, there used to be ways to sort of push past LMR last minute resistance. And in the mid two thousands, a lot of that made sense in 2021, 2023. Yeah. You might get a, a sexual assault charge. And if you don't, you might get it retroactively now. So it's almost better to err on the side of no means no means no means no. And that, you know, better not to, better to go look for a solid enthusiastic. Yes. Then, you know, I, you don't see that's even back in the pickup artist days in the, the foggy days of the, the aughts of the 2000 aughts. Um, 
I, I still didn't think LMR was a good, like pushing past last minute resistance was a good idea because I come from the school. I come from the Gene Simmons school of seduction. And that is, I don't want to be with a woman who doesn't want to be with me in the first place. And a lot of guys say, well, you got to be persistent. Mm, that don't listen to Grant Cardone in that, in that instance. Okay. Grant Cardone's like, yeah, I went, I, I've used that, that video montage of him before where it's like, oh yeah, I kept, I kept going. I was persistent. I kept asking her out, blah, blah, blah. even though she said she wasn't into me, even though she was fucking other guys, even though she had no, no, you know, IOIs, no, 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 absolutely no godly, you know, earthly interest in me whatsoever. And I just stuck it out. Nah, you stuck it out. And she was at a point where she's like, yeah, maybe I will get with this millionaire. I fucked enough of these pool boys. I think maybe Grant's still sticking around. It's a, it's a very common story, by the way, too. Like, I mean, Jordan Peterson is also like that. If you think about it, because by the way, Tammy Peterson lived with a dude before she uh, decided that once that whole situation broke down, then she decided to accept uh, Jordan Peterson's third proposal of marriage. And if you don't believe me, just go look at the interviews between Michaela Peterson and Tammy Peterson when they were talking, when she was talking about how they got together. I, their story, not mine, man. Go have a look. <laughs> because if I talk about it, my Rolo's jealous and he's a son of a bitch. Well, all I can do is point to that video. <laughs> uh, LMR, I don't want a woman that I have to like, not necessarily beg into bed, but like, you you know, you don't want to beg, but we are pussy beggar. Yeah, well, there is such a thing. But if a girl is like having last minute resistance, I don't, I want the hell yes girl. I want the girl is like, hey, you want to go on a date? Hell yes, I do. Hey, you want to go jet skiing? Hell yes. Hey, you want to go to the strip club? Hell yes. Hey, you want to go fishing? Hell yes. Hey, you want to go sky? Yes. Yes. Hell yeah. Hell, will you? Hell yeah, I do. That's, that's genuine. Does I want a woman who has, who's going to change her fucking religion for me that I don't have to sit there and plead my case, spooning her on the couch or on the freaking bed or some shit like that. I want the hell yes, girl. And I think most people should too. That's why like Gene Simmons used to say he would never have, I don't know. Sorry. I don't necessarily know how much I believe this, but Gene Simmons used to have, he had two interviews with Terry Gross from NPR. And man, if you can still find those, they're probably around somewhere. I would love to do a breakdown of their, their audio interviews for NPR radio, like national public radio. And uh, he claims like he doesn't drink, you know, he's, he has had drinks, but he's never been drunk or he doesn't, he's used to, but he never gets drunk. Like he's not a, he's completely sober and he has had sex with a lot of women and demands that the women are also sober because if you can't sleep with him sober, then he doesn't want you, certainly doesn't want you drunk. Right. I can totally understand that because it's really not even so much the sobriety part of it as it is the genuine desire part of it. So. So that's, you want to talk about yes and no. I would rather have an enthusiastic yes than, mm, no, no. okay, fine. That's fine. I got plenty of other plates to spin. You know, if you're not down with this, I don't want to have anything less than like, you know, hot monkey, enthusiastic consent sex. Simple as that. And they keep pushing the patriarchy boogeyman. Yes, they do. Oh, we'll talk about, we'll get into the patriarchy here. I'll, I'll, I'll finish out with the patriarchy. Can DNA test be part of a prenup? Mm, I don't know. Can it? I don't think so. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Hell, you could probably put anything you want to in a prenup. So it's getting her to sign it. That's the trick. Um, RP mentor, Tokyo channel, Tokyo channel. Uh, interesting women wait 48 hours to resume intercourse with partners after affairs, which negates the chance of sperm will interfere with the uh, affair partners which must be done within 24 hours. Is there a stats for that? Do you have links for that? I would love to, to, to read into that. Thank you for the 1,000 yen. I guess that's a 10 bucks. <laughs> it's yellow, so it's gotta be 10 bucks. Uh, here's my other, oh, by the way, thank you. They reminded me of something. Um, there's a couple of things, a couple of other, I think, um, confounding factors that we need to also address with respect to the mate shifting hypothesis. Uh, the bo one biological factor is this, is that... Um, uh, again, promiscuity. Thank you, Tim Burkhead. Um, when there, there this is a, there, there's two studies on this, actually. One was, I think, back in like September or August of 2022. And then there's one that's more recent. Um, but 
human female ovum select sperm, different sperm. So if there's a genetic, it's through proteins or whatever, like the, the eggs will slow down certain types of sperm or certain men's sperm and will accelerate or allow uh, the sperm of another man to fertilize the egg. It is selective. Women's selectivity of, of men is down to the fucking cellular level. It's not just, oh, she wants the hot guy. She wants the rich guy. Blah, blah. No, it's at the cellular level. Eggs choose which sperm gets in and which doesn't, or at least it tries to vary. It tries to slow down some and speed up others. The only reason now, maybe it's not the only, okay. I don't want, I don't want to be, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak in absolutes, but let's just for sake of argument, the only reason why that evolutionary adaptation would exist in the first place is because human females are promiscuous. That's why. Because of cuckolding, okay? One sperm is better than the other down to the cellular level. <laughs> so if that's the case, Dr. David Buss, we have to take into consideration evolutionary biology as well as evolutionary psychology and leaning on reasoning that depends on social construction. Shame on you. Like go like go read freaking Steve Stewart Williams. Go even hell the God side. Go read anybody else who is not trying to rely on social constructionism as a reason for why women cheat or why their mating strategy might be what it is. Biological reasons will all the machine trumps all biomechanical reasons will always trump social reasons. Society, social constructionism, while it does have an effect, I'm not going to deny that it isn't, it's not the whole thing. It's not the whole fucking enchilada, and it is most definitely downstream from biological reasons. That's why eggs choose sperm, man. Perhaps there's, perhaps, maybe from the biological level, that it makes better sense, a more pragmatic sense on some level of consciousness that women might want to get the sperm from one kind of man while they're getting the provisioning and the resources from another kind of man because the other dude with the good sperm can't handle parental investment or she can't lock him down. That's why fat chicks try harder, man. They're great in bed because they, that's their only chance of getting that with that, the, the alpha seed, man. Then, then what they're going to do. That's why cuckolding exists. Why would cuckoldry exist in, at all? If that were the case, if it weren't the case that women are trying to get the best seed from one guy and getting the best provisioning from another guy, why would it be that the human ovum would select sperm from one and not the other? I'm waiting. We're waiting. Like another factor that needs to be thrown into that mix. Why is that? Okay, that's one. Here's the other biomechanical reasoning. You've probably heard people talk about how Hormonal birth control, the pill, fucks women up. Probably heard that all the time. I've had this discussion on Access Vegas with Mike Sartain. We've talked about you, like, and let me tell you something. It is the topic du jour for trad cons right now because they don't like hormonal birth control for whatever reason. Oh, it messes them up. It promotes the, or it convinces women because it convinces that women that they are pregnant, right? at least like three weeks of the, of the month anyways. It, it, in theory, it convinces women that they are, uh, they ought to be with beta males, right? And so what happens is when they go off of the pill, they go, oh, I don't really want to fuck this guy. He's not really the, my type. He's nice, but I don't want to have babies with him. I'd rather go fuck Jason Momoa, right? Or, and this is actually, I can show you the research for this. I don't have it queued up, but I have shown you this research in the past. Is that the pill doesn't actually do that, but let's just say for sake of argument it does, but it does actually lower libido. It, does, it, does, it doesn't promote sexual dysfunction according to the research that I've seen, but it does lower libido. I've asked women just sort of randomly, anecdotally on the show's, um, like what's been your experience going off the pill per like, um, you know, being on the pill. That's the wind. Sorry. Um, and, uh, that usually comes down to, well, I got more horny as a result 
uh, when I got off the pill. Now, some women report saying that they weren't attracted to their husbands or the boyfriends or whatever when they was time to go off the pill and they were going to have a baby so they could, you know, procreate. Right? Suddenly they find that they're not attracted. If, 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 if that's the case, that completely, uh, I won't say invalidates, but it, it, it certainly challenges mate shifting hypothesis because now it proves that women actually do, it, I should say it proves dualistic mating, mating strategy. Because if you can take a pill and it can trick your body into thinking it's pregnant and tricking your mind into thinking that this guy is more attractive than the other. And if you were to take it off and you were to be, you'd, you'd you know, go off the pill and suddenly you're attracted to guys who are more masculinized, that is a very strong uh, correlate, let's just say, for the biological reasons or biological underpinnings of ovulatory shift. So... Where do we, why are we not having that conversation? Why is Rolla Tomasi bringing this up and not Steve Stewart Williams or, or Chris Williamson or Rob Henderson? Why am I the, the guy that has to make this, uh, make this public to the 1,018 people that are watching right now? I'm wait, we're waiting. <laughs> why, why, is, why am I the one that has to like bring this shit up? And I hate to have to be the one to do it. You know, the bearer of bad news. Those are two biological factors that confound mate switching hypothesis. And why is it that suddenly out of the blue, after 25, 30 plus years of saying, you know what, I think ovulatory shift and, and dual, the dualistic mating strategy has merit. Suddenly in 2021, right after men behaving badly publishes, now suddenly he's got a different opinion. I will explain that to you here in a second. Actually, you know what? Hold on. My girlfriend says that. Men are mean, mean. That's why she doesn't like them. Usually he says buying food isn't being nice either. What the fuck, dude? Okay. Um, I'll tell you why. Here we go. Uh, let me let me make a few observations. Well, actually, before I do that, here's here's why this is me spitballing. This is why I think that uh David Buss um decided that mate switching is a better idea because Lo and behold, uh, dating course, there it is. Lo and behold, Dr. David Buss had a dating course. I didn't know if you knew this. It's called First Date. In fact, let's have a look at it right now. Um, show the screen. And a Chrome tab is uh, First Date. Where's the First Date? Ah, here we go. All right, here we go. This is the First Date course. Did you guys knew, know that this existed? I didn't until Mike Sartain showed me. A new dating course uh, backed by science is coming. Okay. If you go and you look at the code on this, this was back in 2020 is when he started this. I don't know who these two broads are, but man, you, you, Dr. David Buzz hangs out with some hotties, right? I mean, do they look normal. Are they normal girls? Probably. All right, let's keep going here. First date. Would we, should we watch this? It's only two minutes. Let's have a look. My body of work and what I've... Wait, can you hear that? I, may, I might have to... Uh, on. I, I don't know that I put, well, let me pull this back. You probably can't hear that. Hang on one second. I got to actually got to click the, uh, the audio in on this one second. I'll give it to you. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, it did have the audio up. Oh, my bad. Sorry. So I screwed up my bad. Okay. Here we go. I've devoted my career toward is toward understanding and uncovering the mating psychology of women and men. That's one of the reasons why I really like this course is because for everything that you're learning, you can go back and also see how it's based on real research. I feel very strongly that we shouldn't keep the science to a small group of scientists. This information is important for people to understand. It's important for people's own mating lives. It's important for reducing conflict between the sexes. And it's important for success in trying to attract the desirable mates that you want to succeed in attracting. Women's mating psychology is complicated. And the more men can understand that mating psychology, the more successful they will be in attracting the woman that they want to attract. 
I want you to meet the person of your dreams. And in order to do that, sometimes you need to do a little bit of work. This course is going to guide you to do that work and ensure that you're ready to attract in the person of your dreams. In this course, some things that I'll be talking about include the complexity of women's mating psychology, tactics of attraction, and how to behave properly on a first date so that you engage the person that you're on a date with. I think this course will be so amazing for any male to do because it gives insight into a woman's heart. Sometimes we don't need to make a mistake to learn. I'm looking forward to sharing with you what really makes the guy stand out from among the rest. That's been the question for centuries. What do women want? Well, here it is. Like, there you go. If a guy did this course, I would feel as though he's very confident. To be able to take a step back and work on yourself and to say, hey, you know, I did this, I've worked on myself is really attractive. You might think you're nailing the dating game, but if you want to be the very best, this is the course for you. Wow. You can't tell me to do that again. That was from the heart. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. Sign up today. Well, unfortunately you can't sign up because this was from back in 2020. So just saying there. Uh, oh wait, Huberman's part of this too. Wow. My goodness. Who knew? Sorry. You probably can't see that. Oh, it's because I'm in dark mode. My bad. Anyways, this is the, the dating course. Now the copyrighted was 2023, this updated, but if you look at the code or if you go back into this, it says uh, it, it actually arrived in 2020. So this is actually, it never took off. It never got off the ground. So just pointing that out there, this came out right about where they, they were planning on doing it. I don't know if they're still doing, maybe they are, who knows? Andrew, yeah. Huberman was part of this whole shenanigans too, right? They, this is, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, this is Dr. David Buss's attempt to be Matt Hussey. <laughs> It never happened. He's still doing interviews with Joe Rogan. Nobody talks about this. It's still up. The site's still up. I, I don't know if it did any, has any, if you, by the way, if you have signed up for this, if you knew about this already and you signed up, have anybody given, gotten back to you recently? You've gotten any, uh, you know, early, hey, be an early uh, adopter? I, I don't know. Yeah. So, all of this uh, mate switching, hypothesizing, and all of this, uh, you know, it's not dual mating. It's something else. Funny how all that happened right around this time, right around the book being published and having a new dating course. And we got Andrew or we got Huberman helping us out with this, I guess. I don't know. He certainly endorsed it, I guess. Everybody wanted to. Hustler bus. Yes. Thank you very much. So, Yeah. Uh, let me uh, also finally last last here lastly here uh, I get a lot of people always ask me about like uh, evolution of desire evolutionary psychology Dr. David Buss has written some really good stuff I don't think men, men behaving badly um, uh, was it men when men behave badly that's the title of the book this was, and when was that published 2021 <laughs> When his Australian hotties were at the peak of their marketability, baby. Um, Evolution of Desire, which is the one that you will hear uh, Mike Sartain quote quite a bit. That was published in 1994, people. That was, that was, good Christ, that was what, almost 30 years ago now. Coming up, like, well, next year it'll be 30 years. 29 years ago. Why, like, did, what's changed since then? What, what, what's our experiment? How has the internet, you know, changed our uh, our uh, awareness of the of evolutionary psychology? I'm not saying it wasn't a great book. I'm not saying that. Like, hell, uh, I still go back to Forty Eight Laws of Power, published in 1998. You know, so I'm saying that, not saying that it's you know invalid. It probably is, but the research methodologies that led up to the. Uh, the writing of that book are not what they are today. Let's just throw that one out there uh, again, not invalidating it, but let's it's getting a little long in the tooth. And I think it's time we move on to something a little bit more contemporary. If you think the same thing about the rational mail, I 100% agree with you. That's why I've written five or more books or, or four more after that. Okay. Staying current. That's what authors do. We write books. We shill books all the time. All right. 
evolutionary psychology, which you will see on the back uh, counter for uh, pretty much every Mike Sartain show. Again, good book. Uh, evolutionary psychology by Dr. David Buss. When was this published? 1998. Okay. Again, probably still very valid today, but we have advanced quite a bit since then. That was tw all close to 25 years ago. Okay. Uh, and so, but in both of those fantastic books, fantastic reads, the murderer next door, 2005, why women have sex co-authored with, uh, forget what her name is forget that chick's name anyways co-authored with another chick uh uh publication date 2009 uh personality psychology published 2001 uh dangerous passions published 2000 and he that he had a co-author on that i believe uh evolution of personality 2010 uh, Oxford Handbook of Psycho... Uh, okay, he's just quoted in that one. That's 2023. Uh, evolutionary Psychology, Personality, Psychology. Most of his best works was done... Uh, well, clearly, Evolution of Desire, 1994. All right? So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have... Da David Buss is certainly part of the pantheon of evolutionary psychology gods. But let's take it with a grain of salt the next time Hafiz wants to say, oh, the rational males like the fucking Dr. Seuss. You need to go to the source like uh, the 1994 uh, book uh, Evolution of Desire by Dr. David Buss. OK, I'm not going to say I'm not going to throw. Uh, hell, if, if you want to we make comparisons all you'd like. But let's let's look. I would guarantee you a guy like Hafiz has not read that book. And if he has, he doesn't realize when it was produced. Or he doesn't realize when it was published. The research methodology of the late 80s into the early 90s is nothing. Zero. I, I feel pretty confident in saying this. Is nothing like it is in the 21st century. Okay. <laughs> I mean, maybe you did a lot of work. Got it. Kudos to you. You know, glossy. You, here's your trophy. But things have changed since then. So next time I hear that, that I'm going to bring that up. Trust me, I will bring that up. Anyways. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we, we covered all our bases. I got to the first date course. The first date course. Man, a new dating course backed by science is coming soon. It's been coming soon for three years now. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. There we go. My bad. That's what I get for screwing off with my. YouTube channel. Okay. Shall we get into the Pearl thing before I go? I think we should. Anybody want me to do this or not? Is this a bad idea? No, actually, no. Before I do, I got to get to these. Hold on. I will get to that. Rolo, I attract masculine women. Kind of easy to do today. Uh, but don't consider myself a feminine man. I'm 5'8 and lean towards skinny, <laughs> the skinny side. Oh, good for you. And personality-wise, have dark triad traits. Do they see me as a beta provider? Um, I don't know. I what's masculine? I, I would need a description of what you think is masculine. Um, because tech arguably that's pretty much every chick in the United States, I presume. Well, where are you? You're not in the US. You're in H N L, wherever that is. Uh are you here's I think it's funny, it's, it's almost kind of like a, a redundant to say, Hey, I, I attract masculine women. Oh, welcome to the 21st century, Aaron. <laughs> Roll, they're all masculine. What are we going to do to make them feminine? <laughs> you tell me, man. I just work here. Hey, Rolo, I got into a discussion about men communicating overtly and women communicate covertly, inspired by the medium is the message chapter. Okay. However, it seems hard time backing it up with science. Uh, no, you don't. Well, first of all, you don't have to even back it up with science. You just say, well, how, well, actually you can. I shouldn't say that. You can. Uh, I have studies, uh, or actually I have quotes of studies from like Rob Henderson and Rolf Dengen about how men and women communicate differently, how men, when they're communicating, they're communicating over a project or they stare out at the world when they're communicating, they're watching the game and they're like kind of talking to each other this way. Whereas women will make a point to go and have, go meet up at Starbs. Oh, let's catch up. Oh, and they, they communicate like this, like straight, like straight face to face, the act of communication for women uh, here's how you back this up. And here's how women will agree with you. Like you, this is scientific evidence. Like women's brains are wired for communication. They're wired for sub communication. They're wired to pick up on nuances and body language and everything because it's key to their, uh, 
sexual strategy, but also key to their survival too, because they want to determine is this guy quality or not. And so they have to be better at, at like uh, being sensitive and interpreting communication in a variety of different forms and different way that men are men say what they mean and they mean what they say, right? It's information based. When we're talking about women being covert, it's more about feelings when men uh, focus primarily on the content of what's being related in the conversation. Women focus primarily on the context of what's being communicated. How did it make them feel versus for men? What information can I use from you? That's how that's the difference between those two. If you can, um, and by the way, if you really want to, you want to win that argument, at least start from the, from something that flatters women, which is look, women communicate covertly and they focus primarily on the con text and the feelings of the conversation. They have better uh, communication facility. They, they get more out of a conversation. They get more out information from body language, from vocal intonations, from facial gestures, from, from hand gestures, from the way that you present yourself, physical appearance, um, physical bearing, physical presence. All of that is part of communication. Those are sub communications. Women are way better at that than, than men are because they have to be, because if they're not, they tended to die in our ancestral past. You can compliment women and say, look, Studies show that women are better at communications. Oh, yeah, they are. Okay, well, if that's the case and you're agreeing with that, then does it not stand a reason that men don't communicate like men, women, or at least from a conventionally masculine perspective? That's how you start that con that conversation. Good, uh, good observation, though. It's adaptive to marry second cousins. Half button. Rolo, what fee, from what field would you suggest it's adaptive if you got no other opportunities? <laughs> uh, Rolo, from what field would you guess the most accurate and useful developments regarding intersexual dynamics will come from in the future? Oh, good question. Academics, right? Uh, I'll tell you right now, academics will be on the very bottom of rung of that ladder. Uh, I would say, well, I mean, black pill doomers, black pill is just red pill with nihilism added. There's nothing that the black pill has ever said that the red pill hasn't already said first. And I will die on that hill. Oh, that's a, no, I will show you in my, in my own communications on so suave as far back as 2004, where I used the term red pill. And we were talking about this probably long before the birth of, of most people who call themselves black pill. Yes. Red pill is black pill is just the red pill with nihilism added. That's all black pill is just a practice. It's taking what the red pill has and like applying it in the most nihilistic, most hopeless way. It's self, it uses the red pill for self defeat. How's that? So I would, I would presume, okay, so pure red pill as a praxeology, I think would be far, more, I hope, I hope that that's the future of understanding intersexual dynamics. It probably won't be because everybody will corrupt it as we're seeing going on right now, because everybody wants to pair it up with politics and social issues and racism. You want to know why there was a guy named Roycey at one point who turned into Hartiste? And why he no longer really kind of exists as a blogger anymore, because he decided to start doing ethno-nationalism as, as an addition to his blog. And that really was the beginning of the end. Right? And again, we're coming back into that cycle. So the people who we think are authorities with respect to the red pill, if you're pairing it up with people like Nick Fuentes, I'm sorry, but that ain't the red pill. There was a dream that was the manosphere proximal, and this is not it. <laughs> Read my, read Myron's book, Love Myron, a nice foundation you laid for him and for all of us, bro. Well, I'm glad you liked it because I did the cover of that book. Thank you very much. And it took a long fucking time. Uh, Paul Brutala, Butala, Butalle, Butalla. Is that Spanish or is that Italian? Could be. Thank you for the pod classes and five books. You are welcome, my son. Collecting your own idea or your own data. Have you ever thought of doing polls on the streams? I, I suppose I could. Would you like? The reason I don't do polls is because I can't do them in StreamYard. 
I would have to go into the YouTube uh, stream. I could, I could pop out the chat, I suppose, and do them. I haven't done those in a while. The reason why is I'm a one-man show. If I had a producer, we could probably do polls. Um, I don't know. Maybe. You mean to get demographics of people? I could do that, too. The reason I don't is because I, I'm running the show in StreamYard right now, and I can't really do that. Uh, thanks for everything you do. Religion, in my opinion, is your best book. Thank you. It was the book I worked the longest on. Very comprehensive about everything you teach. Yes, and also the most well-sources cited book I've ever done with a bibliography and everything else included that no one seems to want to acknowledge, but... <laughs> Uh, to clarify, no means yes. Uh, I meant uh, when we are already naked and doing things safe work. <laughs> if you're already naked, and it, it, I, I'm pretty sure yes is yes. <laughs> but again, you might not be. There's always that gray area. I want enthusiasm. I want enthusiasm. You know, people say, like, oh, enthusiastic consent. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I want like, I just want enthusiasm. I want the hell yes, girl. The answer is major histocompatibility complex. Mm, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm racking my brain on that one. Cause a lot of, I, uh, the problem is whenever I hear that histocompatibility, yes. Okay. But whenever I hear that, I always kind of try to, I always pair that up with the micro chimerism argument. Sorry, but it's the first thing that jumps into my head. Um, which by the way, the jury's still out on, um, the girl I've been, I've been seeing for on, I've been seeing has been on BC for a long time. Okay. Uh, but she has all green flags and genuine desire. Should I be worried if she ever gets off? Um, I oh, birth control. I stay in shape to stay masculine. If that helps, well, then you yeah, keep it up. But she has green flags and desire. Should I be if she never gets off? Uh, well, I mean, try other things. I'm by the way. <laughs> I, I hate to get vulgar here. Uh, asking because asking that uh, to that uh, she seeks comfort being on birth control. She, would she possibly see me as beta? Mm, don't don't read too much into that. I would be more concerned with libido than I would with um, with uh, her seeing you as beta, like the low. Because I have I don't have it queued up. I'm sorry, but I have in the past put out uh, the there is a there's research that shows that. Um, the hormonal birth control does not like screw up the desire for a masculine guy during the proliferative phase. It just, it, it suppresses it, it compresses it down. That's why when women go off of it, the cycle is still the same. It's just exaggerated because it comes back to normal hormonal levels and therefore their libido goes up. So it's not necessarily like, oh, she's into betas because she's on the, on the pill. But when she goes off, now she wants to fuck alpha guys. Well, even if that's true, it, in some ways invalidates make switching hypothesis, but also the, the, the data that I have seen is that it doesn't actually do that. It just suppresses the whole or compresses the whole of uh, ovulatory shift. And then when they go off of it, that's why they get horny and then their libido goes up as a result. Uh, why didn't these guys identify Pearl as a grifter when every one of her shorts had that sad patronizing piano music playing in the background? You tell me, man, that wasn't me. What have I been saying since day one, Rick? I'll wait. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you guys, wait. Yes. Thank you. That's what you, that's going to be the vindication sound drop. I know, man. I tried to say, I just work here. Nobody wants, oh, what's your problem with Nick Fuentes? Nothing. My problem is with, with Pearl not knowing who Nick Fuentes is. That's what it was about. Oh, now we got an apology for it. Oh, darn. Uh, curious to hear, I haven't seen it yet. I will see it as soon as I end this stream. Curious to hear more about the role of attention in female psychology. Okay, well, you can find more about that in my first book, Ben. Um, the, in, uh, the rational male, there is a chapter there called your attention, please. Attention is the coin of the realm in girl world. It's, it's the way women kind of do hierarchy from within. Like women tend to not be as hierarchical as men, but it's not to say that there isn't a hierarchy, there's a pecking order from within the collective of women and attention is how that is measured. So, uh, 
really. A feel ha feels tried to throw some shade your way without mentioning you directly. Oh, again? <laughs> really? Would you like to know more? Yes, I would. <laughs> when hasn't he done something like us? Like for fuck's sake, brother man. You like at this point, it's just like say my name. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. I like you. I would be happy to have a conversation with you. I would be happy to like uh, correct you on all the straw men you like to throw my way. But uh, if you can't even say my name like three times in the mirror, I'm gonna, how am I not candy? Candy man. Candy man. Roll it to my seat. Roll it to my seat. Roll it to my seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, man. That's... Roll it to my seat. Roll it to my seat. Roll it to my seat. <laughs> Uh, the guy. Oh yeah. With the gap father. Yeah, I did. I, by the way, I pointed that out. Oh, I did see that. Um, I only watched, I, I watched the part where everybody was saying, Oh, he's, he's kind of trying to get Gad Saad to like sell you out. Like the whole reason Hafiz wanted to have Gad Saad on there was so he could go, well, you know, there's these red pill guys and they try to be like, they're trying to be like you, they're trying to be like, you know, armchair, you know, evolutionary psychologists there's one in particular i can't really recall his name i wonder who it could be and you know what cat sod says oh you mean andrew tate <laughs> come on come on poke him with the stick say it say the rollo name say the rollo name so i don't have to <laughs> come on Avis. you are that you really are that transparent brother you really are god that was funny as shit too because i know he's like I wonder if he's gonna say he's gonna say that name he's gonna say because people were saying he was talking shit about me i'm like they haven't mentioned my name once <laughs> in fact they mentioned andrew tate <laughs> which by the way is what uh dr phil <laughs> that's who he wanted on his show oh uh, why am i a, i'm always a bridesmaid and never a bride <laughs> uh did i get to you okay i got to you on that one let me come back down a little bit more yeah i saw him i it was like trying to poke poke him and make him do it <laughs> Make him do Rollo. Make him do Rollo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should I be worried if my girlfriend dislikes men? Yes. That's your 199 answer. Should be worried. You shouldn't be worried about anything. You know what you should be worried about? Spinning plates. Spin more. Pl What's the cure, Rollo? Spin more plates. But, but, no. Spin more plates. But what if she's, no. Spin more plates. Okay, thanks. Being on birth control. She still has a high sex drive. Uh, maybe I'm good. You probably are. Don't read too much into it. Don't, you know, <laughs> you know, I've, I've said, uh, Rollo Pearly is on full damage control and there's a civil war among black men uh, against Pearly. Who? Maybe I should take Myron up on his, and Myron invited me to come out to Miami. Um, I'm, I maybe it's a make good thing. I don't know. But uh, invited me to come to Miami next week to do a Black Manosphere uh, show in Miami. He wants to. He actually offered to fly me out too, so I might do it. Uh, do I want to fly another day to Miami? Um, I might. I might do it. AMS is supposed to be on the show, and it might be an interesting conversation in light of what's happened with Pearl. I haven't said yes. I haven't said no. It's going to be like a scheduling thing. I, I don't know. I'm supposed to pick up a new Greyhound very soon. We have a new dog coming. Her name is Anna. She's a brindle. She's a little girl, too. I think I think Ned's going to really like her. As in full. Okay. Well, well, since you mentioned this, why don't we just get into this little part right here? Because I think this would be a great time to uh, to bring up this, to, you know. <laughs> If there's there's an open wound, really? Um, how about we just uh, pour a little bit of salt in it right now? Um, where did that go? Ah, should we do this one now? What? Let me. But here's a little pre. Should I do the preamble first? Maybe I should do the preamble. This is what I posted not too long ago. Yeah, because he took his country and took it from nothing and turned it into an industrial nuclear superpower. Didn't he commit a genocide? Am I? That's what they, that is what they he, say. He didn't commit a genocide? Well, I mean, I don't know, but. What do you mean you don't? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of dispute about, was it intentional? Was it overstated? What, how do you, how do you unintentionally commit a genocide? I just because, a... well, because he didn't really like, you know, when they say it's a genocide, they say So that... he went in there and forced agriculture to be collectivized 
with these brutal right, five year plans, really high quotas, and it you know didn't really work in a lot of man. Where is Hotep Jesus when I need Hotep Jesus? <laughs> okay, that was number one. That was my first. Uh, and I, you probably saw this, I think, two or three weeks ago when I, I talked about this and everybody gave me so much shit about this. OK, well, my how the worm has turned, my friends, because now we have we have come full circle, my friends. So what happened was, of course, she was like, oh, I didn't know who he was. Uh, no, you knew who he was because you did it again. Luck and, you know, I don't. Wow. I really don't. I, I don't. I don't wish luck to racists. Oh, I'm not racist. Uh, yes, you are. Yes, you are, Nick. Yeah, I am a little bit yeah, racist. I, and um, the Italians, we do not claim you. Oh, oh, hey, the Italians don't claim you. You're the one dating a black guy. Oh. I'm not going to beat around the bush for this conversation. I'm going to get straight to the point. Pearl, you f***ed up. You knowingly invited a white supremacist and a self-proclaimed racist onto a platform which is primarily supported by, at least initially, and produced by black people. This comes across as insensitive <laughs> to downright nasty. And I wanna be clear, it's not just inviting said person to the conversation that's upsetting because conversations with people who don't agree with each other or don't agree with a particular position, if done in a healthy way, can promote civil discourse. But your f up was to not only not defend the people who help create the content on your platform, but to also push a narrative that is insensitive and damaging to those very same people. Pearl, you know that your staff is mostly black people and i'm talking about from a production oh, perspective <laughs> as well as a talent perspective you also know that the majority of your content utilizes black people talking about black relationship issues you could have had black people sitting in the same room with this person in order to combat some of the hellacious things that were coming out of his mouth or to have a different perspective that would have lent itself well to demonstrate the respect for the people that watch your content and that ah! you employ. I don't think that your platform would be as big as what it is today if it wasn't for the essential utilization of black people, black relationship topics, and black talent. And the talent came from all over. When you include the likes of an Andrew Tate, all the way down to a Brittany Renner. And even from a content creator perspective, from me to a Melanie King, to a Sarah Garvey, to a King Riches, to an Auntie Jenny. So for those just unaware of what's been going on, Pearl has recently come under fire for these particular comments. I'm trying to get my Africans in America, my Africans, my Africans. Oh, gosh. Oh, boy. Ah, they're going to be gonna in get trouble. This sounds, this sounds similar to the slavery stuff, too, because that's that's literally they they the founder of or the guy who made Root said I wanted a myth for my people to live by. So they often but that's what they do is they embellish. And I'm not trying to say it wasn't horrible. It was. Right. But they want to make it like more horrible so that they can control people. Now, what's crazy is, is that I came across these comments while I was live streaming a couple of days ago. And what started out as a laughy, jokey live stream where I wanted to talk about my time up in London quickly diverted to one of the worst live streams that I've ever had in my life. And honestly, it was a trip. To hell, as I discovered the magnitude of the conversation that she had with this figure by the name of Nick Fuentes. Specific to the comments regarding slavery being embellished, I said this on the stream and I maintain it today that Pearl needs to be held responsible for this comment. Likening a quote from the writer of Roots explaining a myth for his people to hold on to hey, what? <laughs> does not negate the documented history of the atrocities that happened to black people. And I'd argue that Roots was 
a light depiction of the savagery. Okay, let me hold up a second. Um, this is, uh, I forgot, somebody tell me his name, please. It's uh, the dude from uh, Mediocre Tutorials. Uh, I like this guy. I watch this guy quite a bit. Uh, I don't I don't think I've ever like maybe I've done one show with him. I think he might have been talking about Abba and Preach at one point. I might have used him as a reference at some point. But this was him uh, really hitting Pearl with both barrels. So it's MTR. Uh, mediocre tutorial response. I forget the, what the R is. Uh, what is his name? Somebody can, can somebody get me his like his actual name. He's actually been on with Pearl before, I think, in the past. So uh mtr is no is he yeah i don't think so either i've yeah most definitely not most definitely not yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you think so he's not yeah he's not a, he's not a social justice warrior yeah he's actually i don't say he's red pill but he's certainly done some some red pill stuff media oh mediocre tutorials reviews that's right what he is uh, anyways, let me let me let him. I'm, I won't do the whole thing, but just so you guys understand why Pearl is uh, trying to do, she's she's on the back foot right now. That my forefathers had to go through to ensure that I would be here today. But let me explain a little bit further how thoroughly f***ed that this actually is, because for me it comes down to a question of ethics. You're interviewing a known. Nazi sympathizer and an anti-black creator. And let's also say an endorser of uh, Stalin's communism. Just throwing that out there. And not offering any pushbacks whatsoever. And in fact, you're adding in your own fake news regarding the embellishment or the exaggeration of slavery. Uh, brother man, uh, MTR, let's also throw in here the fact that she said she didn't know who the guy was. Let we, I think we need to preface this. The reason I got into trouble for like even bringing up that, that pre, the, the previous, this, this particular, the one I, I threw out there beforehand when he's talking about Stalin, I got, I got pushback for that. Not because I, I didn't really even give to you. I mean, she's, she can have on the show, whoever the fuck she wants to have on the show. I'm not going to, I am done trying to tell people what to do with their shows. Okay. Trust me. I don't care if you're Adam Sossing. I don't care if you're Valley Tainment. I don't care if you're fresh and fit. I don't care who I, if Mike Sartain, go hang out and do the Kevin Savo, Torsha, have on, go and work with whoever you want. I'll tell you who they are. I'll be happy to opine and give you my take on them, but I am in no way ever going to tell people who they can and can't have on their show. I am. I don't even want that fucking appearance anymore. Right. Cause I am not the gatekeeper. You're the gay. If it's your channel, you go do what you want to. But you know what? You're going to live by the sword and die by the sword, too. So when you get when you get shit thrown at you for as for a bad decision, you know, that's on you. I can't because I, I, clearly I can't tell people jack shit. But my problem initially was the fact that and I said this is that Nick Fuentes is gunning for the position of of uh, Richard Spencer from if you don't know who's a Richard Spencer is go look him up there's there are certain roles you are going to see repeated in the 2024 election cycle one of them is Richard Spencer and I think Nick Fuentes is trying to be the uh, he's he's auditioning for that role right now for Pearl to say she doesn't know who the guy is, I found that very disingenuous. And that's why I made note of it about two or three weeks ago. And I got all kinds of pushback for it. And here we are. Additionally, there are times within the conversation where it's laughy, it's jokey, it's kikiing, especially when you got specific in certain <laughs> comments that reflected on CP time and let me also say this is that generally CP time is something that's laughed amongst people of melanation, but it's not taken as a joke when you're doing it with a person who is a self-proclaimed racist. Now that I've had the opportunity to digest all of the information, now that I'm not on live stream <laughs> with thousands of people looking at me and in the back of my mind, thinking towards the tens of thousands that are waiting for the perfect reaction for me, I begin to question why you didn't sympathize with the plight of African Americans or black people in general. And not once in the interview did you have at least one pro-black stance or some form of ethical defense 
or cultural sensitivity for the people who carry your production machine forward or the people that you know that watch your channel. I'm glad he can say this because guilty, 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 guilty. Yes. So I'm fact that that's you can watch it. By the way, that's on uh, mediocre tutorial reviews and MTR is right. 100% right. And I am glad he said that because if I bring it up, I got an agenda. There's something wrong with me. I'm glad he's the one that, and thank you. That was yeoman's work, my friend. Good on you. This is why I say Pearl is a hack. Pearl is a hack. Pearl is entertainment. She thought this was entertaining. What's funny is I, you know, she's offering up an apology right now. Okay. I, I haven't seen it yet. I will look. I promise you, as soon as I click out of here, I'm definitely going to go look at that apology. Right. But I don't know. Damage done, girlfriend. I'm just, just saying, but that's what happens when your show is about entertainment. I'm sure she was happy to have Andrew Tate and Brittany Renner on the same show. That was probably a huge show for her. I'm sure she made a good chunk of change off of that. This is why when somebody says, oh, I didn't know who that person was. I'm, I have to go, you know what? You should have. I and mean, you know, I'm, I have said this about other content creators. I'm just going to leave names out of it at this point. But you know who I'm talking about. If you didn't know who the person was, you got no excuse now. If you were like brand new, if you just started your, you've got like what? one thousand. Hey, I just got monetized. I got 1000 subscribers. Okay. Maybe I could go, oh, I didn't know who the guy was. Okay. Sorry. It was, I'm just trying to figure this shit out. Fine. You got a million and a half, close to a million and a half subs. No, you, the owner, <laughs> that's on you. You need to know who these people are. And you know, goddamn well who, who he is. <laughs> You can't not know who he is after the the uh, the Kanye West walkout on on Tim Pool, and if you don't if you don't like what the fuck are you doing in this business? What the hell are you, do you think you're doing? You better know who you have on your stream, and I don't care if it's Pearl or if it's anybody else for that matter. You like claiming ignorance is says more about you than it does about the person that you decided to have on your show. You should know who they are. Trust me. I know who Nick Fuentes is. Trust me. I know who Milo Yiannopoulos is too. And I, I, and I used to, I mean, we used to be really, really tight. Me and me and Milo. I will say that right now. Andrew Tate. I know exactly who Andrew Tate is. I know who Tristan Tate is. I've known them probably longer than most of the people in the fucking war room. Okay. And I know what I, that's why I said, you know, I'm not trying to, oh, he's throwing Tate under the bus. No, I'm not. I'm just saying I am waiting until everything comes out. There's no charges. There's, I'm waiting on, on information after information. People want to say, oh, he's innocent. He's guilty. I wouldn't, I let's, can we innocent to proven guilty? Fine. I don't know how it works in Romania. Great. I just want to see what the hell people are talking about. Anybody else. If, if I, I would expect the same thing from you if I was in that same situation. I would want you to risk. And you know what? I expect, I expect the opposite. Quite honestly, I have, I have no expectation of any kind of mercy. If I ever end up in the freaking shit house for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, I'm in prison or, or whatever the matrix come, came from Rolo. Hell they came for me today. Right. They could, they cancel my stream halfway through. Right. Who knows why? Probably because of Joe Rogan, but, um, but I, I expect no quarter. I expect no quarter. In fact, I expect a lot of people to just sort of like, I, because I've been through this before, 2019, June of 2019, peace. There were, there were five guys, six guys that had my back in 2019. Everybody else was wanted to be play neutral or they wanted to stab me in the back. You know, at least your enemies stab you in the chest and not in the back. People who are your friends will stab you in the back. People who are your enemies. At least they have a common courtesy to stab you in your chest. So I, I expect no quarter, by the way. But, you know, I, on, I would hope that people would at least reserve judgment until they get all the facts, until something comes out and they go, OK, fine, there you go. And again, uh, well, thank you for the vote of confidence, my friend. But I, I don't have any I don't have any 
expectations that I will receive any kind of mercy. And probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to, I would want you to like withhold judgment until you found out what was going on. Because I'll tell you right now, if I'm, if I'm the real deal, then the truth will out. And it usually does. Do I think that they're innocent? At this state, I would lean that way. I don't know. You know, I, I don't hang out with this. It's not like I'm going and having dinner with the Tates. I like Andrew Tate. I like Chris, uh, you know, Tristan Tate, but you know, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of people who, you know, do bad things that you don't even know about. So, but again, I have to reserve judgment. Same thing with, with Pearl, same thing with the rest of this stuff. I will say this is that if you don't know who you are having on your show, then what, the, what the fuck good are you? Oh, we just had him on there. I don't know who it was. I just thought he brought, he showed up and they let him in the door and he came on the show. <laughs> it, really? Because if that's the case, like, why don't you just scoop somebody up off the street and bring them in? No, they don't. You know damn well who you are. You know damn well. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, if you were wondering what was going on with Pearl, if you wonder why, again, like I keep saying, <sighs> this is, it's only going to get worse. Like when I see Michael Knowles on, on whatever podcast, I'm sure that was, in fact, I looked it up. That actually, that podcast made more money than Fresh and Fit that day when Michael Knowles came on, uh, on, uh, on whatever podcast made more, he, of course, uh, Brian and, you know, to his credit, you know, farmed super chats for five hours. <laughs> That's a long ass show, dude. I mean, I could do five hours solo, but like, I'm, I wouldn't expect girls to sit there for five hours. Anyways, that's why. I say Pearl's a hack. People, oh, Rolo, you must be professionally jealous. She has a million subs. Well, for a million subs, you should certainly know who the fuck you have. I have 208,000. I would know who's on my show. I would certainly, like, at least so that I knew what I was talking about, I would know. And so, I don't know, MTR, if you're watching, um, good job, good on you. Uh, I would have, however, brought up the fact that this is the second time she's had, she's been sitting next to Nick Fuentes. You would think after the first time <laughs> when people went, mm, I don't know, Pearl, that's not a, maybe that's not a good look for you. You would think after the first time that do it, hey, maybe we shouldn't have this guy on. Maybe that you know, we didn't really get a good, you know, po we didn't have a positive reaction with this dude, but you had him on again. And you said what you said. So that's two strikes. Maybe it's three. Who knows? But you tell me, man. Respect for the grifters. Holding, holding the grifters accountable also. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah. And, I'll, and by the way, I fully, this, this part right here, I fully expect everybody's going to like, you know, bro, he's, he doesn't know it's the evil Jews. He doesn't know it's the elves. Like, oh my God. Please spare me. Just, just get to the point where you tell us that it's, it's this global conspiracy of the elves. I let's just cut to the bull, cut the bullshit and get to that, at that end. So I don't have to waste your time. And you don't have to waste my time. I know who Nick Fuentes is. I know who Richard Spencer is. And I'll tell you this. You want to know why I keep saying that the red pill needs to be fundamentally a political, a religious, a racial ethnicity, a national and nationalism. It needs to be neutral. It is a praxeology. If you are going to hold Pearl up as a red pill content creator or producer, at least look at the look at the the history here. And not just her. There's other people too. I, I can not gonna name Pearl's the most obvious person right now. This is is why I say the red pill needs to be dissociated from all of that. So we don't run into shit like this. So people don't go, hmm, that, that, that Pearl, she's a, she, she's had Nick Fuentes on. She's a racist. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you've got, you know, MTR doing these shows, doing these reaction videos. I shouldn't have to do this, but I will do it one more time. Pearl is a hack. That's me. She's writing the fresh and fit format she used to. I don't, God knows what she's doing now. Honestly, I think she's kind of trying to pivot towards a Kevin Samuels kind of thing, but maybe not anymore. <laughs> don't call it red pill, Pearl. Call it entertainment, Pearltainment, valuetainment, Pearltainment, whatever tainment. Don't call it red pill. Don't call it manosphere. Don't call it intersexual dynamics because you, you no longer get the, you know, you've, your red pill card has been revoked. 
It should be fundamentally asexual or asocial, apolitical, a religious. This is why I have said since 2014, for fuck's sake, I said this prior to even the Trump campaign. It needs that's why people, oh, oh, right, that's red pill. No, no, it's not. Those guys in what Charlottesville with the tiki torches, that's red pill. No, no, it's not. It is not red pill. There was a dream that was the manosphere, and this ain't it, Proximo. Pearl is a hack. Can I please get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, son. Can I please get an amen? For fuck's sake, man. Oh, I guess Rolla was right. Ain't nobody going to do no reaction video to that. Nope. Oh, I guess Rolla was right. <laughs> Proximo! There was a dream that was Rome. This is not it. Do I have that loaded? I don't have that somewhere. That was my gladiator one. Maybe I don't. Maybe I dumped it. <laughs> I got rumor control. <laughs> this is even better. Well, it's nice you don't get no holes, man. <laughs> I have to turn that into a straight sound drop at some point. Yeah, whatever. All right. So actually, <laughs> you want to hear this? This is actually a good one here. Here, you'll need this. <clears throat> I cannot lift this. Grow stronger. <laughs> <laughs> that's coming that's coming at some point yeah yep, yep. all right i think it's time it's time to leave and time for me to go and have a look at the at pearl's last gasp video just saying yeah so i, I guess i won't be going to the uk sorry make <laughs> it's not after this show uh you should, if, by the way, there's no excuse. If you are going to call yourself an entertainer or whatever, if you care about your show as much as you claim to care about your show, and I don't care who you are, whether you're Pearl, whoever else, it, it, the onus of understanding and knowing who your guests are is on you. Do you think that Mike Sartain and myself don't know who we're bringing on? Do you think that I didn't know who Richard Reeves was? No, I, for fuck's sake, I'm the one that suggested him to get on fucking Dr. Phil. See, it's, it's just disingenuous, absolutely disingenuous. Hey, brother, who do you think is the funniest member of Rule Zero Squad? Now? Uh, what's your favorite comment joke of theirs? I think Ryan brings good laughs. He does, but like, I don't think people get it. Ryan is like British humor. That's like Monty Python. And people are like, why are people like, if you get it, you laugh your ass off. If you don't get it, you're like, what? <laughs> Uh, I think, I think Ryan is probably, he's, I, he, no, people just don't get his humor. I get his humor. It's like British comedy, right? Um, who's the funniest one on there? <laughs> you mean besides John Fitch? <laughs> I think John Fitch is the funniest member of Rule Zero, but he's unintentionally funny. Like he takes everything serious and everybody's laughing like ro the robot dogs. Uh, Cappy's pretty funny. It can be pretty funny too. I think probably John Fitch is the funniest because like he, he just don't know. What, it's random. You, it's, you never know what you're going to get with the guy. Yeah. So anyways, um, do I have something else going on? No. Um, let's see. Who is the funniest member? Respect for holding the grifters accountable. Well, afflict the comfortable and uh, uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's been my motto for quite some time and not just before. Yeah, robot dog, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I really need a, a robot dog's a, a sound drop, you know, although this is pretty close. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. What do I got? What, what do I have to do? We have 917 of you left here. It's all, it's 446. I don't want, I got to get out of here before the five hour mark. Cause I apparently have to go and look at another video from, from Pearl to see how she's going to, how she's going to, how is, it's like watching an episode of like breaking bad. Like how are they going to get out of this <laughs> or Ozark? Oh my God. <laughs> how are they going to get out of the Mexican drug cartel? <laughs> how will our heroine get out of this predicament next on the Netflix Pearltainment? <laughs> yeah. 
Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. I, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, for all the people who like carried water for Pearl, what do you got to say now? How you like me now? <laughs> Finish her. <laughs> no, I'm not doing six hours. Fuck you. Uh, Pearl. Uh, what? Very funny. That's not, that's, you know, what? actually I know how I'm going to end this. This is going to sound like really like, I don't know. I, I don't, should I even go into this? Maybe I will. I, well, I've, I've said this before, so I, I guess this is no shock. I love Soralita Bass, right? I like black women. I really do. I especially like Amber Rose. <laughs> Amber, call me. <laughs> um, I like hot black women, put it that way. If I have a thing, like, you know, it's funny. It's like, like, I think Mike Sartain thinks I have a thing for black chicks. I don't have a thing for black chicks per se. I just, it's just like fine, like black women that are like really good, like really healthy and like athletic and stuff. It's like, it, maybe it's the rarity factor. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. And I, I'll tell you when, I, as for as much work as I've done with uh, Myron and Fresh, I always joke about how, um, if you've seen me do this probably a billion times. He's pretty, probably sick of this stupid joke. But like, I, I am as white, although you can't really tell, I'm, maybe you can here. Yeah. I'm, I'm as white as Fresh is black. Fresh is under the bed dark, <laughs> according to him. That's his joke, not mine. Um, and I like I like sitting next to to Fresh because we have such good contrast. <laughs> and I love Fresh, man. Like I tell you, the one of the one of the funnest funniest things I've ever done is jump in a EVO Lamborghini that is with the top down. That's Fresh's, but like powder blue EVO uh, Lambo, which he doesn't have anymore, which crushed my soul when he sold it. But uh, we would drive down through the art district in miami going to go get off-white glasses from the off-white store and then maybe go over to um what is it uh the um uh, bathing ape bape we'd go to the bape store after that here i am white as a sheet he's dark as you know coal right and we are laughing our asses off the whole time we called his mom and talked to his mom we have a little white Sheba and we have, we have hero in the car with us too. We look fucking ridiculous. Okay. And I look, I, the, I got glasses on and you know, what we're listening to not rap. You know what we're listening to? We're listening to Poontang Boomerang by Steel Panther. Do you think for one second, I'm like, Oh, I'm white and he's black. Do you think that that even crosses my mind? <laughs> The other thing that doesn't cross my mind is age. I'm going to be 55 next week. In fact, the, I wish, that's an announcement I need to make. Uh, April 2nd. I will do this show next week, but I expect some love and appreciation on my birthday for me doing an April 2nd, my birthday uh, show for you, for you animals uh, on that day. But I'm going to be 55. And I don't, you know, it's funny as uh, Pat Campbell always told me never to reveal my age. I don't, I don't care. I don't even think about it right now. I'm in a band where the other guitar players, 26, are you 26 or 27 now, CJ? Our, our singer, Livy, is 31. Steve, our drummer, is 47 now, I believe. And I'm going to be 55. Do you think that I think about age? I think about making some good fucking music and rocking out. I think about getting down and that's how I get down. Do you think that I go on to Myron and Fresh and I realize I'm the only white guy there? Like when I went, when I did the first episode with Hotep Jesus, who is a good, still a very good friend of mine. I went on there. I met him for the first time. I've known Brian f since 2012, since before he was Hotep Jesus. Do you think for one second that I go, hmm, I'm the only white guy here. I mean, they, they joke about it, but I'm not thinking about stuff like that. I just want to go do a goddamn good show. I want to go hang out with my friends, Myron and Fresh. I want to go hang out with, with, uh, with, uh, Brian, with Hotep Jesus. I want to go, uh, you know, I mean, there's granted now there's Justin who's there a lot. Sterling's there. Uh, Tom's his white guy too, but I'm, I don't, I would think they would agree with me. Nobody really thinks about that. We just want to go and create good shit. And I don't care if you're black. I don't think there should be a black manosphere. I don't think there should be a white manosphere. I don't think there should be an Asian, Latino, I don't know, Indian, 
Japanese. There should not be a, because that's how you want to know why there's the sisterhood Uber Alice and there's no brotherhood Uber Alice. That's why we don't need a black manosphere. We don't need a white manosphere. We don't need a, any racial man manosphere. Because when you do that, you don't have solidarity as men, as guys who are guys, as men who are men. You want to know why I call it conventional masculinity and not traditional masculinity? That's why. Because people have different traditions. People have different ethnicities. People have different cultures. But there are still conventional aspects that make a man a fucking man. When you like when two different cultures who don't even speak the same damn language, they f suddenly encounter each other. Like, what is it? The Vikings meet the American Indians because they sailed the longboats across from Iceland and they they encounter. I, I was reading about this. They encounter the Indians. And you know what? The, the, the leaders, the men who are the tribal leaders on both sides, all they don't speak the language. They look at each other and they go. That's all. That's all it needs, right? You could. There's no language that needs to. There's no language barrier. You know, a man, when you see a man. That's where we fucking need to be, man. Instead of this bullshit, we got grifters and hacks trying to separate us, trying to divide us, trying to divide the manosphere because a divided manosphere has no solidarity. It has no brotherhood. I don't, I don't think in time of, oh, George A doesn't, A Roll doesn't think in color. Well, well whatever. I just want to create good shit. I want to do projects. That's why that's where men exceed. Do you want to know where men uh, communicate the best when they have a, a collective problem to solve? That's when we communicate. That's when we, that's when we form bonds of brotherhood is when we are solving problems together. And I don't care if you're, if I'm melanin deficient and I'm probably the most melanin deficient guy that certainly that Myron and Fresh have ever seen. <laughs> so I don't think there should be. And I think that it's only detrimental to the, I'm, I'm, you know, the praxeology or if you want to say that red pill has some sort of mission, I'll tell you what it doesn't include. It doesn't include separating us into different, you know, warring tribes on our skin color. Fuck that. Oh, by the way, Pearl has Allende as her producer. Really? Really? That's the first I've heard of that. Really? I didn't know Allende was the producer for that. Wow. <laughs> Maybe not anymore. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? All right, guys. So uh, last last part of parting thoughts. Um, next week will be my birthday show. Please show up. Tell your friends. I think I might uh, pr promote it in advance. Uh, I think what I will do on my birthday show is I will do at all questions, all Q&A. How's that? And you can ask me anything you want and I will opine on it. No videos, no nothing. It's just going to be straight up Q and a on my birthday. And I'm just going to be as casual as I possibly can be. Um, maybe I'll have some, maybe I might bring some guests on if they want to come on. I'll, I'll throw out the link. Maybe I'll make it public and you guys can come on too, but uh, I, I might run. I'm going to definitely run my birthday show a bit different. So that will be next Sunday, April 2nd, the holy day of Rolo, Rolo Shana. <laughs> Rolo, Rolo, uh, Rolo birthday, Anna, whatever. The holiest of holy days. Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so that will be next week. Um, I am, let's see, what am I working on this week? I still haven't decided whether I'm going to go out to Miami. If I do it, he wants, I can, my, Myron wants to do it on the 31st. I don't know if it works with my schedule to pick up the new dog. We got a new, uh, got a new pup for, uh, a new greyhound and the problem is is i have to go pick her up when like she hurt her she had a broke leg and i have to go get her when she's ready to be got so it's not really my schedule it's their schedule so we'll say saint rollo's day thank you thank you thank you rollo don yes rollo shana rollo shana <laughs> What is the, what is the, uh, don't end the show yet no i'm gonna no you're not gonna get five hours out of me so I'm just sorry <laughs> yep there we go all right, Rolo, Rolo's giving day. You know what? You guys should give me, well, as we go out, give me the um, what you think the holiday, the holy day of Rolo's birthday should be. <laughs> yes, welcome to the cult, my friends. Um, so anyways, uh, I, want, I, I had something new, but I think I might just, I'll, I'll go back to, to 
Oh, by the way. Oh, man. Holy mackerel. Um, Giovanni uh, Sanders, uh, if you like this song, please, the uh, the link to go pick it up off of Spotify or add it to your playlist is down. It's like the second or third link down past the fold. Go get that. If you want any information, if you want to join uh, Men of Action, the link's right there. If you are um, in any way uh, wanting one-on-one um, uh, counseling, I still do that. Communications and all the links are down there. Also, my Patreon is down there as well. I've started a sub stack again. Uh, if you are on my mailing list, you're probably going to get it for free, at least for the next one or two. And then I'm going to go to all membership only. Um, what else? Jeez. Uh, you can get in touch with me on Twitter if you'd like. Uh, Instagram if you'd like. There will be no Access Vegas, obviously, because we did it twice in a row for this week. But we'll probably get on it pretty soon. I think Mike wants to do it on the 6th. So we'll see. Anyways, thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you and I love each and every one of you equally. You are all my my holy children. My friend Sneeko, favorite YouTuber, is he a cuck? Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I have never met. I would have to meet the guy in person. Uh, and I happen to like Filipinos quite a bit. And I know he's Filipino. So if he's like most Filipinos, I probably would like. Him. I don't know. We'll see. He's asked me to come on the show or like uh, do a collab with him. And I told him, yes, I'd be happy to. So you know, I'll let you know once I meet him. Okay. What am I going to do? Tell you I know something about him that I don't? Nope. Anyways. All right, guys. Thank you guys for watching. Um, uh, again. Uh, oh, by the way, if you haven't gotten any of the books, you can always pick them up on Amazon. All links are there. Uh, Audible. All links are on Audible. By the way, if you're going to go pick up any of the Audible books, please use the links that are in the description because if you start a new Audible account, I actually get a bounty on that. And uh, I am unapologetically shilling myself for that right now. So please go check that out. Uh, I will most likely be doing a, a Wednesday uh, midweek stream once again because I will not be in Vegas this week. So that's probably in the cards as well anyways love you guys i will see you guys soon and uh what else do i have to do here before i head out one last thing oh this uh, there
registered trademark, all rights reserved. 